Anastasia, book one. I exist. <clears throat> I exist for whom I exist. Anastasia herself has stated that this book written about her consists of words and phrases in combinations, which have a beneficial effect on the reader. That has been attested by the letters received to date from thousands of readers all over the world. If you wish to gain a full and appreciation as possible of the ideas, thoughts, and images set forth here, as well as experience the benefits that come with this appreciation, we recommend you find a quiet place for your reading, where there is at least possible interference from artificial noises, motor, traffic, radio, TV, household appliances, etc. Natural sounds, on the other hand, the singing of birds, for example, and the patter of rain, or the rustle of leaves on nearby trees may be a welcome accompaniment to the reading process. Translator Preface When I opened my online Slavic language bulletin one day in early September 2004, the first learned about a book in the Ringing Cedar series and that was seeking a translator into English, little did I realize the kind of literary adventure that was awaiting me. But I, as I became acquainted with the detail of Vladimir Megri's fascinating work, I read through the first three books in a series before beginning at the actual translation. It gradually dawned on me that much of my previous translation experience, especially in poetry and poetic prose, not to mention my own religious background, had been preparing me specifically for this particular task. Megri's work was simply the next logical step, it seemed, in the progression of my career. Indeed, I found myself taking it not only with the enthusiasm that comes with the prospect of facing a new professional challenge, but even more with the thought of feeling that very much at home in this literary environment. Some of my friends and colleagues had asked, what kind of book are you translating? No doubt wondering whether they could look forward to reading a novel, a documentary account, an inspirational Eggies in the meaning of life, or even a volume of poetry. But even after completing the translation of Anastasia, I still do not have a definitive answer to give them. In fact, I am still asking myself the same question. My initial response was a rather crude summary of a gut impression. I would tell them the Star Trek meets the Bible. The feeling about the book, however, go far beyond this primitive attempt at jocularity. Jocularity. Of the four desperate genres mentioned above, I would say Anastasia has elements of all four. And then some. First, the book reads like a novel. That is to say, it tells a first-person story in a most entertaining way, bringing out the multifaceted character of both the author and the title personage, in a manner not unlike what readers of novels might expect. It tells a tale of adventure in the raw Siberian wilds, where even sex and violence make an occasional appearance, though with a connection to the plot line quite unlike our counterparts in any work of fiction I have read. Secondly, the book gives the impression of a documentary account of a real-life event, even if one's powers of belief are sometimes stretched to the limit. I am glad that my linguistic experience has given me access to not only the book itself, but also a host of Russian languages, texts, on the internet that have enabled me to corroborate with independent sources a great many of the specifics the author saw fit to include in his narrative, names of individual institutions and scientific phenomena, all of which turned out to be genuine, thereby contributing an additional measure of credence to what otherwise might seem utterly fantastic. Much of the corroborative information so gleaned I have attempted to pass on in the English-speaking reader in the footnotes with the help of additional contemporary by the publisher. And yet there is a significant area of the author's description where authenticity must still be judged by the individual reader. Thirdly, the book penetrates one's thinking and feeling with the gentle force of a divinely inspired treatise. A treatise on not only the meaning of human life, but much more. Anastasia offers a tremendous new insight into the world's interrelationship of God, man, nature, and the universe. I would even go as far as to call it a revelation in science and religion. 
one nutshell description that comes to my mind is a chronicle of ideas. Ideas on history of humanity, relationships on everything outside of itself, clouds, not only dark and foreboding, but even the fluffy and attractive variety of mistaken belief that have, over the years, hid this relationship from our sight and comprehension. Where to begin? Once we have caught a glimpse of this relationship, the necessary journey to reclaiming the whole picture, deeply metaphysical in essence, the chronicle is set forth with both the supporting evidence of a documentary account and the entertainment capacity of a novel. In other words, it can be read as in as many of these three in isolation, but only by taking the three dimensions together will the reader have something approaching a complete picture of the, the book. And all three are infused with a degree of soul-felt inspiration that only can be expressed in poetry. Yes, indeed, one must not overlook the poetry. As a matter of fact, I had learned right at the start that experience in poetic translation was one of the qualifications required of a Ringing Cedar series translator, and not just on account of the seven samples, poems by readers at the end of chapter 30. Much of the book prose, especially when Anastasia is speaking, exudes a poetic feel, with rhyme and metre running the background course through the whole paragraph at times, Hence, a particular challenge lay in the reprodu reproducing this poetic quality along with the somatic meaning in English translation. Such poetic prose is even more evident in subsequent books in the series. Another challenge has been to match as closely as possible Vladimir Megri's progressive development as a writer. According to his own admission, Megri began his whole literary project not as a professional writer, but as a hardened entrepreneur for whom the writing was the farthest activity from his mind. I smiled when, the, when one of the test readers of the translation, after finishing the first few chapters, described the author's style as choppy. Megri himself talks about the initial rejection notice he received from publishers after publisher telling him his language was too stilted. And yet, his rendering of some of Anastasia's pronunciations towards the end of the book I wax quite lyrical indeed, especially in the poetic passages referred to above. The author's development in literary style, which he attributes to Anastasia's direct and indirect guidance, became even more pronounced as the series progresses. It'll be up to the English reader to judge whether this transformation is also conveyed in the translation. There are two Russian words of frequent occurrence throughout the book. That presented a particular translation challenge. One of them was Dashnik, referring to people who own a Dasha or a country cottage situated on just 600 square meters of land obtainable free of charge from a Russian government. But there is little comparison here to most Western concepts of cottage. While Russia Dashas are to be found in forest areas or simply on open farmland, one almost invariably features is a plot on which are grown fruits and vegetables to supply the family not only for their dasha stays, but right through the years. Given that the word dasha is already known to many English speakers and is included in the popular edition of both Oxford and Webster, it was decided to use the Russian word designed its occupants as well, with the designating its occupants as well with the English plural ending dashniks. The question that entailed the most serious difficulty, however, one that formed a subject of several dozen emails between published translator before it was finally resolved, was a rendering into English of the Russian word shivlok. It was a common term used to denote a person or human being, the equivalent of German, as well as of English man in the familiar Bible verse, God created man in his own image. The problem with the term human as in human being is that it not only suggests the formation of the species from matter or earth, but it is associated with lowly concepts where shavak is deprived from the old Russian word indicating thinking, an expression of a man's domain over time by virtue of his own god bestowed capacity by thinking and reason, not unlike the significance of man in the Bible verse. The problem with the word man is that especially 
In our age, it has become so closely associated with only one half of the total number of sentient thinking beings on the planet that the other half quite understandably feels collectively exuded by the term. Excluded. <laughs> by the term. Russian, by contrast, does not have this problem. Shevuk can designate either a man or woman. In the end, partly through reason and partly through revelation, it was decided to translate Shevuk whenever appropriate to the context by the term man, with a capital M, in an effort to retain the association of the term with a, div with a divine as opposed to a matrial earthly origin as well as to show the link between Anastasia's view of man and the concept of man in the first chapter of Genesis, which she freely quotes herself. So let all the readers of this book put on notice whenever you see man, capital M, this includes you. There are other discrepancies between Russian and English concepts behind respective translation equivalents, but their explanation is best left to individual footnotes. In conclusion, I must express my gratitude to my editor. Leonid Sharskin of Ringing Cedars Press for entrusting me with the privileged task of translating such a monumental work as the Ringing Cedar series, and secondly, for the tremendous support he has given me throughout this initial project, namely in illuminating aspects of Vladimir Negri and Anastasia's concept of God, man, nature, and the universe, that my previous experience with Russian literature could not possibly have prepared me for. These insights have made a significant difference in how particular nuances of the original are rendered in the translation, and especially in making allowance for the considerable geographical, social, and philosophical distances that all too often separate English-speaking readers with the vast cultural treasure accessible for those with the knowledge of Russian. I now invite you all to take your seats in the familiar exploration vehicle known as the English language. As we journey together to examine a previously inaccessible Russian treasure of momentous significance for all humanity, including the planet we collectively inhabit, and experience it by up in one beautiful word, Anastasia. Ottawa, Canada, 2005, John Woodsworth. Chapter 1. The Ringing Cedar. In the spring of 1994, I chartered three river boats on which I carried out three-month expedition on the River Ob in Siberia from Novisburg <coughs> and Selkard and back. The aim of the expedition was to foster economic ties with the regions of the Russian Far North. The expedition of the three river boats was a passage ship named the Patrice. The Western Siberian Riverboat bearer rather interesting names, as if they were no other personage in history worth commemorating. The lead ship housed the expedition headquarters along with the store where local Siberian entrepreneurs could exhibit their wares. The plan was for the convoy to travel north 3,500 kilometers, visiting not only major port of calls but smaller places as well where goods could be unloaded only during a brief summer navigation season. The convoy would dock at a populated settlement during the daytime. We would offer the wares we had brought for sale and hold talks about setting up regular economic link. Our traveling was usually done at night. If weather conditions were unfavorable for navigation, the lead ship which put into the nearest port and we would organize an onboard party for our local young people. Most places offered little in the way of their own entertainment. Clubs and community centers had been going downhill ever since the collapse of the USSR, and there were almost no cultural activities available. Sometimes we might go for 24 hours or more without seeing a single populated face. Even the tiniest village from the river, the only transportation artery for many kilometers around, the only thing visible to the eye was the taiga itself. I was not yet aware at the time that somewhere amidst the uninhibited vastness of forest along the riverbank, a surprise meeting was awaiting me, one that was to change my whole life. One day, on my way back to Novisburg, I arranged to dock the 
lead ship at a small village, one with only a few houses at best. Some 30 or 40 kilometers distant from the large population centers, I planned a three-hour stopover so the crew could have shore leave and the local residents could buy some of our goods and foodstuffs and we could cheaply pick up from them fish and wild growing plants of the taiga. During our stopover time as the leader of the expedition, I was approached by two of the local senior citizens. As I judged at the time, one of them appeared to be somewhat older than the other. The elder of the two, a wizened fellow with a long gray beard, kept silent the whole time, leaving his younger companion to do the talking. This fellow tried to persuade me to lend him fifty of my crew, which numbered no more than sixty-five in total, to go with them into the Taiga, about twenty-five kilometers or so from the dock where the ship was berthed. They would be taken into the depth of the Taiga to cut down a tree he described as the ringing cedar. The cedar, which he said reached 40 meters in height, needed to be cut up into pieces which could be carried by hand to the ship. We must, he said, definitely take the whole lot. The old fellow further recommended that each piece be cut up into smaller pieces. Friends and anyone who wished to accept a piece as a gift, he said, this was a most unusual cedar. A piece should be worn on one's chest as a pendant. Hang it around your neck while the standing barefoot in the grass, and then press it to your chest with the palm of your left hand. It takes only a moment to feel the pleasing warmth emanating from the piece of cedar, followed by a light tingling sensation running through the whole body. From time to time, whenever desired, the side of the pendant facing away from the body should be rubbed with one's finger, the thumbs pressed against the other side. The old fellow confidently assured me that within three months, the possessor of one of these ringing cedar pendants will feel significantly improvement in his sense of well-being and will be cured of many diseases. Even AIDS, I asked? and briefly explained what I had learned about the disease from the press. The Ulster confidently replied, from any and all diseases. But this, he considered, was an easy task. The main benefit was that anyone having one of these pendants would become kinder, more successful, and more talented. I didn't know a little about the healing properties of the cedar of our Siberian Taiga, but the suggestion that it could affect one's feeling and abilities, well, that to me seemed beyond the bound of probability. The thought came to me that maybe this old man wanted money from me for his unusual cedar, as they themselves called it. And I began explaining that out in the big wide world, women were used to wearing jewelry made of gold and silver and wouldn't pay a dime for some scrap of wood and so I wasn't going to lay out any money for anything like that. They don't know what they're wearing, came the reply. Gold, well, that's dust in comparison with one piece of cedar. But we don't need any money for it. We can give you some dried mushroom in addition, but there's nothing we need from you. Not wanting to start an argument out of respect for their age, I said. Well, maybe someone will wear some of your cedar pendants. He certainly would, if a top woodcarver or craftsman agreed to put his hand to it and cre create something of amazing beauty. To which the old fellow replied, Yes, we could carve it, but it would be better to polish it by rubbing. It will be a lot better if you do this yourself with your fingers, whenever your heart desires. Then the cedar will have beautiful look to it. Then the younger of the two quickly unbuttoned his unbuttoned first his old worn jacket, then his shirt, and revealed that he was wearing on his chest. I looked and saw a puffed-out circle or oval. It was multicolored purple, raspberry, auburn, forming like some kind of a puzzling design. The vein lines on the wood looked like little streams. I am not a connoisseur of art, although from time to time I have had occasion to visit galleries. The world's great masters had not called forth any particular emotion in me, but the object hanging around this man's neck aroused significant greater feeling and emotions than any of my visits to these museums.
How many years have you been rubbing this piece of cedar, I asked. Ninety-three, the old fellow responded. And how old are you? A hundred and nineteen. At the time, I didn't believe him. He looked like a man of seventy-five. Either he had, hadn't noticed my doubts, or he had paid no attention to them. In somewhat exciting tones, he started in trying to persuade me that any piece of cedar polished by human fingers alone would also look beautiful in just three years. Then it would start looking even better and better, especially when worn by a woman. The body of its wearer would give off a pleasant and beneficial aroma, quite unlike anything artificially produced by man. Indeed, a very pleasant fragrance was emanating from both of these old men. I could feel it, even though I'm a smoker, and like all smokers, have dulled a sense of the smell. And there was one other peculiarity. peculiarity. I suddenly became aware of phrases in the speech of these strangers that were not common to the residents of this isolated part of the North. Some of them I remember... Some of them I remember to this day, even the intonations associated with them. Here is what the old fellow told me. God created the cedar to store cosmic energy. When someone is in a state of love, they emit a radiant energy. It takes but a second for it to reflect off the celestial bodies floating overhead and come back to earth and give life to everything that breathes. The sun is one of those celestial bodies and it reflects but a tiny fraction of such radiance. <clears throat> <clears throat> only bright rays can travel into space from man to the earth, and only beneficial rays can be reflected from space back to earth. Under the influence of malicious feelings, man can emit only dark rays. These dark rays cannot rise, but must fall into the depths of the earth. Bounce off its core, they return to the surface in the form of volcanic eruption, earthquakes, wars, etc. The accumulating achievement of these dark rays is the direct effect of the, on man, originating them, invariably exacerbating this man's own malicious feelings. Cedars live to be 550 years old. Day and night there is millions of needles catch and store the whole spectrum of bright energy. During the period of cedar life, all of the celestial bodies pass above them, reflecting this bright energy. Even in one tiny piece of cedar, there is more energy beneficial to man than all the man-made energy installations taken together. Cedars receive the energy emanating from man through space. Store it up at the right moment, give it back. They give it back when there is not enough of it in space. In other words, in man or in everything living and growing on the earth. Occasionally, though, very rarely, one discovers cedars that have been stored up energy but not giving back what they have stored. After 500 years of their life, they start to ring. This is how they talk to us, through their, through their quiet ringing sound. This is how they signal people to take them and saw them up to make use of their stored up energy on the earth. This is what the cedars are asking with their ringing sound. They keep on asking for three whole years. If they don't have contact with living human beings, then in three years, deprived of the opportunity to give back what they have received and store it from space, they lose their ability to give it back directly to man. Then they will start burning up the energy intentionally. This torturous process of burning and dying lasts 27 years. Not long ago, we discovered a cedar like this. We determined that it had been ringing for two years already. It was ringing very softly. Perhaps it was trying to draw out its request over a longer period of time. But, you, but still, it was only one year left. It had only one year left. It must be sawed up and given away to people. The old man spoke at length, and for some reason I heard him out. The voice of this strange old Siberian sounded at first quite confident, then very excited. And when he got excited, he would rub the piece of cedar with his fingertips, as though he were lightly tripping over some kind of musical instrument. It was cold on the river bank. An autumn wind was blowing across the river. 
gusts of wind ruffled the hair on the old man's scalp capless heads. Ugh, on the old man's capless heads. But the spokesman jacket and the shirt remained unbuttoned. His fine his fingertips kept rubbing the cedar pendant on his chest, still exposed to the wind. He was still trying to explain its significance to me. Lydia, an employee of my firm, came down the gangplank to tell me that everyone else had already on, was already on board and waiting for me to finish my conversation. I bade farewell to the oldsters and quickly climbed aboard. I couldn't act on their request for two reasons. Delayed departure, especially for three days, would mean significant financial loss. And besides, everything these old fellows said seemed to me at the time to be in the realm of pure superstition. The next morning during our usual company meeting, I suddenly noticed that Lydia was fingering a cedar pendant of her own. Later she would tell me that after I had gone abroad, aboard, she stayed behind for a while. She noticed that when I started hurrying away from them, the oldsters that had been talking with me stared at me with a perplexed look and then said excitedly to his older companion, Now how can that be? Why didn't they get it? I really don't know how to speak their language. I couldn't make them believe. I simply couldn't. Why? Tell me, father. The elder man put his hand on his son's shoulder and replied, You weren't convincing enough, son. They didn't grasp it. As I was going up the gangplank, Lydia went on, the old man that was talking with you suddenly rushed up to me, grabbed me by the arm, and led me back down to the grass below. He hurriedly pulled out of his pocket a string and attached to it was the piece of cedar wood. He put it around my neck and pressed it against my chest with the palm of both his hands and mine. I even felt a shivering go through my whole body. Somehow he managed to do this all very quickly, and I didn't even get a chance to say anything to him. As I was walking away, he called after me, Have a safe journey. Be happy. Please come again next year. All the best, Pete. All the best, people. We'll be waiting for you. Have a safe journey. As a ship pulled away from the dock, the old fellow kept on waving at us for a long time, and then all at once sat down on the grass. I was watching him through a pair of binoculars. The old man that talked with you and later gave me the pennant, I saw him sit down on the grass and his shoulders were trembling. The older one with the long beard was bending over him and stroking his head. Amidst the flurry of my subsequent commercial dealings, accounting, and end-of-voyage farewell banquets, I completely forgot about the strange Siberian oldsters. Upon my return to Annalisburg, I was afflicted with sharp pains, the diagnosis intestinal ulcer of thoracic spine. In the quiet of the comfy hospital ward, I was cut off from the bustle of everyday life. My deluxe private room gave me an opportunity to calmly reflect on my four-month expedition and to draw up a business plan for the future but it seemed as though my memory regulated just about everything that had happened to the background, and for some reason the old men and what they said came to the forefront of my thoughts. <clears throat> I requested to have delivered to me the, in the hospital all sorts of literary on cedars. After comparing what I had read with what I had heard, I became more and more amazed and began to actually believe what the oldsters had said. There was at least some kind of truth in their words, or maybe the whole thing was true. In books on folk medicine, there is a lot said about the cedar as a healing remedy. They say that everything from the tip of the needles to the bark is endowed with highly effective healing properties. The Siberian cedar wood has a beautiful appearance and artistic Wood carving masters enjoy great success in using it for furniture, as well as soundboards for musical instruments. My dad used to make furniture with cedar. Cedar needles are highly capable of decontaminating the surrounding air. Cedar wood has a distinctive pleasant um, fragrance. A small cedar chip placed inside a house will keep moths away. In the popular science literature I read, it was said that the qualitative characters, characteristics of the northern cedar were significantly higher than for those growing in the south. Back in 19, back in 70, bleh, back in 1792, the academic P.S. Pallas wrote 
that the fruits of the Siberian cedar were effective in restoring youth and virility and significantly increasing the body's ability to withstand a number of diseases. There is a whole host of historic phenomena directly or indirectly linked to the Siberian cedar. Here is one of them. In 1907, a 50-year-old semi-retired peasant named Gregory Rasputin, who hailed from an isolated Siberian village in an area where the Siberian cedar grows, found himself in St. Petersburg, the capital, and soon became a regular guest at the imperial, of the imperial family. Not only did he amaze them with his predictions, but he possessed incredible sexual stamina. At the time of his assassination, onlookers were struck by the fact that despite all his bullet despite his bullet-ridden body, he continued to live, perhaps because he had been raised on cedar nuts in a part of the country where cedars abound. This is how a contemporary journalist described his staying power. At age 50, he could begin an orgy at noon and go on carousing until four o'clock in the morning. From his fornication and drunkenness, he would go directly to the church for mo morning prayers and stand praying until eight before heading home for a cup of tea. Then, as if nothing had happened, he would carry on receiving visitors until two in the afternoon. Next, he would collect a group of ladies and accompany them to the bath. From the bath, he would be off to the restaurant in the country where he would begin repeating the previous night's activities. No normal person could ever keep up a regime like that. The time, the, the many-time world champion and Olympic champion wrestler Alexander Kerlin, Krellin, but who has never been defeated so far, is also a Siberian. Also from the area where the Siberian cedars grow, this strongman also eats cedar nuts. A coincidence? I mentioned only these facts which can be easily verified in popular science literature, or which can be confirmed by witnesses. Lydia, who was given the ringing cedar pendant by the Siberian Ulsters, is now one of those witnesses. She is 36 years old, married to with two children. Her co-workers have noticed changes in her behavior. She has become kinder and smiles more often. Her husband, whom I had known, told me that her family, sorry, her husband, whom I happen to know, told me that their family has now been experiencing a greater degree of mutual understanding. He also remarked that his wife has somehow become younger looking and is starting to arouse greater feelings in him, more respect, and quite possibly more love. But all this multitudinous facts and evidence pale in comparison to the main point which you can look up for yourself, a discovery which has left me with not a trace of doubt, and that is the Bible. In the book of Leviticus, in the Old Testament, God teaches us how to treat people and even decontaminate their houses with the help of the cedar. After comparing all the facts and data I had gleaned from various sources, I was confronted by such a remarkable picture that all the miracles known to the whole world faded before it. The great mysteries that have excited people's minds began to pale in significance. In comparison with the mystery of the ringing cedars, now I could no longer have any doubts about its existence. They were all di uh, dispelled by the popular science literature and the old Vedic scripture I was reading. Cedars are mentioned 42 times in the Bible, all in the Old Testament. When Moses presented humanity with the Ten Commandments on stone tablets, he probably knew more than he had been recorded in the Old Testament. We are accustomed to the fact that in nature there are various plants capable of treating human ills. The healing properties of the cedar have been attested in popular science literature by such serious and authoritative researchers in academia, palace, and this is consistent in the Old Testament scriptures. Academia. And now we pay careful attention. When the Old Testament talked about the cedar, it is just the cedar alone. Nothing is said about the tree. And doesn't the Old Testament say that the cedar is the most potent medicine of any existing in nature? What is this anyway? A medicine kit? And how is it to be used? And why out of all the Siberian did this, sorry, of all the Siberian cedars, did these strange old fellows point to a single ringing cedar? But that's not all. Something immeasurably more mysterious lies behind the story from the Old Testament. King Solomon built a temple out of cedar wood. In return for the cedar from Lebanon, he gave another king harem, twenty cities of his kingdom. 
Incredible! Giving away 20 cities just for some kind of building material? True. He got something else in return. At King Solomon's request, he was given servants that were skilled in felling timber. What kind of people were these? What knowledge did they possess? I have heard that even now, in the far-flung reaches of the Taiga, there are old people whose job it is to choose cedars for construction. But back then, over 2,000 years ago, everybody might I have known this. Sorry, might have known this. Nevertheless, specialists of some sort were required. The temple was built. Service began to be held there, and the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. What kind of cloud was that? How and from what did it enter the temple? And who could it have? What could it have been? Energy? A spirit? What kind of phenomena? And what connection? did it have with the cedar? The old fellow talked about the ringing cedars as a storing up some kind of energy. Which cedars are stronger, the ones in Lebanon or Sir Siberia? Academian Palace said that the healing properties of the cedars increased in the proportion of their proximity to the furthest tundra. In this case, then the Siberian cedar could be stronger. It says in the Bible, by their fruits ye shall know them. In other words, again, the Siberian cedar. Could it be that no one has paid attention to all this? Has no one put two and two together? The Old Testament, the science of the past century, and the current one are all the same opening regarding the cedar. And Elena Ivana Rorich notes in her book, Living Ethics, a chalice of cedar resin figured in the ritual of the consecration of the kings of ancient Croatian. Croatian. Druids also call the chalice of a uh, cedar resin the chalice of life, and only later, with the loss of the realization of the spirit, was it replaced by blood. The fire of Zoestar was the result of burning the cedar resin in the chalice. So then, how much of our forebears' knowledge of the cedars, it, its properties and uses, has been passed down to the present day? <clears throat> Is it possible that nothing has been preserved? What do Siberian oldsters know about it? And all at once my memory harked back to an experience of my years ago which caused a shiver up my spine. I don't I didn't pay attention to it back then, but now, during the early years, I was president of the Association of Siberian Entrepreneurs. One day I got a call from Novisburg, a district executive council. Back then, it was still a Communist Party committee, asking me to come to a meeting with a prominent Western businessman. He had a letter of recommendation from the government of the day. Several entrepreneurs were present, along the workers from the Executive Council Secretariat. Secretariat. The Western businessman was of rather imposing external appearance, an unusual person with Oriental features. He was wearing a turban, and his fingers were adorned with precious rings. The discussion, as usual, centered around the possibilities of cooperation in various fields. The visitor said, among other things, We would like to buy cedar nuts from you. As he spoke these words, his face and body tightened, and his sharp eyes moved from side to side, no doubt studying the reaction of the entrepreneurs present. I remember the incident very well, as even then I wondered why his appearance had changed like that. After the official meeting of Moscow interpreter accompanying him came up to me, she said he would like to speak with me. The businessman made me a confidential proposal. If I could arrange delivery of cedar nuts for him, and they had to be fresh, then I could would receive a handsome personal percentage over and above the official price. The nuts were to be shipped to Turkey for processing into some kind of oil. I said I would think it over. I decided to find out for myself what kind of oil he was talking about, and I did. Oh, on the London market, one sets the standard for world prices. Cedar nut oil fetches anywhere up to $500 per kilogram. Their proposal deal would have given us approximately 2 to $3 for one kilogram of cedar nuts. I rang up an entrepreneur I happened to know in Warsaw and asked him whether it might be possible to market such a product directing directly to the consumer and whether we could learn the technology involved in its extraction. A month later, he sent me a reply. No way. 
We weren't able to gain access to the technology, and besides, there are certain Western powers so involved in this issue of yours that it would be better just to forget about it. After that, I turned to my friend, Constantine, a scholar with our Novisburg Consumer Cooperative Institute. I bought a shipment of nuts and financed a study, and the laboratories of his institute produced approximately 100 kilograms of cedar nut oil. I also hired researchers with who came up with the following information from archival documents. Before the revolution, and even for some time afterward, there was in Serbia an organization known as the Siberian Cooperator. People from this organization traded in oil, including cedar nut oil. They had rather swanky branch offices in Harbin, London, and New York, and rather large Westbrook bank accounts. Western bank accounts. After the revolution, the organization eventually collapsed and many of its members went abroad. A member of the Bolshevik government, Leonard Carson, um, Krasin, met, me, met with the head of this organization and asked him to return to Russia. But the head of the Siberian cooperator replied that he would be of more help of, to Russia if he remained outside its borders. From archival materials, materials, I further learned that cedar oil was made using wooden presses in many, in many villages of the Siberian taiga. Only wooden presses. The quality of the cedar oil depended on the season in which the nuts were gathered and how they were processed. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I need something to drink. But I was unable to determine, either from the archives of the Institute, exactly which season was being indicated. The secret had been lost. There are no healing remedies with properties analogous to those of cedar oil. But perhaps the secret of making this oil had been passed along by one of the measures or someone in the West. How was it possible that the cedar nuts with the most effective healing properties grow in the Siberia, and yet the facility for producing the oil is located in Turkey? After all, Turkey has no cedars like those found in Siberia. And just what Western powers was the Warsaw entrepreneur talking about? Why did he say it would be better just to forget about this issue? Might not these powers be smuggling this product with its extraordinary healing properties out of our Russian Siberian taiga? And why was such a treasure here at home with such effective properties a treasure known for centuries, for millennia? Even do we spend millions by billions of dollars buying up foreign medicine and swallowing up like half-crazed people, how is it that we have lost the knowledge known to our forebears, our recent forebears yet, ones who lived in our century? And what about the Bible's description of the extraordinary happening of over 2,000 years ago? What kind of unknown powers are trying so earnestly to erase our forebears' knowledge from our own memories? Oh, and you're, you better stick to minding your own business, we're told. Yes, you are trying, yes, they are trying to wipe it out, and indeed, they are succeeding. I was seized by a fit of anger. I checked, and yes, cedar oils is sold in our pharmacies, but it's sold in foreign packaging. I bought a single 30-gram vial and tried it. The actual oil content, I think, was no more than a couple of drops. The rest of, was some kind of diluted agent. Compared to what was produced in the Consumer Cooperative Institute, well, there was simply no comparison. And this diluted couple of drops cost 50,000 rubles. So what if we didn't buy it abroad, but sold it ourselves? Just the sale of this oil would be enough to raise the whole of Siberia above the poverty level. But how did we ever manage to get out of the technology of our forebears? Or sorry, how do we manage? How do we ever manage to let go? of the technology of our forebears. And here we are sniveling like sniveling that we are like bleh, and here we are sniveling that we are like paupers. Well okay, I think I'll come up with a something all the same. I'll produce the oil myself and my firm will only get wealthier. I decided I would try a second expedition along the Ob, back up north using only my headquarters ship. I loaded a variety of goods for sale into the hold and turned the film viewing room into a store. 
I decided to hire a new crew and not invite anyone from my firm. As things stood, my firm finance situation had worsened while I was distracted with my new interest. Two weeks after leaving Novisburg, my security guards reported that I'd, they had overheard conversation about the cedar, ringing cedars. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm distracted. There's a noise. <laughs> And in their opinion, the newly hired workers included some pretty strange people. To put it mildly, I began summoning individual crew members to my quarters to take to talk about the forthcoming trek into the Taiga. Some of them even agreed to go on a volunteer basis. Others asked for extra pay for this o operation, since it was not something they had agreed to when signing up for work. It was one thing to stay in the comfortable conditions abroad ship, Quite another to trek 25 kilometers into the Taiga and back, carrying loads of wood. My finances at the time were already pretty light. I had not planned on selling the cedar. After all, the Ulsters had said it would have, it would be given away. Sorry. After all, the Ulsters had said it should be given away. Besides, my main interest was not the cedar tree itself, but the secret of how to extract the oil. And of course, it would be fascinating to find out all the details connected with it. Little by little, with the help of my security guards, I realized that there would be attempts made to spy on my movements, especially after I left the ship. But for what purpose was unclear, and who was behind the, the would-be spies, I thought about it, and decided that it would be absolutely certain I would somehow have to outsmart everyone at once. End of chapter one. Chapter two, the encounter. Without a word to anyone, I arranged to have the ship stop not far from the place where I met the old men the previous year. Then I took a small motorboat and reached the village. I gave orders to a captain to continue along the trade route. I hoped I would be able to help of the local res. I hope I would be able to get the help of the local residents to look up the two old fellows see the ringing cedar with my own eyes, and determine the cheapest way of getting it back to the ship. Try tying the motorboat to a rock in the, on the shore, I was about to head for one of the little houses close by, but spotted a woman standing alone on the riverbank. I decided to approach her. The woman had on an old quilted jacket, long skirt, and high rubber galoshes of the kind worn by many residents of the northern backwoods during the spring and fall. On her head was a kerchief, trot tied so that the forehead and neck were fully covered. It was hard to tell just how old this woman was. I said hello and told her about the two old men I had met here the previous year. <clears throat> it was my grandfather and great-grandfather who talked with you here last year, Vladimir, the woman replied. I was amazed. Her voice sounded very young. Her dictation was crystal clear. She called me by my first name and right off used the informal form to, of address. I couldn't remember the names of the oldsters or whether we had in, even introduced ourselves at all. I thought now we must have done so since this woman knew my name. I asked her, deciding to continue in the same formal tone, and how do you call yourself? Anastasia, the woman answered, stretching out her hand towards my palm down as though expecting me to kiss it. This gesture of a countrywoman in a quilted jacket and galoshes standing on a deserted shore and trying to act like a lady of the world amused me to no end. I shook her hand. Naturally, I wasn't going to kiss it. Anastasia gave me an embarrassed smile and suggested I go with her into the Taiga to where her family lived. The only thing is... We'll have to make our way through the Taiga, 25 kilometers. That's not too much for you. Well, of course, it's rather far, but can you show me the ringing cedars? Yes, I can. You know all about that. You tell me. I should tell you what I know. Then let's go. Along the way, Anastasia told me how their family, their kin, had been live, living in the cedar forest generation after generation as her forebears had said over the course of several millennia. It is only extremely rare that they find some themselves in direct contact with people from our civilized society. These contacts 
do not occur in their places of permanent residence, but only when they come into the villages under the guise of hunters or travelers for some other settlement. Anastasia herself had two big cities, Tomsk and Moscow. Sorry. Anastasia herself had been to two big cities, Tomsk and Moscow, but only for one day each, not even to stay the night. She wanted to see whether she might have been mistaken in her perceptions about the lifestyle of city people. She had saved the money for the trip by selling berries and dried mushrooms. A local village woman had lent her her passport. Anastasia did not approve of her grandfather and great-grandfather's idea of giving away the ringing cedars with its healing properties to a whole lot of people. When asked why, she replied that the prices of cedar, sorry, <clears throat> that the pieces of cedar, where am I? Okay. That the pieces of cedar would be scattered among evildoers as well as good people. In all probability, the majority of the pieces would be snatched up by negative thinking individuals. In the final analysis, that might end up doing more harm than good. The most important thing in her opinion was to promote the good and to help people through whom the good was accomplished. If everyone was were benefited at random, the imbalance between good and evil would not be changed, but would stay the same or even worse. After my encounter with the Siberian oldsters, I looked through a variety of popular science literature along with a host of historical and scholarly works describing the unusual properties of the cedar. Now I was trying to penetrate and comprehend what Anastasia was saying about the lifestyle of the cedar people and thinking to myself, now what if anything can, can that be compared to? I thought about the Lykovs, a true story many Russians are familiar with from the account by Vasily Peskov of another family that lived an isolated life for many years in the Taiga. They were written up in the paper under the headline, Dead End in the Taiga, and where the subject of the television program I had formulated for myself an impression of the Lykovs as people who knew pretty nature pretty well, but had a rather fussy concept of our modern civilized life. But that this was a different situation, Anastasia gave the impression of someone who was perfectly acquainted with our life, and with something else beside that I couldn't fathom at all. <coughs> <clears throat> she was quite at ease discussing her city life. She seemed to know it firsthand. We walked along getting deeper into the woods and after about five kilometers stopped to rest. At this point she took off her jacket, kerchief and long skirt, and placed them in the hollow of a tree. All she was wearing now was a short, white, light frock. I was dumbstruck at what I saw. If I were a believer in miracles, I would put this down to something like extreme metamorphosis. For now, before me stood a very young woman with long golden hair and a fantastic figure. Her beauty was most unusual. It would be hard to imagine how any of the winners of the world's most prestigious beauty contest could rival her appearance or, as it later turned out, her intellectual prowess. Everything about this Tayega girl was alluring, simply spellbounding. You are probably tired, asked Anastasia. Would you like to rest for a while? We sat down on the grass, and I was able to get closer look at her face. There were no cosmetic coverings, her perfect features. Her lovely, well-toned skin bore no resemblance to the weather-beaten faces of people I knew who lived in the Siberian backwoods. Her large grayish blue eyes had a kindly look and her lips betrayed a gentle smile. As indicated, she wore a short, light white smock, something like a nightshirt, at the same time giving the impression that her body was not at all cold in spite of the 12 to 15 degree temperatures. I decided to have a bite to eat. I reached into my bag and took out sandwiches along with a travel bottle filled with good cognac. I offered to share it with Anastasia, but she refused a cognac, and for some reason even declined to eat with me. While I was snacking, Anastasia lay on the grass, her eyes blissfully closed. 
as though inviting the sun's rays to caress her. The rays reflected off of her upturned palms in the golden glow. Lying there, half exposed, she appeared absolutely gorgeous. Shoot, you know, are you even recording? I looked at her and thought to myself, now, why do women always bear to the limit either their legs or their breasts or everything at once with their mini skirts and I can't read that to collages? Is it not is it not to appeal to the men around them as if to say, look how charming I am, how open and accessible, and what are men obliged to do? Fight against their fleshy passions and thereby denigrate women with their lack of attention? or make advances towards them, and thereby break a God-given law. When I had finished eating, I asked, Anastasia, you are not afraid of walking through the Taiega alone? There is nothing I have to fear here, replied Anastasia. Interesting, but how would you defend yourself if you happened to encounter two or three burly men? Geologists or hunters, let's say. She didn't answer, only smiled. I thought, how is it that this so extraordinarily alluring young beauty could not be afraid of anything or anyone? What happened next will make me feel uncomfortable, even to this day. I grabbed her by her shoulder and pulled her close to me. She didn't offer any strong resistance, although I could feel a considerable degree of strength in her resilient body. The last thing I remember before losing consciousness was her saying, Do not do this. Calm down. And even before that, I remember being suddenly overcome by a powerful attack of fear. A fear of what? I couldn't grasp. As, some time, as, something, as sometimes happens in childhood when you find yourself at home all alone and suddenly become afraid of something. When I woke up, she was on her knees bending over me. One hand lay upon my chest while the other was waving to someone up above or to either side. She was smiling, though not at me, but rather it seemed at someone who was invisible around us or above us. Anastasia seemed to be literally gesturing to her invisible friend that there was nothing amiss going on. Then she calmly and tenderly looked me in the eye. Calm down, Vladimir. It's over now. But what was it? I asked. Harmony's disapproval of your attitude towards me, of the desire aroused in you. You will be able to understand it later. What's harmony got to do with it? It's you. It's only that you yourself begin began to resist. And I too did not accept it. It was offensive to me. I sat up and pulled my bag over toward me. Come on now. She didn't accept me. I was offensive to her. Oh, you women, you just do everything you can to tempt us. You bare your legs, stick your breasts, walk around in high heel shoes. Let's, that's very unacceptable, you, and yet you do it. You walk and you wiggle with all your charms. But as soon as, oh, I don't need that. I'm not that way. What do you wiggle for, then? Hypocrites. I'm an entrepreneur, and I've seen a lot of sorts. You all want the same thing. Only you all acted out differently. So why did you, Anastasia, take off your outer clothes? The weather's not that hot. And then you lolled about on the grass here with that alluring smile of yours. I'm not that comfortable in clothing, Vladimir. I put it on when I, I leave the woods and go out among people. But only so I can look like everyone else. I just laid down to relax in the sun and not disturbed you while you were eating. So you didn't want to disturb me? Well, you did. Please forgive me, Vladimir. Of course you are right about every woman wanting to attract man's attention, but not just to her legs and breasts. What she wants is not to let pass by the man who can see more than just those things. But nobody's been passing by here, and what is the more that and what is more that must be seen when it's your legs that are in front and center? Oh, you woman, you're so illogical. Yes, unfortunately, that is the way life sometimes turns out. Maybe we should get along, Vladimir. Have you finished eating? Are you rested? The thought crossed my mind. It was worth going on with this... Philosoph uh, was it worth going on with this philosophizing wild woman? But I replied, 
Fine, let's go. Chapter 3. Beast or Man We continued our journey to Anastasia's home. Her outer clothes left behind in the hollow tree, her galoshes too. She was still wearing the short, light, weight frock. She herself picked up my bag and offered to carry it barefoot. She walked ahead of me with an amazing light and grace step, waving the bag about with her with ease. We walked the whole time, talking with her on one subject was most interesting. Sorry. <laughs> we talked the whole time. Talking with her on any subject was most interesting, perhaps because she had her own strange ideas about everything. Sometimes Anastasia would whirl about while we were walking. She turned her face, her face to me, laughing, and kept on walking backwards, for a while quite absorbed in the conversation, so much as a glance down at her feet. How could she walk like that and not once stumble or pick her, prick her bare feet against the knot of a dry branch? Why didn't... We didn't seem to follow any visible path, on the other hand. Our way was not hindered by the tangled undergrowth so common in the Taiega. As she walked, she would occasionally touch her or quickly brush by a leaf or a twig on a bush. Or, bending over without looking, she would tear off some little blade of grass and eat it. Just like a little creature, I thought. When berries were handy, Anastasia would offer me a few to eat as we walked. The muscles of her body didn't seem to have any unusual features. Her overall physique appeared quite average, not too thin and not too plump, a resilient, well-fed and very beautiful body. But from what I could tell, it possessed a go goodly degree of strength and extremely sharp feet reflexes. Blah. Once when I stumbled and started to fall, my arms stretched in front of me. Anastasia whirled around with lightning speed, quickly placing her free hand under me and landing with my chest on her palm, her finger spread wide. Then she was supporting my body. There she was supporting my body with the palm of one hand, helping it retain its normal position. During all this time, she went on talking with not the slightest sign of strain. After I had straightened up with the help of her hand, we continued on our way, as though nothing whatever had happened. For some reason, my mind momentarily rested on the gas pistol I had in my bag. With all the interesting conversation, I hadn't realized how much ground we actually had covered. All at once, Anastasia stopped, put my bag down under a tree, and joyfully exclaimed, Here we are! At home! I looked around. A neat little glade, dotted with flowers amidst a host of majestic cedars, but not one single structure to be seen. Not even a hut. In a word, nothing. Not even a primitive lean-to, but Anastasia was beside herself with joy, as though she had arrived at the most comfortable dwelling. And where is your house? Where do you eat? Sleep? Keep shelter from the rain. This is my house, Vladimir. I have everything here. A dark sense of disquiet began to come over me. Where is everything? Let's have a tea kettle so we can at least heat up some water on the fire. Let's have an axe. I do not have a kettle or an axe, Vladimir, and it would be best not to light a fire. What are you talking about? She doesn't even have a kettle. The water in my bottle is all gone. You saw what I ate. I even threw the bottle away. Now there's only a couple of swallows of cognac left. To get to the river or to the village, it's a good day's walk, and I'm so tired and thirsty. Where do you get water from? What do you think? What do you drink? Seeing my agitation, Anastasia herself showed signs of concern. What do you drink out of? She quickly shook me by the hand and led me through the glade into the forest, admonishing me along the way. Not to worry, Vladimir. Please don't get upset. I shall take care of everything. You just rest. Get a good sleep. I shall take care of everything. You will not be cold. You are thirsty. I shall give you something to drink right away. Less than 10 or 15 meters from the glade, beyond a clump of bushes, we came across a small Taiga lake. 
Anastasia quickly scooped up a small quantity of water in her cupped hands and raised it to my face. Here's some water. Drink it, please. What? Are you crazy? How can you drink raw water out of some puddle in the woods? You saw how I was drinking on board the ship. Even for washing, we passed the river water through a special filter, chlorinate it, ozonize it. It's not a puddle, Vladimir. This is pure living water. Good water, not half destroyed water like yours. You can drink this water just like mother's milk. Look! Anastasia raised her cupped hand to her lips and took a drink. I blurted out, Anastasia, are you some kind of a beast? Why a beast? Because my bed is not like yours? There are no cars, no appliances? Because you live like a beast in the forest. You haven't any possessions and you seem to enjoy that. Yes, I enjoy living here. There, you see, you just made my point. Do you consider, Vladimir, that distinguishes man from all other creatures living on earth is his possessions of manufactured objects? Yes, but even more precisely, his civilized existence. And do you consider your existence to be more civilized? Yes, of course you do. But I'm not a beast, Vladimir. I'm a man. Chapter 4. Who are they? Subsequently, after spending three days with Anastasia and observing how this strange woman lives all by herself in the remote Siberian Taiga, I began to understand a little something of her lifestyle and to be confronted by a number of questions regarding our own. One of them still haunts me to this day. Is our system of education and bringing up children sufficient to comprehend the meaning of existence to arrange every individual's life priorities in the correct order? Does it help or hinder our ability to make sense of man's essence and purpose? We have set up a vast education system. It is on the basis of this system that we teach our children and each other. In kindergarten school, university, and postgraduate programs, it is this system that enables us to invent things and fly into space. We structure our lives in accordance with it. <clears throat> Through its help, we strive to construct some happiness for ourselves. I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> we strive to fathom the universe and the atom along with all sorts of anomalous phenomena. We love to discuss and describe them at great length in sensational stories in both the popular press and scholarly publications. But there is one phenomenon which, for some reason, we try all of our might to avoid, desperately try to avoid. One gets the impression that we are afraid to talk about it. We are afraid, I say, because it could so easily knock the wind out of our commonly accepted system of education and scientific deduction and make a mockery of the objects inherent in our lifestyle. And we try to pretend that such a phenomenon does not exist, but it does, and it will continue to exist however much we try how we try to turn away from it or avoid it. It's time to take a closer look at this, and just maybe through the collective effort of all human minds together, find an answer to the following questions. If you take all your great thinkers, without exception, people who have formulated religious teachings of all sorts of and all sorts of teachings, which is the vast majority of humanity are following, or at least in endeavoring to follow, why is it that before formulating their teachings, they become recluses, went into solitude, in most cases to the forest? Not to some upper academy, mind you, but to the forest. Why did the Old Testament Moses go off into a mountaintop forest before returning and presenting to the world the wisdom set forth on his tablets of stone? Why did Jesus Christ go off away from his disciples into the desert mountains and forest? Why did a man named Sahara Gautama, Siddhartha Gautama, who lived in India in the 6th century AD, spend seven years alone in the forest, after which the recluse came out of the forest back to people complete with a set of teachings, teachings which even to this day may certain many centuries later arouse a multitude of human minds and people build huge temples and call these teachings buddhism and the man and the man himself eventually came to be known as buddha 
And what about our own not-so-ancient forebears, now acknowledged as historical figures? Men such as Seraphim, Serkovsky, or Sergi, why did they too go off to become recluses in the forest? And how were they able, after a short period of time there, to go so fathom the depth of wisdom that the kings of this world made the long journey through uncharted wilderness to seek their advice? Monasteries and majestic temples were raised at the location of their respective solitudes. Thus, for example, the Trinity Sergeyev's monastery in the town of Sergeyev Posad near Moscow today attracts thousands of visitors each year, and it all started from a single forest recluse. Why? Who or what enabled these people to obtain their wisdom? Who gave them knowledge? Who brought them closer to understanding the essence of life? How did they live? What did they do? What did they think about during the forest solitude? These questions confronted me some time after my conversations with Anastasia. After I started reading everything that I could lay my hands on regarding recluses, but even today I haven't found answers. Why has nothing been written about their solitude experience? The answers, I think, must be sought through a collective effort. I shall try to describe the events of my three-day stay in the Siberian Taiga forest and my impression from my conversation with Anastasia, in the hopes that someone will be able to fathom the essence of this phenomenon and put together a clear picture of my way of, of her way of life. Of our way of life, meh. And hers. For now, on the basis of all that I had seen and heard, only one thing is crystal clear to me. People who live in solitude in the forest, including Anastasia, see what is going on in our lives from a point of view completely different from ours. Some of Anastasia's ideas are the exact opposite of what is commonly accepted. Who is closer to the truth? Who can judge? My task is, as simple, is to simply record what I have seen and heard and therefore give others an opportunity to come up with answers. Need water. And in the meantime, you can hear Kitty purring. <laughs> the answers, I think, must be sought through... Wait, I read that already. For now, on the basis of all that I have seen and heard, only one thing is crystal clear... Oop. Okay, I read that too, sorry. Okay, there it is. Anastasia lives in the forest all together alone. She has no house to call her own, she hardly wears any clothes, and does not store any provisions. She is the descendant of people who have been living here for thousands of years and represents what is literally a whole different civilization. She and those like her have survived to the present day, through that I can only term the wisest possible decisions. Very likely the only, very likely the only correct decisions. When they are amongst us, they blend in with us, trying to appear no different from ordinary people. But in their places of habitual residency, they merge with nature. It is not easy to find their habitual dwelling places. Indeed, man's presence in such places is betrayal only by the fact that they are more beautiful and better taken care of, like Anastasia's forest glade, for example. Anastasia was born here and is an integral part of the natural surroundings. In contrast to her celebrated recluses, she did not go off into the forest simply for a time as they did. To our contrary, to our, in contrast to our celebrated recluses. She did not go off into the forest simply for a time as they did. She was born in the Taiga and visits our world only for brief periods. And on the face of it, there seems to be quite a simple explanation for the strong fear that overwhelmed me and made me lose consciousness when I attempted to possess Anastasia. Just as we tame a cat, a dog, an elephant, a tiger, an eagle, and so on, here everything around has been tamed. And this everything is incapable of permitting anything bad to happen to her. Anastasia told me that when she was born, and while she was still under a year old, her mother could leave her alone on the grass. And you didn't die from hunger, I asked? The Taiga recluse first looked at me 
in a surprise, but then explained, There should be no problems of finding food for man. One should just as one breathes, and one should eat just as one breathes, not paying attention to the food, not distracting one's thoughts from more important things. The Creator has left this task up to others so that man can live as man, fulfilling his own destiny. She snapped her fingers, and right away a little squirrel popped up beside her, hope hopping on her hand. Anastasia lifted the creature's muzzle up to her mouth, and the squirrel passed from its mouth into it hers a cedar nut seed, its shell already removed. This did not seem to me anything out of the ordinary. I remember how back in the academic complex near Novisburg, a lot of squirrels were quite used to people and would beg for food from passerbys and even get angry if they weren't given anything. Here I was simply observing the process in reverse. But he this here was the Tayaga, and I said, In the normal world, our world, everything's arranged differently. If you, Anastasia, tried snapping your fingers at a privately run ki kiosk, or even beat on the drum, nobody would give you anything. And here you say the Creator has decided everything. Who is to blame if man has decided to change the Creator's creative design? Whether it is for the better or for the worse, that is up to you to divine. This is the kind of dialogue I had with Anastasia on the question of human sustenance. Her position is simple. It is sinful to waste thought on things like food and she does not think about it. But for us in our civilized world, as it happens, we are obliged to give it thought. We know from our books, reports in the press of TV programs, or a multitude of examples of infants who have found themselves out in the world and ended up being fed by wolves. Here in the Tayaga, generations of people have made their permanent residence, and their relationship to the animal kingdom is different from yours, I asked Anastasia. Why aren't you cold? When here, I, why aren't you cold when here I am in a warm jacket? Because, she replied, the bodies of people who wrap themselves in clothes to hide from the cold and heat gradually lose their ability to adapt to changes in their environment. In my case, this cap capacity of a human body has not been lost, and so I have no need of any special clothing. Okay. Chapter 5, The Forest Bedroom gonna have a bit more drink. I wasn't all equipped to spend the night in the wilds of the forest. Anastasia put me to bed in some kind of a cave hollowed out in the ground. Exhausted after my weary trek, I quickly fell fast asleep. When I woke up, I felt a sense of bliss and comfort, as though I were lying in a magnificent, comfortable bed. The cave of, or dugout was spacious, appointed with a small, feathery cedar twigs and dried grass, which filled the surrounding space with a fragrant aroma. As I stretched and spread my limbs on one, one hand touched a furry pelt, and I determined at once that Anastasia must be something of a hunter. I moved closer to the pelt, pressed my back to its warmth, and decided to have another little snooze. <clears throat> Anastasia was standing in the entrance by my forest bedroom. Noticing I was awake, she said at once, May this day come to you with blessings, Vladimir, and you should in turn greet it with your blessings. Only please do not be frightened. Then she clapped her hands and the pelt I was horror-struck at realization that this was no pelt. Out of the cave, a huge bear began to gingerly growl. Receiving a pat of approval from Astasia, the bear licked her hand and began lumbering off into the forest. It turned out that she had placed some belladonna herbs under my bed for a pillow and made the bear lie down beside me so I wouldn't get cold. She herself had curled up outdoors in front of the entranceway. <clears throat> Now, how could you do such a thing to me, Anastasia? He could have torn me to shreds or crushed me to death. <clears throat> First of all, it is not a he, but a she bear. She could not possibly have done anything to harm you, Anastasia responded. She is very obedient. She really enjoys it when I give her tasks to carry out. She never 
She will never budge the whole night. She just nuzzled her nose up to your leg and just kept blissfully still. She was so happy, only she did give a little shudder when you waved your arms about in your sleep and slapped her back. Chapter 6 Anastasia's Morning Chapter 6 Anastasia's Morning Anastasia goes to bed at nightfall in one of the shelters hollowed out by the creatures of the forest, most often in the bear's dugout. When it is warm, she can sleep right on the grass. The first thing she does upon waking is offer an exuberant outburst of joy to the rising sun, to the new sprouts on all the twigs, to the new shoots of growth popping up from the earth. She touches them with her hands, strokes them occasionally, adjusts something into place. Then she runs over to the little trees and gives them a thump on their trunks. The tree's top shakes and shower down on her, something resembling pollen or dew. Then she lies down on the grass and blissfully stretches and squirms. Her whole body becomes covered with what appears to be a moist cream. Then she runs off and jumps into her little lake, splashes about and dives to the bottom. She's a terrific diver. Her relationship with the animal world around her is very much like people's relationship with their household pets. Many of them watch uh, Anastasia as she does her morning routine. They don't approach her, but all she has to do is look in the direction of one of them and make the tiniest beckoning gesture, and the lucky one jumps up on the spot and rushes to her feet. I saw one how one morning she clowned around playing with a she-wolf, just as one might play with a family dog. Anastasia clapped the wolf on the shoulder and dashed off at full tilt. The wolf gave chase, and just as she was about to catch up with her, Anastasia, still on the run, suddenly jumped in the air, repelled herself with both feet off the trunk of a tree, and dashed off in another direction. The wolf couldn't stop, but kept on running past the tree finally making an about turn and chasing after the laughing Anastasia. Anastasia gives absolutely no thought to feeding or clothing herself. She most often walks about nude or semi-nude. She sustains herself with cedar nuts, along the varieties of herbs, berries, and mushrooms she eats, only dried mushrooms. She never goes hunting for nuts. Oh, yeah, she never goes hunting for nuts or mushrooms herself. Never stores up any kind of provision, even for the winter. Everything is prepared for her by the multitude of squirrels dwelling in these parts. <clears throat> Squirrel storing of nuts for the winter is nothing out of the ordinary. That's what they do everywhere, following their natural instinct. I was struck by something else. Though at the snap of Anastasia's fingers, any squirrel nearby would complete to be, compete to be the first to jump into her outstretched hand and give her the kernel of already shelled cedar nut. And whenever Anastasia slaps her legs bent at the knee, the squirrels make some sort of a sound as if signaling the others, and they all start bringing dried mushrooms and other supplies and laying them out before her on the grass. And this they do, it seems to them, with a good deal of pleasure. I thought she had trained them herself, but Anastasia told me that their reactions were instinctive, and the mother squirrel herself teaches this to her little ones by example. Perhaps one of my early forebears once trained them, but most likely this... I'm pretty sure I read this. Okay. Just very familiar. Um, perhaps one of my forebears once trained them, but most likely this is simply what they are destined to do. By the time winter has set, in each squirrel has stored up several times as many supplies as it can use for itself. To my question, how do you keep from freezing during the winter without the proper clothing, Anastasia replied with a question of her own. In your world, there are, are there no examples of people able to withstand the cold without special clothing? And I remembered the book by Porifri, who went around barefoot and wearing only shorts no matter how cold the weather. It tells in the book how the fastest wanted to test the endurance ability of this extraordinary Russian poured cold water over him in a minus 20 degree frost and then made him ride naked on a motorcycle. 
In the, her early childhood, in addition to her mother's milk, Anastasia was able to draw upon the milk of many different animals. They freely allowed her access to their nipples. She makes absolutely no ritual of mealtime, never sits down just to eat, but picks berries and sprouts of plants as she walks and continues on with other activities. By the end of my three-day stay with her, I could no longer relate to her as I had done at our first encounter. After all, I had seen and heard Anastasia had been transformed. I had seen, after all, I had seen and heard Anastasia had been transformed for me in some kind of a being, but not a beast, since she has such a high degree of intelligence. And then there's her memory. Oh, her memory is such that she, of course, forgets nothing of what she has seen or heard at any moment in time. At times, it seems that her abilities are well beyond her comprehension of the average person. But this very attitude toward her is something that greatly distresses and upsets her. In contrast to certain people we all know with unusual abilities, people who wrap themselves in an aura of mystery and exclusive exclusivity, she constantly tries to explain and reveal the mechanism underlying her abilities to prove that there was nothing supernatural to man in them or in her. That she was man, a woman, and she repeatedly asked me to bear that in mind. I did attempt to keep it in mind after that, and tried to find an explanation for this extraordinary phenomenon. In our civilization, one brain works to develop a life for oneself, ob obtain food to eat, and satisfy one's sexual instinct instincts. In Anastasia's world, no time t is spent on these things whatsoever. Even people who find themselves in a situation like the Lycals are obliged to constantly give thought to how to feed and shelter themselves. They don't get help from nature to the same extent sh as she does, Anastasia. There are all sorts of tribes living far from civilization that are not blessed with this kind of contact. According to Anastasia, it is because their thoughts are not pure enough. Nature and the animal world feels this. Chapter 7, Anastasia's Ray getting a drink of water. I think the most unusual mystical phenomenon I witnessed during my time in the forest was Anastasia's ability to see not only individuals as great distance, a great distance, but also what was going on in their lives. Possibly other recluses have had a similar ability. She did this with the help of an invisible ray. She maintained this was something everybody has. But people don't know about it and are unable to make use of it. Man has still not invented anything that is not already in nature. The technology blend behind television is but a poor imitation of the possibilities of this ray. The ray being invisible, I don't believe in it in spite of her perpetuating attempts to demonstrate and explain how it worked, to find some proof or plausible explanation. And then one day, Tell me, Vladimir, what do you think daydreams are? And do many people dream of the future? Daydreaming. Hmm. I think a lot of people are able to do that. It's when you imagine yourself in the future of your own desire. Fine, so you do not deny that man has the capacity to visualize his own future, to visualize various specific situations? That I don't deny. And what about intuition? Intuition is probably the feeling one has when instead of um, analyzing what or why something might happen, some sort of feeling suggests that right thing to do. So you do not deny that in man there exists something beside ordinary analytical reasoning that helps him determine his own and others' behavior. Well, let's say that's true. Wonderful, good excl exclaimed Ana mm. <laughs> Wonderful, good exclaimed Anastasia. Now, the night dream. The night dream, what is that? The dream almost all people have when they sleep. The night dream, that's, I really don't know what that is. When you're asleep, a dream is simply a dream. All right, all right, let us call it just a dream. But you do not deny it exists. You and other people are aware that someone in a dream state, when his body is almost beyond the control of a part of his consciousness, 
can see people and all sorts of things going on. Well, that, I think, is something nobody will deny. But still in dreams, people can communicate, hold conversation, emphasize? Yes, they can. And what do you think? Can a person control his dream? Call up in the dream images and events he would like to see, just like on in ordinary television, for example. I don't think that would work out for anyone. The dream somehow comes all by itself. You are wrong. Man can control everything. Man is designed to control everything. The ray I'm telling you about consists of information on one... <laughs> The ray I'm telling you about consists of information one possesses, concepts, intuitions, emotional feelings, as a result of dreamlike visions, consciously controlled by man's will. How can a dream be controlled by a, a dream? Did I wait, right? Say it right? No. How can a dream yeah, be controlled in a dream? Not in a dream, wide awake, as if pre-programmed, and with absolute accuracy. You only experience this in a dream, and it is and it is chaotic. Man has lost most of his ability to control, to control nature, phenomena, and himself. So he has decided that a night dream is simply an incidental byproduct of his tired brain. In fact, almost everybody on Earth, well, maybe I should try helping you see something at a distance right now, right here and now. Go ahead. Lie down on the grass and relax. Let go so that your body draws less energy. It is important that you are comfortable. Nothing in this, the way. Now think about the person you know best, your wife, for example. Re recollect her habits, how she walks, her clothing, where you think she might be right now, and turn the whole thing over to your imagination. I remembered my wife, knowing that at that moment she might be at our country home. I imagined the house and some of the furnishings and things. I remember a great deal in some detail, but I didn't see anything. I told Anastasia about all this and she replied, You are not able to get all the way as though you were going to go to sleep. I shall help you. Close your eyes, stretch out your arms in different directions. Closing my eyes, I felt her fingers touch mine. I began to immerse myself in a dream, or a wakeful doze. There was my wife standing in the kitchen of our country home. Over her usual dressing gown, she was wearing a knitted cardigan that meant it was cool in the house. Again, some kind of trouble with the heating system. My wife was making coffee on the gas stove, and something else in the small cock crock pot. My wife's face was gloomy and unhappy. Her movements, her movements were sluggish. All at once she turned her head, tripping over the window, looking out at the train, uh, looking out at the rain and smiled. The coffee on the stove was spilling over. She picked up the pot with its overflowing liquid, but didn't frown or get upset as she usually did. She took off the cardigan and I woke up. Well, did you see anything? Anastasia asked. I did indeed, but maybe it's just an ordinary dream. How could it be ordinary? Did you not plan on seeing your wife in particular? Yes, I did, and I saw her, but where is the proof that she was actually there in the kitchen by at that moment? I saw her in the dream. Remember this day and hour, Vladimir. If you want to have proof, then you get home and ask her. Was that there not... <laughs> Was there not something else out of the ordinary that you noticed? Can't think of anything. You mean to say you did not notice a smile on your wife's face? When she went over to the window, she was smiling, and she did not get upset when the coffee spilled. That I did notice. She probably saw something interesting out the window, which made her feel good. All she saw out the window was rain. Rain, which she never likes. So, why was she smiling? I too was watching your wife through my ray, and I warmed her up. So your ray warmed her up. What about mine? Too cold. You are only looking out of curiosity. You did not put any feeling into it. So your ray can warm up people at a distance. Yes, it can do that. And what else can it do? Obtain certain kinds of information or transmit. It can cheer up a person's mood and partially take away someone's illness. There are a lot of other things it can do, depending on the energy available and the degree of feeling, will, and desire. And can you see the future? 
Of course, the past too. The future and the past, they are pretty much the same thing. It is only the external details that are different. The, this essence always remains unchanged. How can that be? What can remain unchanged? Well, for example, a thousand years ago, people wore different clothes. They had different instruments at their disposal. But that is not the essence. Back a, a thousand years ago, just like today, people had the same feeling. Feelings are not subject to me. See, feelings are not subject to time. Fear, joy, love. Just think, Yurislav and the wise, Ivan the terrible, and the Egyptian pharaohs were all capable of loving a woman with exactly the same feelings as you or, or any other man today. Interesting. Only I'm not sure what it means. You say every person can have a ray like this? Of course everyone can. Even today, people will still have feelings and intuitions, the capacity to dream of the future, to conjure, to visualize specific situations, to have dreams while they sleep. Only it is all chaotic and uncontrollable. Maybe some kind of training necessary, some exercises could be developed. Some exercises might help, but you know, Vladimir, there is one absolute condition before the ray can be controlled by the will. And what condition is that? It is absolutely necessary to keep one's thoughts pure, as the strength of the ray depends on the strength of radiant feelings. Now, there you go, just when everything was starting to get clear. What have pure thoughts have to, got to do with it? Radiant feelings? What? They are what... They are what power the ray. That's enough, Anastasia. I'm already losing interest. Next, you'll be adding something else. I have already told you what is essential. You can say what you like, but you've got my own so many darn conditions. Let's talk about something else. Something a little simpler. All day long, Anastasia engages in meditation, visualizing all sorts of situations from our past, present, and future life. Anastasia possesses a phenomenal memory. She can remember a multitude of people she has seen in her imagination or through her ray and what they have been going through mentally. She's a consummate actress. She can imitate the way they walk and talk and even think the way they do. She concentrates her thoughts on the entire experience of millions of people in the past and present. She uses the knowledge she gains from this to visualize the future and to help others. This has she does at a great distance by means of her invisible ray. And the ones she helps through suggestion or decision or the ones she heals haven't the slightest idea that she is helping them. It was only later that I found out the similar rays, invisible to the eye, only of different degrees of strength, emanate from every individual. Anastasia's worldview is unusual and interesting. What is God, Anastasia? Does he exist? If so, why hasn't anyone seen him? God is the interplanetary mind or intelligence. He is not to be found in a single mass. Half of him is in the non-material realm of the universe. This is the sum total of all energies. The other half of him is dispersed across the earth. In every individual, in every man, the dark forces strive to block these particles. What do you think awaits our civilization? In the long term, a realization of the futility of the technocratic path of development and a movement back to our primal origins. You mean to say that all our scholars are immature beings who are leading us into dead end? I mean to say that they are accelerating the process. They are bringing you closer to the realization that you are on the wrong path. And so all the cars and houses we build are pointless? Yes. You're not bored living here alone, Anastasia, alone without television or telephone? These primitive things you mentioned, man has possessed them right from the very beginning, only in a more perfect form. I have them both, television and telephone. Well, what is television? A device through which certain information is served up to an almost atrophied human imagination, and scenes and stories, plots are acted out. I can, through my own imagination, outline the plot of any story and act out the most improbable situations, even take part in them myself, just like having an influence on the outcome. 
Oh dear, I suppose I have not been making myself too clear, eh? And the telephone? Every man can talk with any individual without the aid of the telephone. All that is needed is the will and desire of both parties and a developed imagination. Chapter 8. Concert in the Taiga I propose that she herself come to Moscow and appear on TV. Just think, Anastasia, with your beauty you could easily be a world-class fashion or mo photo magazine model. And at this point I realized that she was no stranger to earthly matters. Like all women, she delighted in being a beauty. Anastasia burst out laughing. A world-class beauty, eh? <laughs> she echoed my question and then, like a child, began to frolic about, prancing through the glade like a model on a catwalk. I was amused at her imagination and her imitation of a fashion model, placing one foot in front of the other in turn as she walked, showing off imaginary outfits. Finding myself getting into the act, I applauded and announced, and now, ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Performing before you will be that magnificent gymnast, second to none, that incomparable beauty, Anastasia. This announcement tickled her fancy even more. She ran out into the middle of the glade and executed an incredible flying somersault, first forward, then backward, then to the side, both left and right, then an amazing high leap into the air. Grasping a tree branch which one hand she swung herself around it twice before flinging her body over to another tree After yet another somersault she began to bow coquettishly to my applause Then she ran off out in the glade and hid behind some thick bushes Anastasia peeped smiling out from behind them as though they were a theater curtain impatiently waiting for my next announcement I remembered a videotape I had of some of my favorite songs being performed by popular artists. I would watch it occasionally in the evening in my cabin aboard a ship. Aboard ship. I had this tape in mind, but not with the thought that Anastasia would actually be able to reproduce anything from it, as I announced. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you the star singer of our current stage in a performance of their top hits. Your attention, please. Oh, how wrong I had been in my estimation of her abilities. What happened next I could not possibly have predicted. No sooner had Anastasia made her entrance from behind her improvised curtain than she launched into the authentic voice of Alla Pugacheva. No, it wasn't just a parody or an imitation, but Alla herself effortlessly conveying not only her voice but her intonations and emotions as well but even more amazing feature was to come anastasia actuated per particular words adding something of her own infusing the song with her own supplemental actuations so that Allah's own performance which before it seemed nobody else could even begin to surpass now called forth a whole new range of additional feelings, illuminating the images even more clearly in a magnificently executed overall performance of the song. Once lived an artist alone, canvas all through his home. He loved an actress, he thought. Flowers were her love fresh grown. He went and sold his big home, sold every canvas he owned, and with the money he bought, whole fields of flowers fresh grown. Anastasia put particular emphasis on the word canvas. She screamed out the word in fright and surprise. A canvas is an artist's most prized possession. Without it, he can no longer create. And here he is, giving up the most precious thing he owns for the sake of his loved one. Later, as she sang the words, then she went off on the rain. <laughs> then she went off on the train. I guess that's part of the words. Anastasia tenderly portrayed the artist in love, looking, lo lo ooh, looking longingly after the departed train, which was carrying off his loved one forever. She portrayed his pain, his despair, his perplexed state of mind. 
I was too shaken by everything I had seen and heard to applaud at the end of the song. Anastasia bowed, anticipating the applause, and hearing none, launched into a new song with even more enthusiasm. She performed all of my favorite songs in the same order they had been recorded on the videotape, and every single song which I had heard so many times before was now even clearer and more meaningful in her rendition. Upon completing the last song on the tape, still hearing no applause, Anastasia retreated backstage, too dumbfounded to speak. I remained silent, seated in silence, still feeling an extraordinary impression from what I had just witnessed. Then I jumped up, began applauding, and cried, Terrific, Anastasia! Encore! Bravo! All performers on stage! Anastasia ginger gingerly stepped forth and gave a bow. I kept on shouting, Encore! Bravo! Clapping my hands and stamping my feet. She too livened up. She clapped her hands and cried, Encore! Does that mean again? Yes, again and again and again. You did it so marvelously, Anastasia, better than the singers themselves, even better than her top stars. I fell silent and began attentively studying Anastasia. I thought how multifaceted her soul must be if she could infuse her singing performance with so many new, splendid, clear features. She too stood motionlessly, silent and inquiringly looking at me. Anastasia, do you have any song of your own? Couldn't you sing something of your own, something I haven't heard before? I could, but my song does not have any words. Would you still like to hear it? Please, sing your song. Fine. And she started in singing her most unusual song. Anastasia first screamed. Anastasia first screamed like a newborn baby. Then her voice started sounding quiet, tender and caressing. She stood beneath a tree, her hands clasped to her breast, her head bowed. It was like a lullaby, gently caressing a little one. With her voice, her voice spoke to him of something very tender. Her soft voice, amazingly pure, caused everything around to grow silent. The birds singing, the chirping of the crickets in the grass. At that point, Anastasia seemed to take absolute delight in the little one walking from sleep. Waking from sleep, sorry. The sound of rejoicing could be heard in her voice. The incredible high-pitched sound soared above the earth before taking flight into the heights of infinity. Anastasia's voice first pleaded, then went into battle, and then once again caressed the little one and bestowed joy upon all around. I too felt this all-pervading sense of joy. And when she finished her song, I joyfully exclaimed, And now, my dear ladies and gentlemen, a unique and never-before-repeated number by a top animal trainer in the world, the most agile, brave charming trainer capable of taming any beast of prey on earth behold and tremble anastasia positively squealed with delight leapt into the air clapped her hands in rhythm shouted something started in this in <clears throat> sorry um shouted something started in whistling something i could never have imagined began taking place in the glade First the she-wolf made her entrance. She leapt out of the bushes and stepped at the edge of the glade, giving a puzzled look around. In the trees, further from the glade, squirrels sprang from branch to branch, two eagles circled low overhead, while little creatures of some kind rushed in the bushes. With the sharp cackle of dry twigs as they, he broke and crushed the bushes, a huge bear lumbered out into the glade and stepped stopped as though embedded in the ground just short of anastasia the wolf began growling at him disapprovingly since the bear had approached so close to anastasia without an invitation anastasia ran up to the bear playfully stroked his muzzle then grabbed him by his front paws and stood him upright judging by the fact that she didn't seem to be exerting some much physical effort in this the bear himself must have been carrying out her commands according to how much he understood and how he interpreted them. He stood stock still, trying to understand what was desired of him. Anastasia took a running leap and grabbed hold of the thick scarf, scruff, oh my goodness, <laughs> of the bear's neck, did a handstand on his shoulders, jumped off again with a somersault on her own way down. Then she took the bear by one paw and started to bend over, pulling the bear after her. Creating the impression that she was tossing him over her shoulder. This trick would have been impossible if the bear had not been able to do 
it himself. Anastasia simply guided him. It looked at first as though the bear was going to fall on Anastasia, but at the last moment he reached out a paw onto the ground and broke his fall. He was no doubt doing everything he could not to harm his mistress or friend. In the meantime, the wolf was become more and more concerned. She was already standing at the place of the action, thrashing from side to side, growling or howling with displeasure. At the edge of the glade there appeared several more wolves, and when Anastasia was on the point of yet another routine toss of the bear over her shoulder, the bear attempted to do the trick properly, fell over his side, and remained motionless. At last the wolf, now at her wit's end, and with malicious grin, made a leap in the bear's direction with lightning speed, Anastasia placed herself in the wolf's path. The wolf barked with all fours, somersaulted over her back, bumped into Anastasia's leg. Immediately, Anastasia put one hand on the back of the wolf, who obediently crouched to the ground. With her other hand, she began waving as she had done the first time with me, when I had tried to embrace her without her consent. The forest around us began to make rustling sounds, not threats, not threatening, but with some agitation. The agitation was felt as well in all the big and little creatures jumping and running and hiding. Anastasia began t talking away, <sighs> taking away the agitation. First she stroked the wolf, slapped her on the back, and sent her off out in the glade as though she were a pet dog. The bear was still laying on his side in an uncomfortable pose, like a fallen scarecrow. He was probably waiting to see what else was required of him. Anastasia went over to him, made him stand up, stroked his muzzle, and sent him out of the glade like the wolf. Anastasia, blushing and cheerfully, ran over and sat down beside me. Breathing in deeply and slowly, I exhaled. I noticed that her breathing all at once became even as though she hadn't been carrying out any extraordinary exercises at all. You're terrific, Anastasia, but we already have all that, and our circus trainers show us a lot of interesting tricks with animals, but you don't have a hope of breaking through all the red tape to even get started. There are so many formalities and machin machinations to deal with, you don't have any experience in that. The remainder of our play consisted in going over possible alternatives. Where could Anastasia get a job in our world, and how would she overcome the formalities in the way? But no easy alternative presented itself, since Anastasia had neither a resident permit nor proof of education, and nobody would believe the stories about her origins on the basis of her abilities, no matter how extraordinary they might be. Suddenly turning serious, Anastasia said, Of course, I would like to visit one of the big cities again, maybe Moscow, to see how accurate I was in visualizing certain situations from your life. For one thing, I am at a complete loss to understand how the dark forces manage to fool women to such a degree that they unwittingly attract men with the charms of their bodies, and thereby deprive them of the opportunity of making a real choice to choose someone close to their heart, and they themselves suffer for not being able to create a real family, since... And once again she launched into a deep and poignant discussion about sex, family, and the upbringing of children, and I could only think... The most incredible thing in all I have seen and heard is her ability to talk about our lifestyle and understand it in such a specific detail. Chapter 9. Who Lights a New Star? On the second night, fearing that Anastasia would once again assign me her she-bear or concoct up some new device to keep me warm, I categorically refused to go to sleep at all unless she herself lay down beside me. I thought that as long as she was beside me, she wouldn't be up to any tricks, and I told her, You're inviting me as a guest. I take it in your home. I imagine there would be at least a few buildings here, but you won't even let me light a fire, and you offer me a beastie to keep me company at night. If you don't have a normal home, what's the point of inviting a guest? All right, Vladimir, do not worry, please. Do not be afraid. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. If you want, I shall lie down beside you and keep you warm. This time in the dugout caves, there were even more cedar branches strewn around, along with neatly arranged dry grasses. 
and there were also branch struck on the wall. Branches. <laughs> I got undressed. I put my sweater and trousers under my head for a pillow. I lay down and covered myself with my jacket. The cedar twigs gave off that same bacteria-killing aroma described in the popular literature as capable of purifying the air, though here in the Taiega the air is already too so pure. Pure. The air in the cave was particularly easy to breathe. The dry grasses and flowers contributed to still more unusual delicate fragrance. Anastasia kept her word and lay down beside me. I sensed the fragrance of her body, which surpassed all other odors. It was more pleasant than the most delicate perfume I had ever sensed from a woman's body. But now I had no thought of wanting to possess her. After my attempt to do so on the way to the glade, which had resulted at the time in an attack of fear and loss of consciousness, I no longer felt aroused by fleshy desires, even when I saw her naked. I lay down and dreamt of my son, my wife never bore to me, and I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if my son could be born by Anastasia? She is so healthy, sturdy, and beautiful. The child, then, too, would be healthy. He would look like me, like her, too, but more like me. He would be a strong and clever individual. He would know a lot. He would become talented and prosper. I imagined our infant son sucking at his mother's nipple and involuntarily put my hand on Anastasia's warm, supple breast. Immediately, I sh a shiver ran through my whole body and then dissipated at once. But it wasn't a shiver of fear, but something else extraordinarily pleasing. I didn't take my hand away, but only held my breath and waited for what might happen. Next thing I noticed was a feeling of the soft palm of her hand on mine. She did not push me away. I raised my head and began looking into Anastasia's marvelous face. The white, the, the white twilight of the northern night made it seem even more attractive. I couldn't take my gaze off her. Her grayish-blue eyes looked at me tenderly. I didn't restrain myself, but bent closer and quickly and carefully with just the slightest touch planted a kiss on her half-open lips. Once more, a pleasing shiver ran through my body. My face was enshrouded with fragrance of her breath. Her lips didn't utter, as the last time, do not do this, calm down, and I had no fear at all. I was still haunted, haunted by I was still haunted by the prospect of a son, and when Anastasia tenderly embraced me, stroked my hair, and gave me my whole body to me, I felt something indescribable. And great gave her whole body to me. Oh my goodness, my <laughs> uh, only upon awakening in the morning was I able to realize that this kind of magnificent feeling, blissful excitement, and satisfaction was something I had never once experienced in my entire life. Another peculiar thing, after the night spent with a woman, I had always felt a sense of physical fatigue, but here, everything was different. In addition, I had the feeling of some kind of great co-creation. My satisfaction just wasn't something physical, but had another dimension. I couldn't quite comprehend one, and I'd never experienced before extraordinary loving and joyful. The thought that even flashed through my mind that life was worth living just for this feeling alone, and why had I never experienced anything that even came close to this before, even though there had been all sorts of women, beautiful women, beloved women, women experienced in love. Anastasia was a girl, a tender, quivering girl, but beyond that, there was something in her that belonged not to a single woman I had known. What was it? And where had she gone now? I made my way over to the entrance of the cozy dugout cave, put my head out, and looked out into the glade. The glade was situated slightly than my nighttime resting place. Sorry, guys, I need to move. <laughs> um, it was covered by a layer of morning mist a half meter thick. In this mist, I could see Anastasia spinning around with outstretched arms. A little cloud of mist was forming about her. And when it covered her completely, Anastasia sprang easily into the air, stretched out her legs in a split, just like a ballerina, flew over the layer of mist, landed in a different spot, and once more laughingly spun a new cloud around her, through which could be seen the rays of the rising sun, gently caressing her body. It was a Anastasia, 
Good morning, my splendid forest fairy. Anastasia, yeah, yeah. Good morning, Vladimir, she joyfully called out in response. It's so delightful, so wonderful out right now. Why is that? I cried as I, as loud as I could. Anastasia put her hands towards the sun and began laughing. With what hap, with that happy, <laughs> Anastasia lifted her hands toward the sun and began laughing with that happy, alluring laugh of hers, <laughs> calling out to me and someone else besides high above in a sing-song voice. Out of all the creatures in the universe, only man is given an experience like that. Only men and women sincerely desire to have children between them. Only man, having such an experience, lights a new star in the heavens. Only man, striving for creation and co-creation. Thank you. And addressing me alone, she quickly added, Only man, striving for creation and co-creation, and not for satisfaction of his carnal needs. And then again, she went off in a thrills of laughter, leapt high into the air, stretched her legs into splits as though soaring over the mist. Then she came running over, sat down beside me at the entrance of her nighttime resting place, and began combing her golden tresses with her fingers, lifting them up from the bottom. So you do not so you don't consider sex to be something sinful, I asked? Anastasia fell silent. She looked at me in an amazement and responded. Was that the same kind of sex the word implies in your world? And if not, then what is more sinful? To give of yourself so that a man can come into the world or to hold back and not allow a man to be born, a real man. I started thinking. In actual fact, my nighttime closeness with Anastasia could not possibly be described by our usual word, sex. Then what did happen last night? What term would be appropriate here? And I, so I asked. And why did anything even approaching that experience never happen with me before? Or, for that matter, I would venture to say with, hurdle, with hardly anybody else in the world. You see, Vladimir, the dark forces are constantly trying to make man give in to base fleshy passions, to stop him from experiencing God-given grace. They try all sorts of tricks to persuade people that satisfaction is something you can easily obtain, thinking only of carnal desire, and at the same time they separate man from truth. The poor, deceived women are, who are ignorant of this spend their lives accepting nothing but suffering and searching for the grace they have lost. But they are searching for it in the wrong place. No woman can restrain a man from fornication if she allows herself to submit to him merely to satisfy his carnal needs. If, this, if that has happened, their material life will not be a happy one. Their material life is only an illusion of tough of togetherness, a lie, a deception, accepted by convention. For the woman immediately becomes a fornicator, regardless of whether she is married to the man or not. Oh, how many laws and conventions mankind has invented in an attempt to artificially strengthen this false union. Laws both religious and secular, all in vain. All they have done is cause people to play around, accommodate themselves, and imagine that such a union exists. One's innermost thoughts invariably remain unchanged, subject to nobody and nothing. Christ, Jesus saw this, and trying to counteract it, he said, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Then you and your not-so-distant past have tried to attach shame to anyone who leaves his family, but nothing at any time or in any situation has been able to stop man's desire to seek out that sense of intuitively felt grace, the greatest satisfaction, and to persist in seeking it. A false union is a frightening thing. Children, do you see, Vladimir? Children, they sense the artificiality, the falsity of such a union, and this makes them skeptical about everything their parents tell them. Children subconsciously sense the lie even during their conception, and that has a bad effect on them. Tell me who, what individual, would want to come into the world as a result of carnal pleasure alone? Who would all like to be created under a great impulsion of love? 
the aspiration to creation itself and not simply come into the world as a result of something carnal pleasure of someone's carnal pleasure people who have come into false union will then look for true satisfaction in secret apart from each other they will strive to possess body after body or make paltry and faithful use of their own bodies realizing only intuitively that they are drifting farther and farther away from the true happiness of true union anastasia wait i can't i i mean can it be that men and women are doomed this way if if the first time all that happens between them is sex is there no turning back no possibility of correcting the situation there is i know now what to do but where do i find the right words to express it i'm always looking for them the right words i have been looking for them in the past and in the future but i have not found them perhaps they are right in front of me after all and then they will appear new words will be born words capable of reaching people's hearts and minds new worlds of the ancient truth about our their primal origins don't panic, Anastasia. Using existing words to start with, just as an approximation, what else is needed for true satisfaction apart from two bodies? Complete awareness, a mutual striving to create sincerity and purity of motive. How do you know all this, Anastasia? I am not the only one who knows about it. A number of enlightened people have tried to explain it to the world. Vels, Krishna, Rama, Shiva, Christ, Mohammed, Buddha. You've what? Read about all these people? Where? When? I have not read about them. I simply know that th what they said, what they thought about, and what they wanted to accomplish. So sex by itself, according to you, is bad? Very bad. It leads man away from truth, destroys families, and enormous amount of energy is wasted. Then why do so many different magazines publish pictures of naked women in erotic poses? Why are there so many films with erotica and sex? And all of this is extremely popular. Demand generation sur sur <sighs> demand generate supply. So, you're trying to say that our humanity is completely bad? Humanity is not bad, but the device of the dark forces obscuring spirituality by provoking base carnal desires... These are very powerful devices. They bring people a lot of grief and suffering. They act through women, exploiting their beauty, a beauty whose real purpose is to engender and support in men the spirit of the poet, the artist, the creator. But do that woman themselves? They must be pure. If there is not sufficient purity, they start trying to attract men by fleshy charms. The outward beauty of empty vessels in the upshot the men are deceived and the women must suffer their whole lives on account of this deception so what then is the result i queried through all the millennia of their existence mankind has not been able to overcome these devices of the dark forces that would mean they are stronger than man man hasn't been able to overcome them in spite of the appeals by spirituality enlightened people as you put it so is it downright impossible to overcome them or maybe it's not necessary is it necessary absolutely necessary it is necessary who then can do it women women who have been able to grasp the truth in their own appointed purpose then the men will change too Oh, no, Anastasia, I doubt it. A normal man will always be aroused by a pretty woman's legs, her breasts, especially when you're on the business trip or on holiday far away from your partner. That's the way things are, and nobody here will change anything. They don't do it any other way. But I did it with you. What did you do? Now you are no longer able to indulge in that harmful sex. All at once a terrible thought hit me like a flood and started chasing away the magnificent feeling that had been born in me during the night. What have you done, Anastasia? What? I, I now... What? I'm now impotent? On the contrary, you have now become a real man. Only the uh, usual sex will be repugnant to you. It does not bring what you experienced last night, and what you experienced last night is possibly only when you desire to have a child and the woman wants the same from you, when she loves you. 
loves. But under those conditions, that can happen only a few times during one's whole life. I assure you, Vladimir, that is enough for your whole life to be happy. You will feel the same way eventually. People enter many times afresh into sexual interaction only through the flesh, not realizing that true satisfaction is the flesh in the flesh is impossible to attain. A man and a woman who unite on every plane of existence, impelled by radiant inspiration, earnestly inspired to the act of creation, experience tremendous satisfaction. The Creator gave this experience to man alone. No transitory thing, this satisfaction, no. I can never, it can never, can, ugh, it never can compare with fleeting fleshy gratification. As you cherish the feelings from it over time, all planes of being will with influence sublime. Happily, happify your life and the woman too. A woman who can give birth to a creation in the creator's own image and likeness, his design. Anastasia held out her hand toward me, trying to move closer. I quickly darted away from her into a corner of the cave and cried out of my, and cried out of my way. <laughs> she got up. I crawled outside and backed off from her a few steps. You have deprived me, quite possibly, of my chief pleasure in life. Everybody strives for it. Everybody thinks about it. Only they don't talk about it out loud. They are illusions, Vladimir. These pleasures of yours. I have helped you save a, you from a terrible, harmful, sinful appetite. Illusions or not doesn't make any difference. It's a pleasure recognized by everyone. Don't even think of trying to save me from any harmful appetites you see of me. You see of them. Or by the time I get out of here, I'll be no relations with women, no drinks or appetizers, no smoking. That's not something most people are used to in normal life. Well, what good is there in drinking, smoking, senseless and harmless digestion of such huge quantify of animal meat? Sorry, huge quantity of animal meat. When there are so many splendid plants created especially for man's nourishment. You go and feed yourself with plants if you like. But don't come near me. A lot of us get pleasure out of smoking, drinking, sitting down to, to a good meal. That's how we do things. Do you understand? That's how. But everything you name is bad and harmful. Bad? Harmful? If guests come to celebrate at my place and they sit down at the table and, and I tell them, Here are some nuts to gnaw and have an apple. Drink water and don't smoke. Now that would be bad. Is that the most important thing when you get together with friends to sit right down at the table and drink, eat, and smoke? Whether it's important, whether it, sorry, it's not easy. Whether it's the most important thing or not is beside the point. That's how people behave all over the world. Some countries even have ritual dishes. Roast turkey, for example. This is not accepted by everyone, even in your world. Maybe not by everyone, but I happen to live among normal people. Why do you consider the people around you to be the most normal? Because they're the majority? That is not a good enough argument. It's not good enough for you because it's something impossible to explain to you. My anger at Anastasia began to pass. I recalled hearing about medical prescriptions and sex therapists, and the thought came to me that if she had somehow injured me, the doctors would be able to fix it, I said. Okay, Anastasia, let's make peace. I'm no longer angry at you. I thank you for the wonderful night, only don't you try saving me from any more of my habits. As far as sex goes, I'll fix the situation with the help of a doctor in modern medicine. Let's go for a swim. I began heading to the lake, admiring the morning woods. Just as my good mood was beginning to come back, she, well, there you go again, walking behind me, she piped up. Medicine and doctor will not help you now. To put everything back the way it was, they will have to erase your memory of everything that happened and everything you felt. Stunned, I stopped in my tracks. Then you put everything back the way it was. I cannot. Again, I was overwhelmed by a feeling of rampant rage, and at the same time fear. You, you brazen, you sp you poke your nose in where it doesn't belong and turn my life upside down. So you played a nasty trick on me, and now you say you can't fix it? 
I did, I did not play any nasty tricks. After all, you wanted a son so badly. S but so many years had gone by, and you still did not have a son. And none of the women in your life would bear you a son. I also wanted a child by you, a son too, and that is something I can do. And why are you getting so concerned ahead of your time, ahead of time that things are going to go badly for you? Maybe you'll still come to understand. Please do not be afraid of me, Vladimir. I am certainly not trying to meddle with your mind. This happened all on its own. You got what you wanted. And I would still very much like to save you from at least one mortal sin. And what's that? Pride? You're a funny one. Your philosophy and lifestyles aren't human. What do you find in me so inhuman that frightens you? You live all alone in a forest, communicate with plants and animals. Nobody in your society even comes close to that kind of life. How can that be, Vladimir? Why, Anastasia exclaimed, flustered. You're Dashniks. They too communicate with plants and animals, only not consciously, but they will understand one day. Many have already began to understand. Oh, come on. Now she's a Dashnik. And this ray of yours, you know a lot, but you don't read books. You must be some kind of mystic. I shall try to explain everything to you, Vladimir, only not all at once. I'm trying, but I cannot find the right words, comprehensible words. Please believe me, all my abilities are inherent in man. It is something man was given right from the start. Back in the days of his primal origins, and everyone could do the same today. Nevertheless, people are starting to get back to their primal origins. It will be a gradual process after the force of light triumph. What about your concert? You sang in all sorts of different voices. You portrayed my favorite artists in even the same order as on my videotape. That is right, Vladimir. You know I once saw that tape of yours. I shall tell you later how it happened. And what, you write off memorize the words and tunes of all the songs? Yeah, yes, I memorize them. What is so complex or mystical about that? Oh dear, what have I gone and done? I have talked too much. I have shown too much. I am muddle-headed and tactless. My grandfather once called me that. I thought he was just being affectionate. But in fact, I probably am tactless. Please, Vladimir. Anastasia's voice betrayed a human concern, and this was probably the reason that almost all my fears of her had now left me. My whole feelings were preoccupied with the prospect of my son. Okay, I'm no longer afraid. Only please try to be a bit more restrained. Remember your grandfather told you that. Yeah, yes, grandfather, but here I am talking and talking. I have such a strong desire to tell you everything. I am a chatterbox, yes, but I shall try. I shall try very hard to restrain myself. I shall try to speak only in the terms you will understand. So, you'll soon be giving birth, Anastasia? I said. Of course, only it will not be on time. What do you mean it will not be on time? Ideally, it should be in the summertime when nature can help with the nurturing. Why did you make that decision if it's so risky for you to and the child? Oh, don't worry, Vladimir. At least our son will live. And you? And I shall try to hold on till the spring, and everything will adjust itself then. Anastasia said this without a tinge of sorrow or fear for her life. Then she ran off and jumped into the little lake. The spray of the water in the sunlight took flight just like fireworks and landed on the smooth mirror-like surface of the water. Some thir thirty seconds later, her body slowly began to break the surface. She lay as it were on the water, her arms widespread, her arms and palms upturned and smiling. I stood on the shore, looked at her and thought to myself, Will the squirrel hear the snap of her fingers when she lies with her baby? In one of her shelters, will she get help from any of her four-footed friends? Will her body have enough heat to warm up the little one? If my body could cool off, the baby have nothing to eat. If my body should cool off, the baby would have nothing to eat. He will start crying. 
she said quietly, coming out of the water. His cry of despair may awaken nature, or at least part of it, before the beginning of spring, and then everything will be all right. They will nurse him. You read my thoughts? No, I just guessed you were thinking about that. That is quite natural. Anastasia, you said your relatives live close by. Would they be able to help you? Oh, they're very busy, and I must not take them away from their work. What are they busy with, Anastasia? What do you do all day long, when in fact you are so completely served by your natural environment? I keep busy, and I try to help people in your world, the ones you call dashniks or gardeners. <clears throat> Can I do one more? We'll stop for now. Chapter 10 Her Beloved Dashniks Anastasia enthusiastically explained to me how many new opportunities could open up for people who communicate with plants. There were two major subjects she talked about. Not only their particular excitement and animation, but I would have to admit with a kind of love, namely bringing up children on the one hand and dashniks on the other. According to everything she said about these people and the importance she attached to them, we would all need, wait, we would all need to literally bow on our knees before them. Just think, according to her, the dashniks have not only managed to save the whole nation, from famine, but also sown seeds of good in people's hearts, and are educating the society of the future. There are far too many points to emulate here. One would need a whole book, and Anastasia kept on arguing, trying to demonstrate this. <clears throat> you see, the society you are living in today can learn a lot from communication with the plants to be found around dashes. Yes, I am talking about the dashes where you personally know every individual plant in your garden plot, and not those huge and personal field cultivated by monstrous, senseless machines. People felt better when they are working on their dasha plots. Many of them end up living longer. They become kinder, and it is this very dashniks that can pave the way for society to become aware of how de destructive the technocratic path can be. Anastasia, whether that's true or not, for a time being, beside the point, what's your role in all this? What kind of help can you offer? Taking me by the arm, she led me over to the grass. We lay on, the ba on our backs, the palms of our hands turned up. Close your eyes, let go, and try to picture to yourself what I am saying. Right now, I'll take a look with my ray and locate, at a distance, some of these people you call dashniks. After a period of silence, she began to say softly, An old woman is unwrapping a piece of cheesecloth in which cucumber seeds have been soaking. The seeds have already begun to develop quite a bit, and I can see little sprouts. Now, she has picked up a seed. I have just suggested to her that she should not soak the seed so much. They will become deformed when they are planted, and this kind of water is not good for them. The seed will go bad. She thinks she herself must have guessed that, and that is particularly true. I just helped her guess a bit. Now she just will share her idea and tell other people about it. This little deed is none. Anastasia told how she visualizes in her consciousness all sorts of situations involving work, recreation, and people's interactions, both with each other and with plants. When the situation she has visualized come closer to reality, connect contacts it's established whereby she can see the person and feel what this person is suffering or sensing. She herself then, as it were, steps into the image of the person and shares her expertise with them. Anastasia said that plants react to people, to man, with love or hate, and exercise a positive or negative influence on people's health. And here is where I have an enormous amount of work to do. 
I kept I keep myself busy with the dash and the garden plots. The dashniks travel out on to their plots, their planting. They are like their own children, but unfortunately their relationship to them is still pretty much on the level of intuition. They still do not have the foundation that comes with a clear realization of the true purpose behind this relationship. Everything but everything on earth, every blade of grass, every insect has been created for man, and everything has its individual appointed task to perform in the service of man. The multitude of medicine plants are a confirmation of this. But people in your world know very little how to benefit from the opportunities they are presented with about how to take full advantage of them. I asked Anastasia to show some concrete examples of the benefits of conscious communication, an example that could be seen, verified in practice, and subject to scientific investigation. Anastasia thought for a little while, then suddenly brightened and exclaimed, The Dashniks, my beloved Dashniks, they will prove it all. They will show what is true and confound all your science. Now how is it? I did not think of that or understand it before. Hmm. Some kind of brand new idea made her wobble over with joy. The whole time I was with her, not once did I see Anastasia sad. She can be serious, thoughtful, concentrated, but more often than not, delighted in something. This time her joy literally bubbled over. She jumped up and clapped her hands, and it seemed to me as though the whole forest had become brighter and began to stir responding to her with the rustling of treetops and the singing of birds. She whirled around and around as though she were doing a kind of dance. Then all radiant, she once again sat down beside me and said, Now they will believe, all in account of them. My dear Dashniks, they will explain and prove everything. Try to bring her a little more quickly back to the topic of our, uh, Interrup inter interrupted conversation, I noted. Not necessarily. You say that every insect has been created for man's benefit, but how can people believe what they, when they look at and with so much loathing on the cockroach crawling over their kitchen tables? What can it be that they do too have been created for our benefit? Cockroaches, declared Anastasia, will only crawl over a dirty table to collect their remains of food particles laying about, particles too small for the human eye to see. They process them and render them harmless before discarding them in some secluded spot. If there are too many of them springing, if there are too many of them, simply bring a frog into the house, and the surplus cockroaches will disappear at once. When Anastasia went on purpose, the Dashniks do will probably contradict the principles of the plant science. They will certainly contradict the commonly accepted method of planting and cultivating ver various garden plot crops. Her affirmations, however, are so colossal that it seems to me that they would be worth trying out for any one with the opportunity to do so. Maybe not throughout their whole plot, but at least in one small section of it, especially since nothing harmful and only good can come of it. Besides, much of what she told me has already been confirmed by the experiments of biological science expert McKeel. I can't read the name, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> Part 2 of the book. Advice from Anastasia. The Seed as Physician. Anastasia stated, Every seed you plant contains within itself an enormous amount of information about the universe. Nothing made by human hands can compare with this information, either in size or accuracy. Through the help of this data, the seed knows the exact time, down to the millisecond, when it will come alive and grow. What juices it is to take from the earth, how to make use of the rays of the celestial bodies, the sun, moon, and stars, what it is to grow into, what fruit to bring forth. These fruits are designed to sustain man's life, more powerful and efficient than any manufactured drug of the present or future. These fruits are capable of counteracting and withstanding any disease of the human body. But to this end, the steed must now know about the human condition. 
so that during the mat maturation process it can saturate its fruits with the right correlation of substance to heal a specific individual of his disease, if indeed he has it or is prone to it. In order for the seed of a cucumber, tomato, or any other plant grown in one's plot to have such information, the following steps are necessary. Before planting, put into your mouth one or more little seeds. Hold them in your mouth under the tongue for at least ten minutes. Then place the seed between the palms of your hands and hold it there for about 30 seconds. During this time, it is important that you be standing barefoot on the spot of earth where you will later be planting it. Open your hands and carefully raise the seed which you are holding to your mouth. Then blow on it lightly, warming it with your breath, and the wee little seed will know everything that it is within you. When you need to hold it with your hands open another 30 seconds, sorry, then you need to hold it with your hands open another 30 seconds, presenting the seed to the celestial bodies, and the seed will determine the moment of its awakening. The planets will all help it and will give the sprouts the light they need to produce fruit, especially for you. After that, you may plant the seed in the ground. In no case should you water it right after, so as not to wash away the saliva which is now covering it, along with other information about you that the seed will take in. It can be watered three days after planting. The planting must be done in, on days appropriate to each vegetable. People already know this from the lunar cycle calendar. In the absence of water, a premature planting is not as harmful as an overdue planting. It's not a good idea to pull up all the weeds growing in the vicinity of the sprouts. At least one of each kind should be left in place. The weeds can cut, be cut back. According to Anastasia, the seed is thus able to take in information about the person who plants it, and then during the cultivation of its fruit, it will pick up from the universe and the earth the optimum blend of energies needed for a given man. The weeds should not be disposed of completely as they have their own appointed function. Some weeds serve to protect the plant from disease while others give supplemental information. During the cultivation time, it is vital to communicate with the plant, at least once during its own growth period, and it is desirable to approach it and touch it during a full moon. Anastasia maintained that the fruit cultivated from the seed in this manner and consumed by individuals who cultivate it is capable not only of cu curing him of any disease of the flesh whatsoever, but also of significantly retarding the aging process, rescuing him from harmful habits, tremendously increasing his mental abilities, and giving him a sense of inner peace. The fruit will have the most effective influence when consumed, no later than three days after harvesting. The above-mentioned steps should be taken with a variety of plant species in the garden plot. It is not necessary to plant a whole row of cucumber, tomatoes, etc. in this manner. Just a few plants each is enough. The fruit of plants grown like this will be distinguished from other plants of the same species, not only in taste. If analyzed, it will be seen that they are also distinct in terms of substances they contain. When planting the seedlings, it is important to soften the dirt in the excavating hole with one's finger and bare toes. And spit into the hole. Res responding to my question, why the feet? Anastasia explained that through a perspiration from one's feet comes substances, toxins, no doubt, containing information about bodily diseases. This information is taken in by the seedlings. They transmit it to the fruit, which will thus be enabled to counteract disease. Anastasia recommended walking around the plot barefoot from time to time. What kind of plants should one cultivate? Anastasia replied. The same variety that exists in most garden plots is quite sufficient. Raspberries, currants, gooseberries, cucumbers, tomatoes, wild strawberries, any kind of apple tree, sweet or sour cherries, flowers would be very good too. It does not make any difference how many plants of each kind there are or how big their area of cultivation is. There are a few defi definites, 
without which it would be difficult to imagine a full energy microchyme, and one of them is sunflowers, at least one plant, there should also be one and a half or two meters of cereal grains, rye or wheat, for example, and be sure to leave an island of at least two square meters for wild growing herbs, one that are not planted manually. If you have not left any of them growing around your dad, you can bring in some turf from the forest and thereby create an island of natural growth. I asked Anastasia if, if, if it was necessary to plant these definites directly in the plot, if there were already some wild growing herbs close by, say just beyond the fence, and this is how she responded. It's not just the variety of plants that is significant, but also how they are planted, the direct communication with them that allows them to take on the information they need. I have already told you about one of the methods of planting. That's the basic one. The important thing is to infuse the little patch of nature surrounding you with information about yourself. Only then will the healing effect and the life-giving support of your body be sufficiently higher than from the fruit alone. On the natural wilds, as you called them, the nature really is not wild. It isn't just unfamiliar to you. There are a great many plants that can help us cure all, and I mean all, existing diseases. These plants can be designed for that purpose, but man has lost or almost lost the ability to identify them. I told Anastasia that we already have many spe specialized pharmacies which deal in healing herbs, just as there are many physicians and medicine men who make a profession out of the herb treatments, and she replied, The chief physician is your own body. Right from the start, it was endowed with the ability to know which herb should be used and when. How to eat and breathe, it is capable of warding off disease even before its outward manifestation. And nobody else can replace your body, for this is your personal physician, given individually to you by God and personally only to you. I am telling you how to provide in that when with the opportunity to act beneficially on your behalf. If you make connections with the plants in your garden plot, they will take care of you and cure you. They will make the right diagnosis all by themselves and prepare the most effective medicine, especially designed for you. Who gets stung by bees? In every garden plot, there should be lots, be at least one colony of bees. I told Anastasia, there are very few people in our society who can communicate with bees. Special training is required, and not everyone is successful. But she replied, A lot of what you do to maintain bee colonies just gets in the way. Over the past centuries, there have been only two people on Earth who have come close to understanding this unique life form. And who might they be? They are two monks who have since been canonized. You can read about them in your books. They can be found in many monastery archives. Oh, come on now, Anastasia. You read church literature too? Where... When you don't even have a single book, I have at my disposal a much more complete method of retrieving information. What kind of method, again, you're talking in circles? After all, you promised me you wouldn't resort to any mysticism or fantasy. I shall tell you all about it. I shall even try teaching it to you. You will not understand it right away, but it is simple and natural. Well, okay, so how should bees be kept in the garden plot? All you have to do is build the same kind of hive from them they, they would have under natural conditions, and that is it. And after that, the only thing required to do is go to the hive and gather part of the honey wax and other substances they produce that are useful for man. Anastasia, that's not simple at all. Who knows what that natural hive should look like? Now, if you could tell me how to do it myself with the materials, we would have at our disposal, then that might be something feasible. All right, she laughed. Then you will be, then you will have to wait. I need to visualize it. I will have to see what people in today's world might have on hand, as you say. And where should it be placed, so as not to spoil the view, I added. I shall look into that too. She lay down on the grass, as she always did, visualizing her, or rather our, living situation, but this time I began to observe her carefully. As she lay on the grass, her arms were stretched out in different directions with palms upturned. 
Her fingers were partly curled and her, their tips, specifically the tips of the four fingers on each hand, were also positioned so that their soft parts faced upward. Her fingers first began to stir a little, but then stopped. Her eyes were closed. Her body was completely relaxed. Her face, too, appeared relaxed at first, but then a faint shadow of some kind of feeling of sensation moved across it. Later, she explained how seeing at a distance could be practiced by anyone with particularly kind of upbringing. About the beehive, Anastasia had the following to say. You need to make the hive in the shape of a hollow block. You can either take a log with a hole in it and hollow it out to enlarge the cavity or use boards from a deciduous tree to make a long hollow box 120 centimeters long. The board should be no less than 6 centimeters thick and the inside measurements of the cavity at least 40 by 40 centimeters. Triangular tri strips should be inserted into the corners where the inner surface meet to make the cavity somewhat rounded. The strips can be slightly glued in place and the bees themselves will firmly w firm them up afterwards. One end should be fully covered with a board of the same thickness with hinged panel at the other end. For this, the panel needs to be cut in such a way so that it fits neatly into the opening and sealed with grass or some kind of cloth covering the whole bottom. Make a slit or a series of slits to provide access for the bees. Along the bottom edge of one of the sides, approximately one and a half centimeters wide, starting at 30 centimeters from the hinged opening and continuing to the other end. This hive can be set on pilings anywhere in the garden plot, at least 20 to 25 centimeters off the ground with the slits facing south. It is even better, however, to set it up under the roof of a house, then people will not interfere with the bees flying out and will not be bothered by them. In this case, the hive should be aligned horizontally at a 20 to 30 degree angle with the opening at the lower end. The hive could even be installed in the attic, provided there is proper ventilation, or on the rooftop, best of all, through attach it to the south wall of the house, just under the eaves. The only thing is, you need to make sure you have proper access to the hive so you can remove the honeycomb. Otherwise, the hive should stand on a small platform with an overhead canopy to protect it from the sun and can be wrapped with insulation in winter. I remarked to Anastasia that this type of hive could be rather heavy and the platform and canopy might spoil the appearance of the house. What do you do in that case? She looked at me with a little surprise and then explained. The thing is that your beekeepers do not really go about it in the right way. My grandfather told me about this. Beekeepers today have concocted a lot of different ways of constructing a hive, but all of them involve constant human intervention in its operation. They move the honeycomb frames around the hive or move both the hive and bees to a different spot in the winter. And, there, and that is something they should not do. Bees build their honeycombs at a specific distance apart to facilitate both ventilation and define a defense against their enemies. And any human intervention breaks down this system. Instead of spending their time gathering honey and ra raising offspring, the bees are obliged to fix what has been broken. Under natural conditions, bees live in tree hollows and cope with any situation perfectly well on their own. I told you that they should be kept under conditions as close to our natural ones as possible. Their presence is extremely beneficial. They pollinate all the plants much more effectively than other agents, thereby increasing the yields. But you must know this pretty well already. What you may not know is that bees' mouths open up channels to the plants, although which the plants take in supplements formation reflecting by the planets. Information the plants and substance, subsequently human beings require. But bee stings, people, don't you see? How can somebody get a good rest at a dacha if they're constantly afraid of being stung? Bees only sting when people act aggressively towards them. Wave them off, become afraid or irritated inside? Not necessarily at the bees, but just at anyone. The bees feel this and will not tolerate the rays of any dark feelings. Besides, they may attack these parts of the body, which they are channels connecting with some disease 
internal organ or where the protective aura has been torn and so forth. You know that bees are already effectively used to treat the diseases of uh, what they, you call radiculus. But that is far from being the only thing they can do. If I were to tell you about everything, especially showing the evidence you are asking for, you would have to spend not just three days, but many weeks with them. There is a lot written about bees in your world. All I have done is introduce a few corridors, but please believe me, they are extremely important corridors. To establish a colony of bees in a hive like that, that is very easy. Before introducing a swarm of bees into the hive, put in a little chunk of wax and some honey plant. You do not need to put in an, any handmade frames or cells afterwards when they are colonies established on even a few neighboring dasha plots. The bees will multiply all by themselves. Then as they swarm, they will occupy the empty hives. And how should the honey be gathered? Open the panel, break off the hanging honeycomb, and extract the sealed honey and pollen. Only do not be greedy. It is not important. It is important to leave part of it for the bees for the winter. In fact, it is better not to collect any honey at all during the first year. It's a bit of a paradox. I like to read, but I'm very dyslexic. <laughs> I like reading to people, if you can't tell. Uh, hello, morning. Anastasia has adopted her morning routines to the condition of a dasha plot. In the morning, preferably at sunrise, walk out in the garden plot barefoot and approach any plant you like. You can touch them. This does not have to be done in accord with some sort of schedule or ritual to be strictly followed day after day, but simply as one feels moved or so as one desires, but it should be done before washing. Then the plants will sense the fragrance and substance emitted by the body through the pores of the skin during sleep. If it is warm and there is a small grassy patch close by and it would be helpful if there were, lie down there and stretch out for three or four minutes. And if some little bug should happen to crawl into your body during this time, do not chase it away. Many bugs open up pores on the human body and cleanse them. As a rule, they open up the pores through which toxins are expelled and all sorts of internal ailments are brought to the surface, allowing the person to wash them off. If there is any pond of water in the plot, you should immerse yourself in it. If not, then you can pour water over yourself as you stand barefoot close to the plants and seed beds, or even better, between the beds. Or, for example, one morning, alongside the raspberry bushes, the next by the currant bushes. And after washing, you should not try to dry off right away. You should shake off the water drops from your hands, spreading them into the surrounding plants and use your hands to brush off the water from other plants of your body. After this, you can go through the usual procedures of washing and using any conveniences to which you are accustomed. Evening routine. In the evening, before going to bed, it is important to wash your feet using water with the addition of a small qu quantity, a few drops of juice from salt brush or nettles, or the two together, but no soap or shampoo. After washing your feet, pour the water into the seed beds. Then, if necessary, you can still wash your feet with soap. This evening routine is important for two reasons. As the feet perspire, toxins come to the surface, remove internal diseases from the body, and these must be washed away to cleanse the pores. Juices from salt brush or nettles are good at facilitating this process. In pouring the remaining water into the seed beds, you are giving supplemental information to the plants and microorganisms about your current state of well-being. This is very important too. Only after receiving this information can our visible and invisible environment work out and pick up from the universe and the earth everything it needs for the normal function of our body. It will prepare everything by itself. It will. It was still interested in knowing what... Oof, I was still interested in, what in knowing what Anastasia had to say about food. After all, she has a rather unique dietary regime, and so I asked. Anastasia, tell me what you think a person should feed himself. What should he eat, how often during the day, and in what amounts? Our world pays a great deal of attention to this question, 
There is a huge quantity of all sorts of literature on the subject, health, food, recipes, advice on losing weight. It is difficult to picture human beings' lifestyle any other way under the circumstances currently imposed by the technocratic world. The dark forces are constantly trying to take the natural operating system of this world, the one given to humanity right from the start, and substitute their own cumbersome artificial system which goes against human nature. I asked Anastasia to put it in more concrete terms without her philo philosophical musings, and she continued. You know, these questions of yours as to what, when, and how much a person should eat, they are best answered by an individual's own body. The sensation of hunger and thirst are designed to send a signal to each particular individual indicating that he should take in food. This precise moment is the right one for each person. The world of technocracy being incapable of affording each individual the opportunity of satisfying his hunger and thirst at the moment desired by his body has tried to force him into his own schedule based on no nothing but his world's own helplessness and then attempts to justify this compulsion in the name of some sort of efficiency. Just think, one person spends half the day sitting down, expanding, expending hardly any energy, while another exerts himself with some kind of physical labor, or simply runs and perspires all over, thereby using up many times more energy, and yet both are expected to eat at exactly the same time. A person should take in food at the moment advised by his body, and there can be no other advisor. I realize that under your world's conditions, this is particularly impossible, but the opportunity does exist for people at their dashes where their attached garden plots, and they should take advantage of it and forget about their unnatural artificial regime. The same applies to your second question, what should one eat? The answer is whatever is available at the moment, whatever is on hand, so to speak. The body itself will select what it needs. I could offer you a bit of non-traditional advice if you have a household pet. Like a cat or a dog, I have both. Keep track of its movements carefully. Occasionally it will find something in the way of grasses or herbs and eat it. You should tear off a few samples of whatever it selects and add it to your diet. This is not something you have to do every day. Once or twice a week is sufficient. You should take also upon yourself to gather some cereal grain, thresh it, grind it into flour, and then use the flour to bake bread. This is extremely important. Anyone consuming this bread even once or twice a year will build up a store of energy capable of awakening an inner spiritual powers, not only calming his soul, but also exerting a beneficial influence on his physical condition. This bread can be shared with relatives and close friends. If shared with sincerity and love, it will have quite a beneficial influence on them as well. It is very helpful to every individual's health to spend three days at least one each summer eating only what is grown in his garden plot, along with bread, sunflower oil, and just a pinch of salt. I have already described Anastasia's own eating habits. While she was telling me all this, she would unwittle be unwittingly tear off tear off a blade of grass or two, put it in her mouth and chew it, and offer me some too. I decided to give it a try. I can't say the taste was anything to write home about, but neither did it provoke any sense of distaste. It seemed as though Anastasia has left the whole task of nourishment and life support up to nature. She never allows it to inter interrupt her train of thought, which is always busy with some more important issues. Even so, her health is as remarkable as her outward beauty, of which it is an inseparable part. According to Anastasia, anyone who has established such a relationship with the earth and the planet and the plants on his own plot of land has the opportunity of rid ridding his body of absolutely every kind of disease. Disease, per se, is a result of man's distancing himself from the natural system designed to take care of his health and life support. For such systems, a task of counteracting any disease presents no problem whatsoever, since there is their whole reason since there is their whole reason for being. However, the benefit experienced by people who have set up in such information null exchange contact with a little patch of nat natural world go far beyond dealing with diseases. Chapter 12 Sleeping Under the Stars 
I have already mentioned how animated Anastasia became when talking about plants and people who communicate with them. I thought that living in nature as she did, she might have studied nature alone. But she also possesses information about planetary relationships. She literally feels the celestial bodies. See for yourself what she has to say about sleeping under the stars. Once plants have received information about the specific person, they embark upon an information exchange from cosmic forces. But here they are simply intermediaries carrying out a narrowly focused task involving one's fleshy body and certain emotional planes. They never touch the complex process which, out of all animal and plant world in the planet, are inherent only in the human brain and on human planes of existence. Nevertheless, this information exchange they establish allow men to do what he alone can do, namely interact with the intelligence of the universe, or more precisely, to exchange information with his intelligence. With this intelligence, an altogether simple procedure permits him not only to do this, but also to feel the beneficial effect of such interaction. Anastasia described this procedure as follows. Pick an evening when weather conditions are favorable and are arranged to spend the night under the stars. You should situate your sleeping place close to raspberry or currant bushes or to beds where cereal seeds have been planted. You should be there alone as, a li as, as you lie with your face to the stars. Do not close your eyes right away. Let your gaze physically and mentally wander across the celestial bodies. Do not become tense while thinking about them. Your thought must be free and unencumbered. First, try to think about those celestial bodies which are visible to your eye. Then you can dream about what, the tr what you treasure in life, about the people closest to you, people for whom you wish only good. Do not attempt to even think at this point about seeking revenge or wishing evil upon anyone, for th that might have a negative effect on you. This uncomplicated procedure will awaken some of the many living cells, little cells dormant in your brain, the vast majority of which never wake even once during a person's whole lifetime. The cosmic forces will be with you and help you attain the realization of your brightest and most unimaginable dreams will help you find peace in your heart, establish positive relationships with your loved ones, and increase or call into being their love for you. It is useful to try repeating the procedure a number of times. It is effective only when carried out of the location of your constant contact with the plant world, and you will feel it yourself as early as the next morning. It is especially important to go through this procedure in the eve of your birthday. To explain how all this works would take too long right now, and it's not important. Parts of the explanation you would not believe, other parts you would not understand. It can be discussed much more quickly and easily with people who are already trying it and feeling its influence on themselves, since the information once received and verified will facilitate the reception of any information that follows. Chapter 13. A Helper and Mentor for Your Child In asking Anastasia how a plot of ground with seed planting, even planting carried out in a special manner, she described and maintaining close contact with man could facilitate the right raising of children. I expected to hear an answer something like children need to be imbued with the love of nature. However, I was wrong. What she actually said was amazing both in its simplicity of argument and in the depth of its philosophical implications. Nature and the mind of the universe have seen to it that every man is born sovereign, a king. He is like an angel, pure and undefi undefiled. Through the still soft upper part of the, his head, he takes in a huge flood of information from the universe. The abilities inherent in each newborn child are such as to allow him to become the wisest creature in the universe, godlike. It takes him very little time to bestow grace and happiness upon his parents. During this period, amounting to no more than nine earth years, he becomes aware of what constitutes creation and the meaning of human existence. And everything that he needs to accomplish this already exists. Only the parents should not distort the, the genuine natural structure of creation by cutting the child off from most perfect works of the universe. 
The world of technocracy, however, does not allow parents to do the right thing. What does an infant see with his first conscious glance around? He sees the ceiling, the edge of his crib, some patches of fabric, the walls, all attributes and values of the artificial world created by a technocratic society, and in this world he finds his mother and her breasts. This must be the way things are, he concluded. His smiling parents offer him toys and other objects that rattle and squeak, as though they were priceless treasures. Why? He will spend a long time trying to make sense of this rattling and squeaking. He will try to comprehend them both through the, his conscious mind and his subconscious. And then the same smiling parents will try wrapping him up in some kind of fabric, which he finds most uncomfortable. He will make attempts to free himself, but in vain. And the only means of protest he has at his disposal is a cry. A cry of protest and appeal for help. A cry of rebellion. And from that moment on this angle and sovereign on this angel and sovereign becomes an indigent slave begging for handouts. One after another the child is presented with accoutrements of an artificial world. He is rewarded for his acceptance by some new toy or item of clothing. And along with this, the thought is drumming into him that these are the dominant objects in the world where he has arrived. Still in his infancy, despite his status as the most perfect being in the universe, he is pandered to and treated as an imperfect creature, even in those institutions you consider educational, where again, he is constantly reminded of the values of this artificial world. Not until the age of nine does he hear a passing mention of the existence of a world of nature, and then only as an adjunct to that other, more important world of manufactured objects, that most people are never afforded the opportunity to become aware of the truth, even in the end of days. Even in the end of their days. And so it seems as though the simple question, what is the meaning of life, goes unanswered. The meaning of life, that is to be found in truth, joy, and love, a nine-year-old child brought up in the natural world has far more accurate perception of creation than all the scientific institutions of your world, or indeed, many of your prominent scholars. Stop, Anastasia. You probably have a mind of knowledge of nature, assuming his life proceedings along the same lines as yours. Here I can agree with you, but think, today's man is obliged, rightly or wrongly, that is another question but he is obliged to live specifically in our technocratic world, as you call it. Someone brought, up as, someone brought up as you propose will certainly know nature and have a feeling for it, but in everything else, he will be an utter ignor ignoramus. Besides, there are some science like mathematics, physics, chemistry, or simply just knowing about life and its social manifestations. For someone who has learnt at the right time about what constitutes creation, those things are mere trifles. If he wants or considers it necessary to prove himself in some scientific field, he will easily surpass all others. How could that happen so quickly? Man in the world of technocracy has never yet invented anything that is not already present in nature. Even the most perfect manufactured devices are but a poor imitation of what exists in nature. Well, they, they might be, but you promised to explain how a child could be raised and his capabilities developed in our condition. Only talk about this in a way I can understand, using concrete examples. I shall try to be more concrete, replied Anastasia. I have already visualized situations like this and have tried to hint to one family that they should do what they should do, only where only there was no way they could get, have grasped the crucial point and ask their child the proper questions. These parents turned out to have an unusual, pure, talented child who could have brought tremendous benefit to people living on Earth. So, these parents arrived with this three-year-old child at their Dasha plot and bring along his favorite toys, artificial toys which displace the true priorities of the universe. Oh, if only they had not done that. Just think, the child could have been occupied and entertained with something far more interesting than senseless and even harmful interactions with manufactured objects. 
First of all, you should ask him to help you, only to ask him in all seriousness without any pandering, especially since he will actually be able to offer you assistance. If you do any planting, for example, ask him to hold the seeds in preparation for sowing, or rake out the seed beds, or have him put a seed into the hole you have prepared, and in the process talk to him about what you are doing, something like this. We will be putting the child's seed into the ground and covering it with earth. When the sun is in the sky and it shines warm, the earth, the little seed, will get warm and start to grow. It will want to see the sun, and a little shoot will poke its head out of the earth, just like this one. At this point, you can show him some little blades of grass. If the seed likes the sunshine, it will grow bigger and bigger, and maybe turn into a tree or something smaller like a flower. And I want it to bring, the, and I want it to bring you tasty fruit, and you will eat it if you like it. The little shoot will prepare its fruit for you. Whatever you arrive, when you whenever you arrive with your child at the Dasha plot, or when he awakes first thing in the morning, have him look and see whether any new shoots have come up. If you should notice one, show your delight. Even when you are putting younger plants rather than seeds into the ground, it is important to explain to your child what you are doing. If you are planting tomato seedlings, for example, let him handle you the stalks one by one. If a stalk should inadvertently break, take the stalk, take the broken stalk into your hand and say, I do not think this one will li live or bear fruit since it is broken, but let us try planting it anyway and plant at least one of the broken ones along, right along the others. A few days later, when you visit the seed bed again with your child and the stalks have firmed up, point out the broken withering stalk to your little one and remind him that it was broken during the planting, but do not use any preaching tone of voice in doing so. You need to talk with him as an equal. You should hear in, you should bear in mind the thought that he is superior to you in some res respect. In the purity of his thought, for example, he is an angel. If you succeed to understanding that, you can then proceed intuitively, and your child will indeed become a person who will happily, who will happify your days. Sorry, guys, it's really strange writing. Whenever you sleep under the stars, take your child with you, lay him down beside you, let him look at the stars, but under no circumstances tell him the names of the planets or how you perceive that origin and function since this is something you do not really know yourself, and the theory stored in your brain will only lead the child astray from the truth. His subconscious knows the truth, and it will penetrate his consciousness all by itself. All you need to do is to tell him that what that you like looking at the shining stars, and ask your child which star he likes best of all. In general, it is important to know how to ask your child questions. The next year, you can offer your child his own seed bed, fix it up, and give him the freedom to do whatever he likes with it. Do not ever compel him by force to do anything with it, and do not correct what he has done. You can simply ask him what he likes. You can offer him help, but only after asking his permission to work along with him. When you are planting cereal grains, have him throw some grains on the seed bed for you. Okay, I remarked to Anastasia, still not fully convinced. Maybe a child like this will show interest in the plant world, and maybe he'll become a good agronomist. But there he, where is he going to get knowledge from in other areas? What do you mean, where from? It's not just a matter of having knowledge and feeling about what grows and how. The main thing is that the child is starting to think, analyze. The cells are awakening in his brain, which will operate throughout his life. They will make him brighter and more talented compared to those whose corresponding cells are still dom dormant. As far as civilized life goes, what you call progress, he may well turn out to be superior in any field of endeavor. All the more so since the purity of his thoughts will make him an exceptionally happy person. The contact he has established with this planet will allow him to constantly take in and exchange more and more information. The incoming message will be received by his subconscious and transmitted to his consciousness in and from of many new thoughts and discoveries. Outwardly, he will look like everyone else, but inwardly, this is a kind of man you call a genius. Chapter 14, Forest School 
Tell me, Anastasia, is this the way your parents brought you up? She responded after a brief pause, during which I gathered she was recollecting her childhood. I remember particularly nothing of my papa or mamma in the flesh. I was brought up by my grandfather and great-grandfather pretty much as I have explained to you. But you see, I myself had a good feeling very early on for nature and the animal world around me. Perhaps I was not aware of all the detail of how it operated, but that is not the important thing when one has a feeling for it. Grandfather and great-grandfather would approach me from time to time and ask questions and expect me to answer them. In our culture, older generations treat an infant of young child virtually as a deity and use a child's responses as a check on their own purity. I began asking Anastasia to recall some specific questions and answers. She smiled and told me. Once I was playing with a little snake, I turned around and there were grandfather and great-grandfather standing right beside me, smiling. I was very delighted, since it was always interesting being with them. They are the ones who can ask me questions, and their hearts beat in the same rhythm as mine. But with animals, it is different. I ran over to them. Great-grandfather bowed to me, while gra grandfather took me on his knees. I listened to his heartbeat, and I fingered the hairs on his beard as I examined them. Nobody spoke. We were thinking together and it was good that way. Then Grandfather asked me, Tell me, Anastasia, why do you think my hair grows here and here, pointing to the top of his head and his beard, and not here, pointing to his nose and forehead? I touched his nose and forehead, but no re reply was forthcoming. I could not give an unthinking answer. I had to understand it. The next time they came, Grandfather again said, Well, I am still thinking why my hair grows here and not here, again indicating his nose and forehead. Great-grandfather looked at me seriously and attentively. Then I thought, perhaps it is really a serious question with him, and I asked, Grandfather, what is it? Do you really want your hair to grow everywhere, even on your nose and forehead? Great-grandfather began pondering the question, while Grandfather replied, No, not really. Then... That is why your hair does not grow there, because you do not want it to. He reflected on that, stroking his beard and mused, as though he was, he were putting the question to himself. And if it grows here, that means it is because I want it to. I confirmed his thoughts. Of course, Grandfather, not only you, but I and the one who thought you up. At this point, Great Grandfather asked me rather excitedly, and who was it that thought him up? The one who thought everything up, I replied. But where is he? Show me, great-grandfather asked, bowing to me. I could not give him an, an answer right away, but the question stayed with him. Sorry, the question stayed with me, and I started thinking about it often. And did you eventually give him an answer? I asked Anastasia. I gave him an answer about a year later, and then he started asking me more questions. But up until the time I gave the answer, neither grandfather nor great-grandfather had asked me, any new questions, and I began to get very concerned. Okay, I'll do another chapter. Chapter 15, Attentiveness out to Mine. Oh my gosh, I can't read. Chapter 15, Attentiveness to Man. I asked Anastasia, who taught her to speak and converse if she had almost no memory of her mother and father, and her grandfather and great-grandfather talked with her only rarely. The answers she gave were quite a shock to me and required interpretation by specialists, and so I shall try to reproduce them as fully as I can. Their meanings as gradually began to sink in for me. She responded to my first question with a question of her own. Do you mean the ability to speak in different people's language? How do you mean different? What... What, you can speak more than one language? Yes, she replied, including German, French, English, Japanese, Chinese? Yes, she repeated, and then added, You can see I speak your language. You mean Russian? <clears throat> well, that's too general. I speak, or at least try to speak, using words and phrases you yourself use when you talk. At first it was a little challenging for me, since your vocabulary, vocabulary is not very large, and you repeat yourself in a fair amount. Nor do you have much expression or feeling... That is not the kind of language which easily lends itself to accurately saying everything one wishes to say. 
Wait, Anastasia, I'm going to ask you something in a foreign language, and you give me an answer. I said hello in her English, and then in French. She answered me right off. Unfortunately, I myself had not mastered any foreign languages in school. I studied German, but with rather poor marks. I did remember one whole sentence in German, which my classmates and I learned by rote. By rote. Okay. I recited it to Anastasia, which I'm not going to recite because I don't know how to say it. <laughs> she extended her hand to me and answered in German. I give you my hand. Amazed by what I had heard and still not believing my ears, I asked. So then, any person can be taught any language. I had an intuitive feeling that there must be some kind of simple explanation for this extraordinary phenomenon, and I had to know what it was so I could tell others about it. <laughs> Anastasia, perhaps you could explain this in my language and try to do it with examples so that I can understand. I asked somewhat excitedly. All right, all right, only calm down and let go, or you will not understand, but let me first teach you to write in Russian. I know how to write. You will tell me about teaching foreign languages. I do not mean just handwriting. I shall teach you to be a writer, a very talented writer. You shall write a book. That's impossible. Is it possible? It is quite poss simple and quite possible. Anastasia took a stick and outlined on the ground the whole Russian alphabet, along with punctuation marks, and asked me how many letters there were. Thirty-three, I replied. You see, that is a very small number of letters. Can you call what I have outlined a book? No, I answered. It's just an order, ordinary alphabet. That's all. Ordinary letters. Yet all the books in the Russian language are made up of these ordinary letters, Anastasia observed. Do you not agree? Do you not see how simple it all is? Yes, but in books, they're, they're arranged differently. Co correct, all books consist of a multitude of combinations of these letters. People arrange them in the pages automatically guided by their feelings. And from this, it follows that book originates not from a combination of letters and sounds, but from feelings outlined by people's imagination. The result is that the readers are aroused by approximately the same feeling as the writers, and such feelings can be recalled for a long time. Can you re recollect any images or situations from books you have read? Yes, I can, I replied, after a moment's thought. For some reason, I recall Lermontov's Hero of Our Time, and began to tell the story to Anastasia. She interrupted me. You see, you can still depict the character from this book, and tell me why they felt, and tell me what they felt, even though quite a bit of time has gone by since you read it. But if I were to ask you to tell me in what sequence the 33 year letters mm, of the Russian alphabet were set forth in that book? What combinations they were arranged in? Could you do that? No, that would be impossible. Indeed, it would be very difficult. So feelings have been conveyed from one man to another with the help of all sorts of combinations of these 33 letters. You look at these combinations of letters and forget them right off, but the feelings and images remain to be remembered for a long time. So it turns out that if emotional feelings are directly associated with these marks on paper, without thinking about any convictions, one soul will cause these marks to appear in just the right sequence and combinations so that any reader may subsequently feel the soul of the writer, and if the soul of... and if in the soul of the writer. Wait, Anastasia, speak more simply, more clearly, more specifically. Show me through some kind of an example how languages are to be taught. You can make me into a writer later on. Tell me first who taught you to understand different languages and how. My great-grandfather, replied Anastasia. Give me an example, I asked, anxious to understand everything in a hurry. All right, but do not be concerned. I shall still find a way to help you understand, and if it is that important to you, I shall try teaching you all the languages. It is simple, after all. For us, it is quite incredible, Anastasia, so do try and explain, and tell me how much time will take to teach me. She thought for a moment and looked at me and said, The memory is not very good. Your memory is not very good. And then there are your domestic problems. You will need a lot of time. How long I was impatient for an answer. 
for everyday comprehension of phrases such as hello and goodbye, I would say it will take at least four months, possibly six, she replied. Enough, Anastasia. Tell me how your great-grandfather did it. He played with me. How did he play? Tell me. Calm down. Let go. I cannot understand why you are so impatient. And then she quietly went on. Great-grandfather played with me, as though we were joking with me. Whenever he came to tell me, whenever he came to me all by himself, without grandfather, he would always approach me, bow at the waist, and hold out his hand to me, and I would hold out mine to him. He would first shake my hand, then go down on one knee, kiss my hand, and say, Hello, Anastasia. One time he came, he did everything as usual. His eyes looked at me tenderly as usual, but his lips were saying some kind of abracadabra. I looked at him in surprise, and he said something else, equally unintelligible. I could not take it any longer, and asked, Grandpakins, have you forgotten what to say? Yes, I have, great-grandfather answered. Then he stepped away from me for a few paces, stopped to think about something, and then came over again, extended his hand to me, and I held out mine. To him he dropped on one knee and kissed my hand. His look was gentle, his lips were moving, but no sound was coming out. I was every bit afraid. Then I decided to remind. Then I decided a reminder might help. Hello, Anastasia, I hinted. Correct, great-grandfather confirmed with a smile. At that point, I realized it was a game. He and I would often play games together. After that, at first it was quite simple, but then the game became more complicated and more fascinating. It is a game that begins when one is three years old and goes on until age of eleven. When one undergoes a kind of test, this involves looking attentively at the person who you are talking with and being able to understand what they are saying, no matter what language they are expressing it in. This kind of dialogue is far superior to speech. It is more rapid and conveys far more information. You would call it thought transfer. You think it is abnormal, something out of a, a fantasy, but it is simply an attentive attitude toward man. Drawing upon a developed imagination and a good memory, it involves not just a more efficient method of information exchange, but getting to know a person's soul along with the animal and plant world and what continues creation as a whole. Anastasia, I said, what do plants growing in the garden plot have to do with this? What is their role in all this? What do you mean? What have they to do with it? At the same time as the child is getting to know the world of plants as part of the functioning of the universe, he is also entering into contact with these plants. With their help and the help of his parents, he quickly, very quickly gets to know the truth and develops intensively in his fields of psychology, philosophy, and the natural sciences. Your discipline, your disciplines. But if the game goes on and, and, the, and some kind of man-made object from the artificial world is used as an example, the child will become lost. He will not receive any assistance from the powers of nature or the universe. I have already noted, Anastasia, that in the final analysis, such as a child could become a, an agron, agronomist. Now, where would this knowledge come from in other areas? But Anastasia maintained that a man raised in such a manner would show an aptitude for quick learning in any or of our scholarly disciplines. Any of our scholarly disciplines. Okay. Stopping there. Chapter 16 flying saucers, nothing extraordinary. Then I asked her to show me examples of her knowledge of some technological subject. You want me to tell you how all different machines of your world operate? The kind of thing that pr our prominent scientists are only touching the fringes of? Why don't you make some great scientific discovery, let's say? That's what I have been doing for the whole time you have been here. Not just for me, for the world of science, to a discovery, they would be prepared to recognize, go ahead, make a verifiable discovery and in some technical field, like spaceships, the atoms, automobile fuel, since you have it, it's, it's so simple, you say. In comparison with what I have just shown you, those fields you mention are something like, we used a term from your language, the Stone Age. 
That's perfect. Something you consider primitive, but at least I'll be able to understand it. You can prove you're right and show evidence that your intelligence is su superior to mine. Tell me, for example, what you think of our aeroplanes and spaceships? Pretty close to perfect machines, eh? No. They are altogether primitive. They only serve to show how primitive the technocratic path of development is. That mark... That remark put me on my guard, since I realized that either her conclusions were those of a madwoman, or she really knew for far more than someone with an ordinary conscience could ever imagine. I continued my questioning. What do you mean, when you say our rockets and pla planes are primitive? Anastasia responded with a brief pause, as though allowing time for her words to sink in. The functioning of your machines, every single one of them, is based on the energy of explosion. Not knowing any more efficient natural source of energy, you resort to such primitive awkward substitutes with incredible stubbornness, and even the destructive consequences of their use do not stop you. The range of your airplanes and rockets is simply laughable. According to the scale of the universe, they rise a wee bit above the earth, and now this method has practically reached its ceiling. Do you not agree? But that is ridiculous. An exploding or burning substance propels some monstrous structure that you call a spaceship, and the greater part of the ship is designed precisely to solve this problem of propulsion, and what might be an alternative principle of movement through the atmosphere. A flying saucer might be a good example, Anastasia responded. What? You know about flying saucers and their propulsion systems? Of course I know. It's a very simple and rational. I felt my throat go dry and tried to hurry her up. Tell me, Anastasia, quickly, and in a way I can understand. All right, only do not get excited. It'll be harder to understand when you are excited. The propulsion principle of a flying saucer is based on the energy of a gen generating vacuum. How so? Be more precise. You have a limited vocabulary. Ugh. <laughs> so do I. You have a limited vocabulary, yet I am compelled to restrict myself to it so that you can understand me. Well, I'll add to it. I blurted out in an agitation. I'll add words like, um, can't read those, and I began to quickly name all the words that just popped into my head, and in that moment, and even uh, let out a few swear words. Anastasia broke in. You need not bother. I already know all the words you can express yourself with, but there are still others, and besides that, there is a whole different method of conveying information. If I use that, I could explain everything to you in a minute. As things stand now, it may take an hour or two. This is a lot, and I really wanted to tell you about something else, something much more meaningful. No, Anastasia, tell me about the flying saucers and their propulsion methods. Tell me about energy carriers until I understand that I shan't listen to anything else. All right, she, um, she responded and then went on. An explosion occurs when a solid substance quickly changes under a definable influence into gaseous form, or when the course of a reaction to gaseous substance evolves into something even lighter. Every one, of course, understands this part. Yes, I replied. If powdered, it ignites, it becomes smoke and liquid. Fuel becomes gas. Yes, more or less, but if you're, you and your people had purer thoughts and constantly a knowledge of the functioning of nature, you would then have long ago become aware that if there is a substance capable of instant expansion and through explosion transformation into another state, the opposite process must also hold true. In nature, there are living microorganisms that transform gaseous substances into solids. All plants do this, in fact, only at varying speeds and with varying degrees of firmness and solidity of the resulting substance. Take a look around you and you'll see that plants take in liquid from the earth and breathing air, and then process these into hard and solid body. Let us say, wood or something even harder and more solid like a nutshell or a palm stone. Microorganism, microorganisms smaller than the eye can see does this with fantastic speed, feeding it would seem on air alone. It is this same kind of microorganism that powers flying saucers. They are like the microcells in the brain, only their operation has a very narrow focus. Their sole function is propulsion, but they carry out the function to perfection, and they can accelerate a flying saucer to one-nineteenth the speed of the average modern Earth-dweller's thought.
These microorganisms are located in the inner surface of the upper part of the flying saucer. The positions between its double walls, which are approximately three centimeters apart. The upper and lower surface of the outer walls are porous with micro-sized pinholes. The microorganisms draw in air through these pinholes, thereby creating a vacuum ahead of the saucer. The streams of the air begin to congeal even before contact with the saucer, and as they pass through the microorganisms, they are transformed into tiny spheres. Then these spheres are enlarged even more to approximately half a center in diameter. They lose their firmness and slide down between the walls into the lower part of the saucer, where they again decompose into gaseous substances. You can even eat them if you can do that this before they decompose. What about the walls of a flying saucer? What are they made of? They are cultured, grown. How so? Why the surprise? Just give a little thought. You'll figure it out. Many people cultivate a fungus in various kinds of containers. The fungus imbues the water in which it is placed with pleasant, slightly acidic flavors and take the shape of the container. This fungus is very similar to flying saucers. It creates double walls around itself. If another microorganism is added to its water, it produces a congealment. But this so-called microorganism can be produced or rather generated by the power of the will or the brain, much like a vivid concept of imagery. Can you do this? I asked. Yes, but I don't have a sufficient power of my own. The action of several dozen people having the same ability is required and it takes about a year all told. And can one find on our earth everything necessary to make or grow, as you say, such a flying saucer and microorganisms? Of course they can. The earth has everything that the universe has, but how do you get the microorganisms inside the walls of the saucer if they are so small they can't even see them? Once the upper wall is cultivated, it will attract and collect them into huge numbers, just as bees are attracted to cells. But this process also requires a collective will of several dozen people. In any case, what is the use of uh, elaborating further if you cannot cultivate it for lack of people with the right kind of will, intelligence, and knowledge? Is there some way you could help? I could. So do it. I have already. What have you done? I was still perplexed. I told you about children, how children should be raised, and I can tell you more. You must tell this to others. Many will understand, and their children raised in this manner will have the intelligence, knowledge, will permit them to, ooh, and will permit them, sorry, it's strange, to make them not only, uh, okay, I'm going to try again. Many will understand, and their children raised in this manner will have the intelligence, knowledge, and will permitting them to make not only a primitive flying saucer, but significantly more. Anastasia, how do you know so much about flying saucers? Does that come through the communication with plants? They have landed here, and I, well, I help the occupants repair their ship, as they are much smarter than us. Not at all. They, they have a long way to go to attain the level of man. They are afraid of us, afraid of... Uh, uh, Okay, so Vladimir asks, are they much smarter than us? And she says, not at all. They have a long way to go to attain the level of man. They are afraid of us, afraid to approach people, even though they are very curious. At first they, are they were afraid of me. They trained their mental paralysis on me, but on quite a sh put on quite a show. They tried to frighten me, shock me. It was quite a challenge to calm them down and convince them that I would only treat them with affection. Well, how can they be uh, less smart than us if they can do things like that? Man can't do yet. What is so surprising about that? Bees, too, make incredible structures out of natural materials, including whole ventilations and heating systems. But that does not mean they are superior to man in intelligence. In the universe, there is no one and nothing stronger than man except God. Chapter 17 The Brain, a Supercomputer the possibility of building a flying saucer greatly interested me. If one exa examines the principles of propulsion just as a hypothesis, it is still a new one. Flying saucers, however, is a complex machine and is not a high priority item for us earthlings. 
For that reason, I wanted to hear something that would be understandably right away. Understandable right away. I wanted, I wanted uh, something that would not require any investigation of scholarly minds, but could be immediately put into practice in our daily lives and benefit everyone. I began asking Anastasia to come up with a solution to a question that our society was being conformed with today. Confronted with today, she agreed, but asked, could you at least put it in more specific terms, this question? How can I solve something when I do not know what you have in mind? I began thinking, what was the number one problem we focused today? The following terms came to mind. You know, Anastasia, our major cities right now are confronted with the most acute problem, environmental pollution. The air in their, their, these cities is, is so bad, it's hard to breathe. But you're, you yourself are the ones polluting it. We realize that. Please, hear me out. Don't, only don't go philosophizing about how we must be pure ourselves, have more trees around and so forth. Just take things as they are today and think of something, for example, how to reduce the pollution in our major cities by 50% without causing, costing the treasury, the government that is, any extra money, and make it so that your plane will be the most logical of all possible alternatives and that it will be capable of instant implementation so that I and everyone else cannot fail to understand it. I shall at once, Anastasia replied. Have you specified all the terms? I thought I should try and make it even more complex, just in case her mind and abilities really turned out to be truly superior to what our own powers of reasoning allowed. So I added, and make whenever you think up to be profit generating for whom? For me, and for the country, too. You live within the borders of Russia, so make the whole of Russia. Are we talking about money? Yes. An enormous amount of money? Profit, Anastasia, well, money is never an enormous amount, but I had enough money to be able to pay for this expedition, and have enough left over for a new one. And as for Russia? I thought for a moment. I thought, what if Anastasia were even a little interested in the material benefits of our civilization? And then asked, you wouldn't want anything for yourself. I have everything, she replied. But all at once an idea came to me, something that might possibly interest her. How about this, Anastasia? Let's have you plan, make enough money to provide free seeds, or at least seeds, at a discount to all your beloved Dashniks or governors throughout Russia. Or gardeners, sorry, governors. Um, Terrific, Anastasia exclaimed. What a wonderful idea. If you have finished, I shall now get to work. How delightful that sounds. Seeds. Or is there anything else you wish to add? It's not just seeds at a discount in Russia now. It's also land. One hectare of land uh, Putin is given to all their people who want that. And a lot do. Okay. Or is there anything else you wish to add? No, Anastasia, that's enough for now. I felt her inspiration and excitement not only over the task itself, but especially over the free seeds for her dashniks. Yet, I still felt convinced that even with her special abilities, the solution to the problem of air pollution was simply not of the question else, or many scientific institutions would have come up with one long ago. With the bustle of energy this time, not her usual calm and quiet self, Anastasia lay down on the grass, her arms widespread, her curled fingers reached their cushioned tips upward, alternating between motion and stillness, while her eyelids trembled on her closed eyes. She lay there for about twenty minutes, then opened her eyes at, up and said, I have determined the nature of the problem, but what a nightmare it is. What have you determined, and what is this nightmare ab about? The greatest harm is coming from your so-called automobiles. There are so many of them in the large cities, and every one of them is admitting both an unpleasant odor and sub substance harmful to human bodies. The most frightening thing is that these substances are mixing with the earth of dust particles and impregnating the dust. The movement of the automobiles picks up and impregnates the dust, the impregnated dust, and people are breathing it in this horrible mess. It gets swept into the air and then settles on the grass and the trees, covering everything around. This is very bad. It is very harmful to the health and body of people and plants. 
Of course it's bad. Everyone knows it's bad. Only nobody can do anything about it. We have street cleaning machines, but they can't keep up. You, Anastasia, have discovered absolutely nothing new. You haven't thought up any original solution to purify our air. <clears throat> All I did just now was determine the basic source of the danger. Now I shall think about it further and analyze it. I need to concentrate for a long time, perhaps so long as an hour, since I have never dealt with a problem like this before, so that you will not be bored. Do go for a walk in the forest, or you get on with your thinking. I'll find something to do, and Anastasia withdrew into herself. Coming back an hour later, after a walk in the forest, I found her, as it appeared to me, in a state of some discontent, and I said, You see, Anastasia, you and that brain of yours aren't capable of doing anything either. Only, don't worry about it. You've got a lot of scientific inst institutions, sorry, we've got a lot of scientific institutions working on this question. But they, just like you, can only describe the fact that pollution is going on. They haven't been able to do anything about it yet. She answered in a somewhat ap apologetic tone. I have gone on, on over my, I have gone on over my mind. I believe all the possible variants, but I do not see any way of quickly reducing the pollution by 50%. My mind was at once set on the alert she had found some sort of solution after all. So what kind of reduction did you come up with, I asked. She sighed. Not that much. I managed to achieve 35 or 40 percent. What? I couldn't help exclaim. Pretty poor result, huh? asked Anastasia. A lump formed in my throat. I realized she was incapable of lying. Exaggerated or downplaying anything she said. Trying to restrain my excitement, I said. Let's change the terms of the project. Let's say 38 percent. Quick, tell me about what you've come up with. Your automobiles must be equipped with to not only scatter this foul dust, but to collect it as well. How can we do that? Talk faster. Those things sticking out of in front of the automobile, automobile, what are they called? Bumpers, I offered. All right, bumpers. Inside them or below them should be attached a little box with small holes facing up frontwards. There should also be holes in its backside on that air can Oh, so that air can escape. While the automobiles are in motion, air laden with its harmful dust will be drawn in through the front holes, purifying, and then escaping through the back holes, and that air will already have to be 20% less polluted. And what about the remaining 20%? Right now, virtually none of this dust is removed, but with this method, there will be a lot less of it in the air, since it will be collected all over the place every day. I have calculated that in one month, with the help of this little box, it w if they are fitted on all automobiles, the amount of pollution dust will decrease by 40%. Beyond that, there will be no reduction since other factors are at work. What size of boxes and what should they contain? How many holes and what distance from each other? Vladimir, perhaps you would like to, for me personally to attach them to every single automobile. For the first time, I perceived that Anastasia had a sense of humor, and I began to laugh at the thought of her attaching her their little boxes. To all the cars, she laughed, delighted in her cheerful mood, and began whirling her way across the glade. The principle was really very simple. The rest was merely a matter of technology. Already without Anastasia's help, I was beginning to imagine how it could all be. Orders from administrative heads, motor vehicle inspection control, turning in old lift filters for new ones at filing stations, a system of vouchers, and so forth. A, retu a return regulation just like seatbelts. All, all that had been taken back then was one stroke of a pen, and presto, seatbelts in every family car. And here, too, one stroke of the pen, and again, presto, cleaner air. And there would be enough ex com mm. and there would be tough com competition among entrepreneurs for orders to supply the boxes, a good deal of work for the manufacturers planting, and the main thing, of course, cleaner air. Wait, I said, turning once more to Anastasia, who was still whirling around in a boisterous dance. What should be put into those boxes? Into those boxes? Into those boxes. Hmm. You will come up with a little thing. It's very simple. She replied without stopping, and th where is my money going to come from? And to supply seeds for the Dashniks came another question. She stopped. What do you mean, where from? You wanted my idea to be the most rational of all, 
and that is exactly what I have thought up, the most rational solution there can be. It will spread to large cities throughout the world, and for this idea they will pay Russia enough to supply the free seeds and enough to pay you. Only you will receive your payment under certain conditions. I didn't pay attention immediately to her remark about the certain conditions, but began focusing on something else. So, we should patent it? Otherwise, why? who would pay for their own free will? Why would they not pay? They will pay, and I can even set the rates right now. From the production of those boxes, Russia will get 2%, and you will get one hundredth of a percent. What's the what's the good of you setting the rates? You you do have a few strong points, but when it comes to business, you're still a complete ignoramus. Nobody will play, pay all, ugh, Nobody will pay voluntarily even when they are signed agreements. They don't always pay. If only you knew how many there are in the world that don't. Our ad arbitration courts are overloaded. By the way, do you know what arbitration court is? I can guess, but in this case, you, they will pay faithfully. Anyone who does not pay will go bankrupt. Only honest people will profit and prosper. What will make them go bankrupt? Don't tell me you're in the r racket business. What are you imagining now? Think about it. They themselves, or rather circumstances themselves, will overtake any cheaters and make them go bankrupt. And then the thought dawned on me. Given that Anastasia is incapable of lying, and as she said herself, the system inherent in nature do not allow her to make mistakes, it may it means that before starting any conclusions, she must have processed in her brain an enormous amount of information made zillions of mathematical calculations and taken into account a whole mass of psychological characteristics of the people who would be participating in her project. In our terms, she not only solved this most significant difficult question of purifying the air, but also drew up and analyzed a business plan and all that in a roughly an hour and a half. I thought I had still better clarify certain details, and so I asked her. Tell me, Anastasia, you made some sort of calculation in your head figuring out the percentage of pollution reduction and the amount of money to be realized from the sales of your uh, car accessory box filter replacement and so forth. Calculations were made in the greatest detail and not just with the help of the brain. Stop, quiet, let me tell you what I think. Does this mean you could complete ugh, you could compete with our top of the line computers, let's say Japanese or American computers? But that's not very interesting, she replied, adding. That is primitive and somewhat degrading. Competing with a computer that is a tantamount to oh, can I find a good analogy? That is tantamount to hands or feet competing with a prosthesis. And not even with the full prosthesis, but just part of the part of one. Or prosthetic. With the computer, the most vital element is missing, and the most vital element is feeling. I started to argue the opposition, telling how in our world there are people considered very intelligent, respected in society that play play chess with computers. But when this and other arguments still failed to convince her, I started asking her to a, to a de, agree to a, agree to do this for me and other people as proof of the possibilities of the human brain. She finally agreed, and then I made the invitation more specific. So I can officially announce your willingness to take part in the problem-solving contest with the Japanese supercomputer. Why a Japanese? Anastasia countered. Because they are considered to be the best in the world. Well, now, it'll do better if I do it with all of them at once, so you will not have to ask me again to do such a boring thing. Great, I explained, enthusiastically. Let's do it with all of them. Only you have to think up a problem. All right, Anastasia re reluctantly agreed. But for a start, so as not to waste time on thinking up one, let them try solving the problem you put to me earlier and see whether they confirm or refute my hypothesis. If they refute it, let them put forth their own. Let us be judged by life and by other people. Great, Anastasia, good for you. That is most constructive, and how much time do you think should be allowed for them to come up with the solution? I think an hour and a half you took will not be enough for them. Let's give them three months. Three months it shall be. 
and I suggested and judged to be left to anybody who wants to take part. If there are a lot of judges, then no one can influence the outcome of their own ulterior motives. So be it. But I would still like to talk with you about raising children. Anastasia considered the raising of children paramount and would always delight in talking about it. She wasn't particularly excited about my idea of competing with computers. However, I was very happy to have secured her cooperation. Now I want to invite all firms pro producing state-of-the-art computers to join a competition to solve the above-stated problem. I still felt I had to clarify a point or two with Anastasia. And what prize should be offered to the winner? I asked. I do not need anything, she replied. Why did you think just for yourself? Are you so absolutely certain you're going to win? Of course, I am man after all. Well, okay. What can you offer the firm who takes first place after you? Well, I could give them some advice on how to perfect their primitive computers. Then it's settled. Let me see if I want to read the next chapter. Okay, I'll do it. Chapter 18. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The Gospel of John. Upon my request, Anastasia took me to see the ringing cedars which her grandfather or great-grandfather had talked about. It was about very f it was not very far from the glade. The tree, approximately forty meters tall, rose slightly higher than its neighbors, but its principal distinguishing features was the Ural radiating from its glistening crown, similar to the halos around the faces of saints depicted on icons. The Ural was not even, it pulsated, and at its upper tip one could see a thin ray of light beaming into the infinity of the heavens. The spectacle was dazzling and absolutely charming. At Anastasia's suggestion, I pressed the palm of my hands to its trunk. I could hear a ringing or cracking noise com comparable to what one might hear standing under a high-voltage trans transmission line, only more resonant. It was I who happened to discover a way to send its energy back into space, and then have it distribute distributed here on Earth. Anastasia told me, You see how its bark has been torn off in various places? That is where the bears was climbing it. It was quite a challenge to get her to carry me up to the first branch. I clung on the fur of her neck. She would climb and then let out a roar and, and climb. After reaching the lowest branch, I was able to clamber up from branch to branch right on the top. And I sat there for two days and thought of everything I could to save the tree. I stroked the tree and shot it up into the sky, but nothing helped. Then grandfather and great-grandfather arrived, and we imagined the scene. There they were, standing down below, re reprimanding me and demanding that I climb down. I, in turn, demanded that they tell me what could be done with the tree, how to save the ringing cedars. Since nobody was cutting it down, they did not speak. But I felt that they knew the answer. Grandfather's old trickster that he was tried to lure me down, promising, promising to help me establish a connection with a certain woman I had been unable to reach on my own. This was a woman I was very much wanting to help. Earlier, Grandfather would only be annoyed by my desire to spend so much time on her instead of doing other things. But I knew that he could not help me, as Great Grandfather had twice tried to do this behind Grandfather's back, and he failed too. At that point, Grandfather really began putting up a fuss. He seized hold of the branch, ran around the cedar tree, and beat the air with the branch, shouting that I was the most harebrained member of the family, that I was acting illogical, and that I refused to accept sound advice, and that he would give my bottom a good whipping. And again, he beat the air with the branch. Now, that was a real humdinger of a threat, and even Great Grandfather burst out laughing. I, too, gave a hearty laugh. In going so, I invariably broke a branch on the top, and a glow began emanating from it, and I heard great-grandfather's voice seriously commanding and entreating all that at the same time. Don't touch anything more, little one. Come down very carefully. You have already done enough. I obeyed and climbed down. Great-grandfather silently embraced me, trembling all over. He pointed at the tree, on one on which more and more branches were beginning to glow. Then a ray formed, pointing upward. Now the ringing cedars would not burn up. There, through its little ray, it would give everything it had saved up for the past five hundred years on people and to the earth. 
great-grandfather explained that the ray had formed in the exact spot where I had shouted upward, where I had shouted upward and had invariably broken a branch while I was laughing. Great-grandfather said if I had touched the ray emanating from the broken branch, my brain would have exploded, as there was too much energy and, mis and information in this little ray. That was exactly how my papa and mama had perished. Anastasia put her hands on the mighty trunk of the ringing cedar. She had saved and pressed her cheek against it. After pausing for a while, she continued for her story. They, my papa and mama, once came upon a ringing cedar just like this one, only mama had been doing everything a little differently, since she did not know. She had climbed up into a neighboring tree from which she reached out and touched one of the lower branches of the ringing cedar and broke it off, invariably exposing herself to the ray, which flamed up out of the broken branch. The branch had been pointing downward, and the ray went down into the earth. It is very bad, very harmful, when such energy falls into the earth. When Papa came, he saw this ray and saw my mamma, who had been left hanging, one hand still firmly grasping the ordinary cedar branch. In the other hand, she had broken the branch of the ringing cedar. Papa no doubt had an immediate grasp of everything that had happened. He climbed up the ringing cedar right on top. Grandfather and great-grandfather saw him break off the upper branch, but they did not glow. While more and more of the lower ones began glowing, great-grandfather said that Papa realized that it would not be long before he would never be able to climb down. The upward beaming ray, that is pulsating glow, failed to appear. All that was going on was more and more thin rays shining downward. An upward ray did appear when Papa broke off a large branch pointing up. And even though it was not glowing, he bent it and pointed it at himself. When it did flame up, Papa still managed to unclasp his hands and a branch straightened unclasp his hands, the branch straightened, and the ray from the branch directed itself towards the sky, and then the pulsating roll formed. Great-grandfather said that at this m the last moment of his life, Papa's brain was able to take in an enormous flood of energy and information, and that he was able, in some incredible way, to clear his mind of all previous accumulated information, and so was able to gain the times required to unclasp his hands and direct the branch upwards just before his brain exploded. Anastasia once more stroked the cedar trunk with her hands, once more pressing her cheek against it, and stood stock still, smiling, listening to the ringing of the cedar. Anastasia, that cedar nut oil, are its healing properties stronger or weaker than the piece of the ringing cedar? The same, provided the nuts are gathered at the proper time and with the proper attitude towards the cedar, provided the tree bestows them of itself. Do you know how to do that? Yes, I do. Will you tell me? All right, I shall tell you. Chapter 19. The need to change one's oh, the Chapter 19. The need to change one's outlook on the world. I asked Anastasia about the woman over whom she had a disagreement with her grandfather. I asked her why she had been unable to establish a connection with her, and why she thought this con contact was necessary. You see, Anastasia began her story, it's very important when two people join their lives together that they have a spiritual attraction to each other. Unfortunately, everything basically starts with the carnal. For example, you see a beautiful girl and desire to be close to her. You still have not seen the individual, the man, or her soul. Very often, people join the destinies together only on the basis of carnal attraction. Either that quickly passes or it transfers to someone else. What then keeps people together? To find a kindred spirit with whom one can attain true happiness is not all that complicated. Your technocratic world, however, puts up massive interference. The woman I'm trying to reach lives in a large city and regularly travels to the same place each day, probably to her work. Either there or on the way she finds or meets up with a man who is very close to her spirit, one with whom she could be really happy, and most importantly, one with whom she could bear a child capable of bringing so much good into the world. But they would create this child with the same impulsion as we did. Because they would. 
but there is no way this man can bring himself to tell this woman that he loves her, and she herself is partly to blame for this. Just think, he looks into her face and sees, as it were, his heart's desire, the apple of his eye, while she, as soon as he feels something gaze upon her, perks up right away and unwittingly tries to lift her skirt higher, and so on. This man is at once carnally aroused, but he does not know her well, and so he then goes on, goes to someone who is better acquainted with someone he feels more accessible, but still led on by the same carnal desire. I want to suggest to this woman what she should do, but I cannot break through to her. Her brain will not open to, um, to the awareness of new information, even for a second. It is constantly preoccupied with issues of day-to-day -day living. Can you imagine? One time I followed her for a whole 24 hours. What a terrible sight. Grandfather then got upset with me for not working enough with the dashniks and for sp spending, spreading myself too thin and sticking my nose in where it does not belong. When this woman takes in the morning, her first thought is not a to delight in the coming day, but how to prepare something to eat. She gets herself over some missing food items and then gets upset over something you smear on your face in the morning, like face cream or rouge. She spends the whole time thinking how she is going to get it. She is always late and is constantly on the run, trying not to miss first one form of transport and then the next. At a regular destination, her brain is overloaded with how shall I put it, all sorts of nonsense, at least from my point of view. On the other hand, it is supposed to forgive her. It is supposed to give her face a business-like expression and fulfill the job tasks she is assigned. All this while, she is thinking about one of her girlfriends or acquaintances and getting angry at them. At the same time, she is listening to everything going on around her. And can you imagine the same routine is repeated day after day like clockwork? On her way home, when people notice her, she can put the appearance of an almost happy woman, but she's continually thinking about problems of her makeup or looking at clothes and shopping windows, above all clothes that will expose her alluring charm, supposing this will result in some kind of miracle, except in her case, everything happens the wrong way around. She gets home and starts cleaning house. She thinks she is relaxing when she watches the television and prepares her meals, but the main thing is she thinks about good things only for a split second. Even when she goes to bed, she is still mulling over her daily cares and stays in the same mental rut. If only she could turn away from her thoughts even just for a moment during the day and think of, wait, Anastasia, explain specifically how you see her, her outward appearance and clothing. Tell me what she should be thinking about the moment when this man is with her. What should she do with to make him at, at least attempt to f tell her he loves her. Anastasia explained everything in the minutes in the min Ugh. Anastasia explained everything in the minutest detail. I shall only mention here what I consider to be the most important points. Her dress should come to just below the knee. It should be green with a white collar and no cleavage. She should wear hardly any makeup and listen with interest to the person talking to her. And that is, I remarked upon hearing such a simplistic explanation, to which Anastasia remarked. There is so much underlying these simple instructions. In order for her to choose that particular dress, change her makeup, and look at that person with genuine interest, she will have to change her whole outlook on the world. Chapter 20. A Mortal Sin I still need to tell you, Vladimir, about the terms under which you will receive money in the bank when there will be a great deal of money in your accounts. Go ahead, Anastasia, it'll be pleasant experience, I replied. However, I was devastated by what I heard. Judge for yourself, here is what she set forth. In order to withdraw the money from your bank account, you must meet the following conditions first of all. For Three days before receiving it, you must not drink anything alcoholic. When you arrive at the bank, the manager must verify with the help of the device you have your compliance with the condition of the present note and the, and of the presence to not less than two witnesses. If the first condition is met, you may then proceed to carry out the second. You must do not less than nine 
deep knee bends, do no less than nine deep knee bends in front of the bank manager and the two witnesses present. When the significance of, or rather the absurdity of her words finally sunk in, I jumped up and she stood up as well. C I couldn't believe my ears and countered. First, they're going to check my alcohol content and then I am not to do at least, I am to do at least nine deep knee bends like this. Is that it? Yes, responded Anastasia, and for each knee bend, they will be able to release from your account no more than one million of your rubles at your present worth. I was overwhelmed by a sense of rage, anger, annoyance. What did you say for that? What did you say that for? Well, what for? I was feeling so good. I believed you. I was starting to think that you were right about a lot of things, that there was logic in your argument, but you, now I am absolutely convinced that you're a schizophrenic, a stupid hick, a madwoman. This latest thing you said has wiped out everything else. It's completely devoid of any sense of logic. That's not just my opinion. Any sane person would agree with me. Ha! Huh. Don't tell me you still want me to write about these conditions in your book. Yes. Now you've really gone mad. Do you mean to tell me and your planning that you were planning to write out instructions to the bank or publish this order? No, they will read it in the book, and they will act accordingly with you. Otherwise, they can expect to go bankrupt. Oh my God, and I've been listening to this creature three days already. Don't tell me you would like the bank manager to do knee bends with me, too, in the presence of the witnesses. It would be good for him, as it will be for you, but for them I have not set such strict conditions as I have for you. So you're only doing this for my benefit. Do you have the slightest idea what a mockery you've made of me? See what the love of, see what the love of a crazy recluse will sp can spill over into? Only it won't work. Not one single bank will ever agree to serve me under these conditions, no matter how much you have visualized such a situation in your dreams. Well, you can stand here and do all the knee deep knee bends you want, you nincompoop. The banks will agree, and whether you know it or will not, whether you know it or not, will open banks for you. Will open accounts for you. This is weird. Granted, only those banks which are willing to operate ethically, and people will trust them and come to them. Anastasia went on, not budging an inch from her position. I found myself becoming increasingly irritated and angry. Angry with myself or angry at Anastasia. Come on now, think. How long I've listened to her, trying to understand what she is saying. And here she's turned out to be simply half-crazed. I, I started laying into her, using to put it my at least some pretty coarse language. She stood there leaning with her back to a tree, her head just slightly bowed. One hand was clasped to her chest, and the other was raising upward, lightly waving. I recognized that gesture. She used it every time she needed to bring calm to the surrounding natural environment, so I wouldn't get fearful of it, and I realized why she needed to calm them down on this occasion. Every insult or coarse word directed at Anastasia felt like a whip cracking against her flesh, making her whole body tremble. I fell silent. I sat down on the grass, turned away from Anastasia, and decided I better calm down myself and head back to the river bank and not talk with her any more at all. But when I heard her voice call out behind me, I was amazed that it didn't have the slightest hint of resentment or rebuke. You know, Vladimir, everything bad that happens to man is brought on by him, man himself. Whenever he disobeys the laws of spiritual beings and breaks his connection with nature, the forces of darkness try to distract their attention with the instant attraction of your technocratic way of life to make them for forget the simple truths and com commandments set forth way back in the bible and they all too often succeed one of the mortal sins of man is pride the most people are subject to it this sin i shall not at the moment go into all the terrible disastrous effects and produce after you return home and try to make sense of it you will understand either on your own or through the help of enlightened individuals who come to see you for now i shall just say this the forces of darkness which are diametrically opposed to the forces of light are are very at are every moment working to make sure man does not let go of this sin and money is one of the basic tools in this campaign. 
They were the ones that thought up this concept of money. Money is like a high tension zone. The forces of darkness are proud of this invention. They even think themselves stronger than the force of light for having come up with money and for being able to use money to distract people from their true purpose. The great confrontation has lasted for millennia and man is at its center, but I do not want you to be enslaved to this sin. I realize that mere explanation is not enough to settle this question because in spite of thousands of years of explanation, mankind has not understood nor discovered the means of con contracting this sin, counteracting this sin. It is only natural that you would not be able to discover it either, but I really very much want to save you from the mortal danger which can corrupt the spirit. That is why I thought up a special situation just for you, one that would cause this device of the force of darkness to be broken or fail, or even work the opposite way for the extermination of the sin. That is why they have become so enraged. Their anger has been implement, implanted in you, and you are, and you for your part started shouting your insults at me. They wanted to make me angry at you in return, but I will never do that. I realized that what I thought up would hit the mark preci precisely, and now it is clear that their system which has worked flawlessly for thousands of years, can indeed be broken. Right now I have done this only for you, but I shall think up something for other people too. Now what harm is there in drinking less of that alcohol poison, and in becoming less arrogant and stubborn? What were you so upset over? Of course it was pride that was upsetting you. She fell silent, and I thought, Imporable as it is, her brain, or something beside, may have put into this cosmic utter abnormal situation of doing deep knee bends in a bank such as a deep meaningfulness that there really could be some magic in it i'd better think about this a little more calmly all my anger at anastasia passed and in its place arose a feeling of uneasy guilt however instead of apologizing on the spot i simply turned to her with a desire for reconciliation Anastasia, it turned out, felt my innate state. She at once gave joyful shudder all over and began talking at top speed. Chapter 21, Touching Paradise Your brain is tired of listening to me, and yet I still have so much I want to tell you. I do so want to. But you need to rest. Let us sit again for a little while. <clears throat> we sat down on the grass. Anastasia took me by the shoulders and drew me closer to her. The back of my head touched her breast, which gave me pleasant, warm feelings. <clears throat> Do not be afraid of me. Let yourself go, she quietly said, and lay down on the grass so that it would be more comfortable for me to rest. She ran the fingers of one of her hands through my hair, as if combing them, while the fingertips of her other hand quickly touched my forehead and temples. <coughs> Occasionally she would lightly press down with her fingernails at various points at the top of my head. All this gave me a feeling of tranquility and enlightenment. Then putting her hands on my shoulders, Anastasia said, Listen, now, and please tell me what sounds you hear around you. I listened and my hearing caught a wide range of sounds, all different in tonality, rhythm, and continuity. I began naming the sounds aloud, the birds singing in the trees and chirping, and the clicking of insects in the grass. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I have something in the throat. <coughs> the rustle of the leaves, the fluttering and flapping of birds' wings, I named everything I could hear, then fell silent and went on listening. This was pleasant and very interesting for me. You have not named anything, Anastasia observed. Everything, I replied. Well, maybe I left out something. So you've not named everything. Well, maybe I left out uh, something not very significant or something I didn't catch. Not anything important, that is. Vladimir. Do you not hear how my heart is beating? asked Anastasia. <clears throat> Could I really have not been paying attention to this sound? The sound of her heart beating? Yes, 
I hasten to respond. Of course I hear it. I hear it very well. It is beating evenly and calmly. Try to memorize the intervals of the various sounds you hear. You can choose the principal sounds and memorize them. I selected the chirping of some insects, the cawing of a crow, and the gurgling and a splash of the water in the stream. Now I shall increase the tempo of my heartbeat, and you listen and see what happens all around. Anastasia's heartbeat increased infrequently, and right away the rhythm of sounds I could hear around me joined in with a heightened tonality. That's astounding, simply incredible, I exclaimed. What are you saying, Anastasia? Are they so sensitive to the rhythm of your heartbeat? Yes, everything, absolutely everything. A little blade of grass, a big tree, even the bugs. They all react to any change in the rhythm of my heart. The trees accelerate their inner process and work harder to, rep to produce oxygen. Is this how all the plants and animals and people's environment react, I asked? No, in your world, they do not understand to whom they should react and you do not try to make contact with them. Besides, you do not understand the purpose of such contact and do not give them significant information about yourself. <clears throat> Something similar might happen between plants and the people who work in our little garden plots. If only people would do every a thing I outlined to you, imbue the seed with information about themselves and begin to communicate more consciously with their plants. Do you want me to show you what man will feel when he makes such contact? Of course I want you to, but how will you do that? I shall tune the rhythm of my heartbeat to yours, and you will feel it. She slid her hand inside her shirt. Sorry, she slid her hand inside my shirt, her warm palm lightly pressed against my chest. Little by little her heart adjusted its tuning and began beating in the same rhythm as mine and something most amazing happened. I felt an unusual pleasant sensation, as though my mother and my relatives were right there beside me. A sense of softness and good health came over my body, and my heart was filled with joy, freedom, and a whole new sense of creation. The range of surrounding sounds caressed me and communicated the truth, not a truth comprehensible in all its detail, just something I felt intuitively. I had the impression that all the pleasing and joyous feelings I had ever experienced in my life were now emerging into a single and wonderful sensation. Perhaps it was this sensation that is called happiness. But as soon as Anastasia began to change the rhythm of her heartbeat, the wonderful sensation started to leave me. I asked, more please, let me feel some more, Anastasia. I, can, I cannot do that for long. After all, I have my own rhythm. Even just a little bit more, I pleaded. And once again, Anastasia brought back the sensation of happiness, just for a short time. And then everything faded, but not without leaving me with a small taste of the pleasant and radiant sensation as a memory of it. We remained silent for a while, and then I felt like hearing Anastasia's voice again, and I asked, Was it, what it, was it this good for the first people, Adam and Eve? You just lie around, enjoy life, and prosper, everything at hand. Only it can become boring if there's nothing to do. Instead of answering my question, Anastasia asked one of her own. Tell me, Vladimir, do many people think of Adam, of the first man, as you thought just now? Probably the majority. But what was there for them to do in paradise? It was only later that man started to develop and thought of everything. Man developed through labor. He became smarter thanks to labor. Yes, labor is indeed, but the first man was infinitely smarter than his descendants today, and his labor was more meaningful. It demanded considerable intelligence, awareness, and will. But what did Adam do in paradise? Did he tend a garden? That is something that can be done today by any gardener, not to mention plant breeding specialists. Nothing more is said in the Bible about Adam's activity. If the Bible told everything in detail, it would be impossible to read through it in a single human lifetime. One must understand the Bible. There is so much information behind each verse. Do you want to know what Adam did? I shall tell you. But first remember that it is the Bible that tells us that God assigned Adam to give names and spe specify the purpose of every creature living on the earth. And he, Adam, did this. He did what, will, what all the scientific institutions in the world take together have not 
sorry, but all the institutions in the world taken together have not yet been able to do. Anastasia, do you turn to God yourself? Do you ask him for anything for yourself? What more can I do, I ask, when so much has already been given to me? It is my task to thank him and help him. Chapter 22 Who Will Bring Up Our Son? On the way back to the river, as Anastasia was escorting me to my motorboat, we sat down to rest at the place where she had left her outer clothing, and I asked her, Anastasia, how will we bring up our son? Try to understand, Vladimir, you are not ready to bring him up, and then his eyes first, sorry, then when his eyes first take in a conscious awareness of the world, you should not be there. I seized her by the shoulders and gave her a shaking. What are you saying? What liberties are you t taking here? I can't understand how you could have come in such one-handed conclusion. Anyway, even though the mere fact of your existence is incredible, this doesn't give you the right to decide everything yourself and in violation of all the rules of logic. Calm down, Vladimir, please. I do not know what logic you have in mind, but do try and make sense of it clear calmly. What am I to, to make sense of? The child is not only yours, he's mine too, and I want him to have a father. I want him to be well taken care of and get an education. Please understand, he does not need any kind of material benefits as you see them. He will have everything he needs right from the start, even in his infancy. He will be taken in and make sense of so much information that your kind of ed education will be simply ludicrous. It's the same as sending a learned mathematician back to grade one. You want to bring the baby some kind of senseless toy, but he has absolutely no need of it whatsoever. You are the one who needs it for your own self-satisfaction. Oh, look at me. I'm so good and caring. If you think that you, you will do some good by offering your son a car or anything else along that line, well, he can get it himself just by wishing for it. Be calm and think about something specific you could tell your son. Think about what you could teach him. Think about what you have done in life and what might he find interesting. Anastasia continued taking in soft, sorry, talking in soft, quiet tones, but her words still made me tremble. You see, Vladimir, when he begins to make sense of creation, you will look like an underdeveloped creature next to him. Do you really want that? Do you really want your son to see you standing there like a dimwit? The only thing that can bring the two of you together is your level of mental purity, but few attain that level in your world. You must strive to attain it. I realized that it was absolutely useless to argue with her, and I cried out in despair. Does this mean I'll have... he'll never know anything about me? I shall tell him about you, about your world, when he is able to comprehend it in a meaningful way, and make his own decisions. What he will do then, I do not know. Despair, pain, resentment, fear, full conjure, all these swirled around in my brain. I, f I felt like smashing this beautiful intellectual recluse's face with all my might. I understood everything, and what I understood left me breathless. It is clear. Now it's all clear to me. You had nobody to to bang with, with you to give a child. That business at the beginning, that was all just an act. You sly vixen, you made yourself into a nun. You needed a child, but you did go to Moscow. She sold her mushrooms and berries. Ha! You could have got yourself a shag there, right on the street. All you had to do was take off the jacket and shawl and, and show yourself, and you would have had takers right off. Then you wouldn't have needed to spin your web and trap me in it. Of course, you need a man who is dreaming about a son, and you have got yours. Did you ever think about the child, about your son, one destined in advance to live the life of a recluse, to live the way you think you should? Come on now. He, here's, here she's been sounding off about the truth, but you've got an awful lot of gall, you hermit. What is it with you? truth at a last resort well did you ever think about me me a dr i dreamed about a son i dreamed about passing along my business to him to teach him to be a businessman i wanted a son to love and now i how am i supposed to live to live and 
know that your precious little son is crawling around unprotected somewhere in the wild in the taiga with no future, with no father. That's what breaks my heart. But that's not something you can understand, you forest bitch. Perhaps Anastasia, perhaps, Anastasia quietly responded, your heart will gain the awareness it needs and everything will be all right. A pain like that will cleanse the soul, accelerate through, accelerate thought and summon you to creation. But I was still burning with rage and anger. I wasn't in control of myself. I grabbed a stick. I ran away from Anastasia and began beating the stick against a small tree with all my might until the stick broke. Then I turned to look at Anastasia standing there, and oh, how she appeared to me. Incredibly, the anger started to leave. I thought to myself, oh, now I've gone and done it again. I lost control of myself and went wild, just like the last time when I swore at her. Anastasia was standing there against a tree, one arm stretched upward, her head bent forward as though with, withstanding the onslaught of a hurricane. With my anger completely gone, I went closer and began looking at her. Now her hands were clasped to her chest, her body slightly trembling. She didn't speak, only her kind, kind eyes were looking at me with some kind of, with the same tenderness as before. We stood there that way for some time, just looking at each other, and I started reflecting along these lines. There's no doubt about it. She is incapable of lying. She didn't have to say anything, but she knew it would be hard, and yet she spoke. Of course, that too is a challenge. How can you possibly live if you must always tell the truth and say only what you think? But what can you do if that's the way she is? and can't be anything else. What's done is done. Everything happens the way it happens. Now she will be the mother of my son. She will be a mother if she said so. Of course, she'll be a pretty strange mother. That lifestyle of hers and her way of thinking. Oh, well, there's nothing to be done with her. Still, she's physically very strong and kind. She really knows nature well, knows the animals, and she's smart in her own peculiar way, at least. In any case, she knows a lot about raising children. She kept wanting to talk about children the whole time. She'll nurture the boy. Somebody like her will definitely nurture him. She'll get him through the cold and through snowstorms even. They mean nothing to her. She'll nurture him, yes indeed, and she'll bring him upright. And somehow, I've got to adopt the situation. I've got to adapt to the situation. I'll come and see them in the summertime like going to the Dasha. No way in the winter. I wouldn't make it, but in the summer I can play with my son. He'll grow up and I'll tell him about people in the big cities. At any rate, this time I've got to apologize to her, and I said, I am sorry, Anastasia. I got nervous again. And right off, she said, you are not to blame. Only do not be hard on yourself. Do not worry. After all, you are concerned about your son. You were afraid that things would turn out bad for him, that the mother of your son was just an ordinary bitch, that she could not love the real human love. But you must not worry. You must not get upset. You talked that way because you did not know. You did not know anything about my love, my darling. Chapter 23, Through a Window of Time. Anastasia, if you are so smart and omnipotent, that means you could help me. She looked up at the sky and then again at me. In the whole of the universe, there is no being capable of more powerful development and greater freedom than man. All other civilizations bow before man. All sorts of civilizations have the capability of developing and bringing themselves to perfection, but only in one direction, and they are not free. Even the greatness of man is beyond their grasp. God the great mind created man, and to no one else gave he more than that to man. I could not make sense, at least right off, of what she was saying. And again, I uttered the same question, pleaded for help, not fully understanding what kind of help I needed. She asked me, What is it that you have in mind? Do you want me to cure all your physical ailments? That is a simple matter for me. I already did this six months ago, only in the principal area of need no benefit came about. The dark and destructive elements 
common to people of your world have not lessened in you, and your various aches and pains are trying to come back again. You witch, madwoman hermit, get out of here. This instant, you're probably thinking, right? Yes, I answered in amazement. That is exactly what I was thinking. You read my mind. I summarized. That is what you might be thinking. Indeed, it is written all over your face. Tell me, Vladimir, do you, do you not well remember me, at least a little? The question dumbfounded me, and I began carefully examining her facial features, especially her eyes. I really began to think that I might have seen them be somewhere before, but where? Anastasia, you said yourself that you spend all your time in the forest. How then could I have seen you? She gave me a smile and ran off. A short while later, Anastasia came out from behind the bushes and dressed in a long skirt, a brown button cardigan, her hair done up in a shawl, but without the quilted jacket in which she had greeted me on the riverbank, and the shawl was tied differently. Her clothes were clean, though not stylish, and her shawl covered her forehead and neck, and I remembered her. Chapter 24 A Strange Girl The summer before a convoy ship had docked at one of the villages not far from these parts, we needed to buy bulk meat for the restaurant and spend some time in port. Six kilometers farther on, the, on there would be a particularly dangerous section of the river, which meant our ship could not travel through there that night. Certain sections of the river were not equipped with navigation lights, so as not to waste time, we began announcing over our outdoor speaker system that we will, as a local radio, that we are throwing a party, that everything on board our vessel. Okay. The sleek white ship standing on the dock, glistening with a huge array of light, and alive with the music poured forth from its intervals. Wait, did I read that right? From it inevitably attracted the young people of the village to such occasions. Indeed, in this particular evening, particularly the entire local youth population could be seen making its way to the ship's gangplank. Upon coming aboard like any first-time visitors, they immediately set about taking a look around the whole ship to see what they could see. After touring the main, middle, and upper decks, they ended up congregating in the restaurant and bar. The female contingents, as a rule, took to dancing, while the male half-preferred drinking. The unusual circumstances of being in on a ship, plus the music and alcohol, always endangered a state of excitement. Endangered inky. Engendered. <laughs> My goodness. Um, occasionally making big trouble for the crew. Almost always there was not enough time and the party goers made a collective appeal to extend the festivities just a bit longer, say by half an hour, and then more and more into the night. On this particular occasion, I was alone in my cabin listening to music wafting up from the restaurant and attempting to make modifications to the convoy schedule for a remainder of the trip. All at once, I felt myself being stared at. I turned around and glimpsed her eyes on the other side of the window glass. That was nothing unusual. Visitors often looked into the ship's cabins. I got up and opened the window and she didn't go away. She continued looking at me with some embarrassment. I felt I wanted to do something for this woman standing alone on the deck just outside my cabin. I wondered why she was dancing, like why she wasn't dancing with the others. Perhaps she was somehow unhappy. I offered to show her around the ship and she silently nodded. I took her all over the ship, showed her the main office, which frequently impressed the visitors with its elegant appointments. The rug covered the floor, the soft leather furniture, the computers. Then I invited her into my cabin, which consisted of study, sleeping quarters, and par carpeted reception room, equipped with fine furniture, TV, and VCR. I was probably most delighted at the time to impress a poor young country girl with the achievement of our civilized world. I opened in front of her a box of candles and poured two glasses of champagne, and thinking to add a finishing touch to the impression. But on the videotape of Vika singing Love and Death, the videotape included a number of other songs performed by my favorite artists. She lightly touched the champagne glass to her lips and looked intently at me and asked, It's a challenge, eh? I expected just about any kind of question except that one. 
The expedition had indeed turned out to be quite a challenge, what with the difficult navigation condition on the river and the crew, mainly students and the Marine Academy, smoking pot and fil pilfering merchandise from the store. We were frequently behind schedule and couldn't get our planned stops on time, where our arrival had been advertised in advance. These burdens and other worries often deprived me of the opportunity, not only to admire the landscape along the river, but even to get a normal sleep. I muttered something meaningful to her. Mean <laughs> I muttered something meaningless to her, something like, never mind, we'll get through, then turned around toward the window and polished off my glass of champagne. We went on talking about this, that or the other, listening to the videotape in the background. We talked right up until the ship docked, once more at the end of our party cruise. Then I escorted her to the gangplank. Upon returning to my cabin, I made a mental note that there was something very strange and unusual about this woman, and I was left with an unexpected feeling of lightness and brightness after talking with her. That night I had my first good sleep in many days. At long last I understood why the woman on the ship had been Anastasia. So that was you, Anastasia. Yes, there in your cabin I memorized all the songs which I later sang in the forest. They were playing while we were talking. You see how simple it all is? How did you happen to come on board? I was interested in seeing what was going on, how you all lived. After all, Vladimir, I had been spending my whole time just talking, sorry, just taking care of Dashniks. That day I hurried to the village and sold the dried mushrooms which the squirrels had collected and bought a ticket to your party cruise. Now I know a lot more about the class of, now I know a lot more about the class of people you call entrepreneurs, and I know you pretty well too. I feel I owe you a huge apology. I didn't know how things could turn out, that it would be so drastically alter your future. Only I can no longer do anything about it, since they have seen to the fulfillment of this plan, and they are unanswerable only to God. For a time now. You and your family will have great difficulties and challenges to overcome, but then that will pass. Still not understanding what Anastasia was specifically talking about, I intuitively felt that something was about to unfold itself with me that would go way beyond the usual parameters of our existence, it's something directly concerning me. I asked Anastasia to tell me in more detail what she meant by altering my destiny and challenges. Listening to her at a time, I simply could not imagine how accurately her predictions would soon start being realized in real life. She continued her recounting once more, bringing me back to the events of the past year. Back then on the ship, she said, you showed me something, even your cabin, treated me with candies, offered me champagne, and then escorted me to the gangplank, but I did not leave the riverbank right away. I stood on the shore near some bushes and could see through the lighted window of the bar how the young people of the village were still dancing and having a good time. You showed me everything, but you did not take me to the bar. I guess why I was not appropriately dressed and my head was covered in a shawl. My cardigan was not stylish, my skirt was too long, but I couldn't take off the shawl. My cardigan was neat and clean and I had pressed my skirt carefully with my hands before I came to see you. I really hadn't taken Anastasia to the bar that evening on account of her strange clothing beneath which, as it is now clear, what this young girl had been hiding her rem remarkable beauty, something that immediately set her apart from everyone else. And I said to her, Anastasia, why would you have wanted to go to a bar? Do you mean you would have gone dancing there in, the, in your galoshes? Anyway, how would you know what dances young people do today? I was not wearing galoshes at the time. When I exchanged my, for mushrooms, when I, expa uh, when I exchanged my mushrooms for money, to buy a ticket on your ship, I also bought a pair of shoes from the same woman. Granted, they were old shoes and were tight on me, but I cleaned them with grass. As for dancing, all I would need to is a one-time look, and that would be it. And what a dance I'd be. You were supposed, you were, I suppose, offended at me that night. I was not offended, but if you had taken me to the bar, I do not know whether that would have been good or bad thing, but even but events might have turned out differently, and all this might have happened, but I do not know, oh my gosh, <laughs> but I do not now regret that things happened the way they did. So what happened? What happened that night that was so terrible? After you escorted me off the ship and did not return right away to your cabin, first you dropped off to see the captain, and then the two of you headed to the bar. 
For you, that was normal thing to do. The moment you entered, both made an impression on the public. Yet the captain looked prim and proper in his uniform. You were very elegant and gave a most respectful appearance. You were known to many in this village, the famous Migre, the owner of convoy ships, unique in these parts, and you fully realized that you were making an impression. You sat down at the table with the young country girls. You were only 18 years old, just out of school. The waiters immediately brought the champagne, candies, and new wine glasses to your table, prettier than the ones that were there before. You took one of the girls by the hand, bent over, and started whispering something in her ear. Compliments, I understand they are called. Then you danced with, your, with her several times, and the conversation continued. The girl's eyes were radiant as if she were in another world, a fairy tale world. You took the girl out on the deck and gave her the tour of the ship, just as you had me. You took her into your cabin and treated her to champagne and candies, just like me, but there was something a little different in the way you behaved with this young girl. You were in a cheerful mood. With me, you were more serious and even rem remorse. But with her, you were cheerful. I could see all that very well through the light, lighted window of your cabin, and possibly I felt a, a little as though I wanted to be there in the place of that girl. You don't mean to tell me you were jealous, Anastasia. I do, n I do not know if it was somehow an unfamiliar feeling for me. I recalled that evening and those country girls who were trying so hard to look young, older and more modern. The next morning, Captain, and I once again had a laugh at the nighttime antics on the dock. Then in my cabin, I realized that this girl was in such a state that she was ready to go to any lengths, but I hadn't any thoughts about wanting to possess her. I told Anastasia about this, and, I, and she replied, Still, you had stolen her heart. The two of you went out on the dock. It was dazzling, and you threw your jacket over the girl's shoulders. Then you took her back to the bar. Where, where were you? What were you doing, Anastasia, standing the whole time in the bushes in the rain? That was nothing. The, the drizzle was good and caressing, only it interfered with my view, and I did not want my skirt and shawl to get wet. They were my mother's. My mother left them to me, but I was very lucky. I found a self a cell phone bag on the shore. I took off my skirt and shawl, put them in the bag, and hid it under my cardigan. Anastasia, if you don't go home and it started to rain, you should have come back to the ship. I could not have I could not have done that. You had already seen me off and you had other concerns. Besides, everything was shutting down. When the party came to an end and the ship was due to depart to, at the girl's request, especially the girl who was with you in the, your cabin, you delayed the departure. At that point, everything was in your power, including their hearts, and you were intoxicated with this power. The young people of the village were grateful to the girls, and the girls, too, felt imbued with a sense of power through you. They completely forgot about the young girls who were with them in the bar, guys they had been friends with in school. You and the captain escorted them to the gangplank. Then you went back to your cabin. The captain went up to the bridge, and then the signal sounded, and the ship slowly, very slowly, began to pull away from the dock. The girl had danced with, stood on the shore beside her girlfriends, and the young people who had waited around to see the ship off. Her heart was beating so strong it was almost trying to leap out of her breast and fly away. Her thoughts and feelings were all mixed up. Behind her back could be seen the outlines of the village house with a darkened window while in front of this, her the sleek white steamship, steamship was departing, forever illuminated with a host of lights still abundantly pouring forth its music across the water and the nighttime riverbank. The sleek white ship was where you were after saying so many marvelous things to her she had never heard before, so charming and alluring, and all that was slowly distancing itself from her forever. Then she decided to do something in the sight of everyone. She squeezed her fingers into a fist and began shouting desperately, I love you, Vladimir. And she did it again and again. Did you hear her shouting? Yes, I replied. You could not help hearing her and the members of the crew heard too. Some of them went on to the dock and began laughing at the girl. I did not want them to laugh at the girl. Then they stopped laughing as if they had suddenly come to their senses. But you did not come out of the dock, and the ship continued slowly moving away. 
She thought you could hear her, and she continued stubbornly crying out, I love you, Vladimir. Then some of her girlfriends joined in, and they all cried out together. I wondered what the feeling was like, love, which makes people lose control of themselves, or perhaps I wanted to help that girl. And so I shouted with them, I love you, Vladimir. It seemed as though I had forgotten at that moment that it was not enough just to simply utter words. There definitely had to be behind them feelings of awareness and trustworthiness of natural information. Now I know how strong the feeling is, and it's hardly subject to reason. The country girls later began to go in a slump and take to the bottle, and it was a challenge for me to help her. Now she is married and burdened down with everyday cares, and I have had to add her love to mine. The story of the girl threw me a little off balance. Anastasia's encounter managed to resurrect the evening in my memory in full detail and everything that had happened. Just as she said, it was very real. Anastasia's unique declaration of love did not make any impression on me. After seeing her lifestyle and getting to know how she, sorry, getting to know how she looked at the world, I saw her more and more as some unreal person. Even though she was sitting right beside me and I could simply reach out my hand and touch her, a consciousness accustomed to judge things by other criteria could not accept her as an existing reality. And while at the beginning of our encounter I had been attracted to her, she no longer aroused in me the same emotions I once had, I asked. So, you think these new... So you think these new feelings appear to you just by chance? They are desirable. They are important, replied Anastasia. They are pleasant, even. But I wanted you to love me, too. I realized that once you got to know me and my world a little more closely, you would not be able to accept me as a normal person, as simply man. Perhaps you would even be afraid of me occasionally. And that is exactly what happened. I myself am to blame. I have made many mistakes. I was anxious for some reason all the time. I was in a hurry, and I did not have the time to explain everything to you as I should. Perhaps it has all just turned out silly, eh? Do I need to reform myself? And with those words, her lips hinted at a smile. She touched her breast with her hand, and I at once remembered what had happened that morning when I was in the glade with Anastasia. Chapter 25. Bugs. That day I had decided to join in Anastasia's morning routine. Everything went fine at first. I stood under the tree and touched various little shoots. She told me about different herbs, and then I lay down beside her on the grass. We were both completely naked, but even I wasn't cold. That might have been, of course, due to my running through the forest with her. I was in a splendid mood. I felt a sense of lightheartedness, and not just physically, but inside me as well. It just felt really light. It all started when I felt a pinching sensation in my thigh. I raised my head and saw a small army of bugs crawling along my thigh and lower leg, including ants and some sort of beetle. I lifted my arm to swat them, but to no avail. Anastasia seized my arm in midair and held it, saying, Do not touch them! Then she got up on her knees in front of me, bent over, and pinned my other hand to the ground. I lay there as if crucified. I tried to free my arms, but couldn't. I felt that this was an impossibility. Then I tried to jerk myself free. With great effort, she kept restraining me, with very little effort. <clears throat> her smile never fading from her face, and still my body felt more and more crawling things, all tickling, biting, pinching, and I came to the conclusion that they were starting to eat me alive. I was in her hands, both literally and figuratively. Taking stock on the situation, I realized that nobody knew where I was. Nobody would come here looking for me, and if they should happen to wander by, they would be see they would see me picked over bones indeed, if they saw any bones at all. And all all sorts of things flashed through my head at that moment, and this was no doubt the reason my instinct for self preservation kicked in dictating the only feasible course of action in this situation. In desperation, I sunk my teeth with all my might into Anastasia's bare breast, at the same time jerking my head from side to side. Upon hearing her scream, I immediately loosened my grip on her breast. Anastasia loosened her hold, jumped up one hand, 
holding her breast, the other stretching upward, waving. She tried to smile. I too jumped up and shouted at her, feverishly brushing the, the crawling things off my leg. You wanted to feed me to those vermin, you forest witch. Well, I don't give in that easily. She continued waving and responding with a forced smile to the elements of nature around her, which had begun reacting warily to her situation. Anastasia looked at me and slowly, not with her usual spirited gait, walked towards the lake, her head bowed. I kept standing at the same spot for some time, thinking what I should do next, return to the river bank. But how would I find the way? Follow Anastasia. But what would be the point? Nevertheless, I headed for the lake shore. <clears throat> Anastasia was sitting on the shore, rubbing tufts of grass between the palms of her hand and dabbing its juice on that part of her breast, where a huge bruise left by my bite was clearly visible. It was probably very painful for her, but what had been her thought in attempting to restrain me? I hovered around her for a little while before asking, Does it hurt? Without turning her head, she replied, It hurts more inside. She silently continued rubbing the juice from the tufts of grass. What were you thinking playing tricks on me? I was trying to be helpful. The pores on your skin are all plugged up, and they cannot breathe. The little bugs would have cleaned them out. It's not that painful. In fact, it's rather pleasant. And the snake I saw? Wouldn't it have stung me on the leg? It was not doing any, you any harm. Even if it was release, even if it released its venom, it would have been only on the surface, and I would have rubbed it at once. The skin and the muscle on your heels are deteriorating. There is an account. What? There is on account of a car accident. That's on account of a car accident. I said. For a time, neither of us spoke. The whole situation felt rather silly. Not really knowing what to say, I asked her, "What happened? Why did that? Why, why did not that visible, so invisible someone help you again as before when I lost consciousness?" The reason he did not help was that I was smiling, and when you began biting me, I tried to smile. I began to feel uncomfortable in her presence. Picking up a tuft of grass, I rubbed it between my hands as hard as I could, then knelt down in front of her and began dabbing her bruises with my moistened palms. Chapter 26 Dreams Creating the Future <clears throat> Now that I had learned more about Anastasia's feelings about her desire to show, in spite of all her extraordinary traits, that she is still a man, a normal, natural human being, I realized what mental anguish I had caused her that morning. Once again, I apologized to her. Anastasia responded that she wasn't angry, but now, after what she had done, she was afraid of me. What could you have possibly done that could be so frightful, I asked, and once again I heard, for the umpteenth time, a story nobody should put forward seriously if they expect to be considered as normal. As all the other people in our society, nobody talks that way about themselves. When the ship left, Anastasia went on. The young people he headed back to the village. I stood for a while all by myself on the river bank, and I felt good. Then I ran off to my forest. The day passed as usual, but in the evening, when the stars had already come out, I lay down on the grass and began dreaming, and then worked out this plan. <clears throat> what kind of plan? You see, the things that I know are partially known by various people of the world you live in. Collectively, they know practically everything, only they do not fully understand how it works. Then I went and I fancied how you will go to large cities and tell many people about me and my explanations. You will do this using the same methods by which you usually spread any kind of information. You will write a book. Great many people will read it, and truth will unfold to them. They will have fewer ailments. They will change their attitude towards children <clears throat> and work out a whole new way of educating them. People will become more loving, and the earth will begin to emit more radiant energy. Artists will paint my portraits, and each portrait will be their very best masterpiece. I shall try to inspire. I will try to inspire them, and they will make what you call a movie, and it will be the grandest film ever made. You will look at all this and remember me. You will meet wise people who will understand and appreciate what I told you. 
and they will explain a lot of things to you. You will trust their word more than mine, and realize that I am not a witch, but actually a man, a human being. It was just that I have more information inside me than other people. What you write will be of tremendous interest, and you will become rich. You will have money in the banks of the 19 countries, and you will visit holy places and cleanse yourself of all the darkness that is in you. You will remember me and begin to love me. You will have the desire to see me again and see your son. You will desire to become worthy of my son, of our son. My dreams was so clear, you, but possibly a bit pleading too. That is probably why everything happened the way it did. They took it as a plan of action and decided to carry people through the dark forces window of time. That is permitted if the plan is formulated in detail on the earth. In the heart and mind of an individual man, an earth dweller, no doubt they took this as a grandiose plan. Perhaps they added something themselves, and this is why the forces of darkness have been hard at work of late. They have never been this active before. I realize this from the ringing cedar. Its ray has become a lot more powerful lately, and the ringing has got louder, and the cedar is hurrying to give it back to give back its light and its energy. <clears throat> As I listened to Anastasia, I began thinking more and more about that was utterly crazy, that maybe she had long ago escaped from some asylum and was living here in the forest, and here I had gone and slept with her, and now she might have a child. What a tale indeed. Still seeing how serious and concerned she was as she talked with me, I tried to calm her down. Don't you worry, Anastasia, your plan is obviously unreasonable, and so there is no need for forces of darkness and light to fight each other. You don't have a detailed enough knowledge about your everyday life, about our everyday life, its laws and conventions, the things that an awful lot of books are being published right now. But for some reason, even the works of well-known authors aren't selling. I'm no writer, and so I don't have either the talent or ability or education to write anything. That is correct. You did not have things earlier. Sorry, you did not have these things earlier, but now you do, she declared in response. Okay, I kept trying to assuage her fears. But if, even if I tried, nobody would print it or believe in any existence. Or sorry, would believe in your existence. <clears throat> but I do exist. I exist for those of whom I exist. They will believe and help you just as I shall later help you. And together... With those people, we... I couldn't make sense of what she was saying right off, and once more I had made an effort to calm her down. I shan't even make an attempt to write anything. There is absolutely no sense in it. You Don't you get it? Believe me, you shall. They have already created a whole network of circumstances that will make you do this. What am I... Th think you... What am I, think you, a puppet in somebody's hands? And so much depends on you before the forces of darkness will try to stop you with all the tricks in, in their arsenal. They will even try to drive you to suicide by creating an illusion of hopelessness. Enough, Anastasia. That's it. I'm sick and tired of listening to your fana fantasies. You think you, you think they are just fantasies? Yeah. Yes, fantasies. And I stopped short. It began to dawn on me as I calculated the timing in my head and understood everything Anastasia told me about her dreams, about her son. She had thought up last year, long before I knew her, as well as I do now, long before I slept with her. Now a year later, it was coming to pass. So that means it's already coming to pass, I asked her. So, of course, if it had not been for them, and for me too, a little your second expedition would not have been possible after all. You were scarcely able to make ends meet after the first one. And you did not even have any claim to the ship. You mean to say you influenced the shipping line and the firms that helped me? Yes. So you drove to ruin and inflicted damage on them? What right have you to interfere like that? And here I've left the ship behind and I'm sitting here with you. Maybe right now everything's going into pieces back there. You've probably got some kind of hypnotic ability. <clears throat> <clears throat> no worse than that you're a witch and that's it or crazy hermit you don't have anything not even a house and here you go philosophizing in front of me you sorcerer 
I am not an I am an entrepreneur. Do you have any idea what that means? I am an entrepreneur. Even if I'm dying, my ships will ply the rivers. They bring goods to people, and that's what I do. I bring things to people, and I give you any items you need. But you can't give me, I, what can I give you? I can give you a drop of heavenly tenderness, and I can give you rest. You will be a genius of bright eye cleverness as your image. I am blessed. Image, image, who needs your image? What sense can that express? It will help you write your books for people. Oh, please, there you go again, doing goodness knows what with the, your mysticism of yours. So you can't just live like a normal person, are you sure? I have never done anything bad to anyone, and I never can. I am a human being, I am man. If you are so concerned about earthly goods and money, just wait a little. It'll all come back to you. I do owe you apology for dreaming like that, dreaming that you will have a time of troubles, but for some reason, I could think of no alternative back then. You do not see the logic. You need to be compelled to see it through the help of circumstances in your world. Excuse me, I couldn't hold out any longer. What's this about being compelled? You do something like that and you still want to be treated as a normal human being? I am man. I am human. I am a human being, a woman. Anastasia agitation was clearly noticeable in her voice. I only wanted and still only want the good. I want only the light. I want you to be purified. That is why I thought back then about your trip to the holy places, about the book. They have accepted this, and the forces of darkness are always fighting with them. But never have the dark forces scored a major victory. <clears throat> and what about you, I countered? With all your intelligence, information, and energy, are you just going to stand and watch your, on the sidelines? In a confrontation on the scale between two great principles, my own effort count for precious little. Help is going to be needed from many others in your world. I shall seek them out and find them. Just as I did that time when you were in the hospital, only you needed to develop a little more of that conscious awareness. You needed to overcome the bad within yourself. I'd like to know just what's so bad within myself. What did I do wrong when I was in hospital? And how could you have treated me what then, when you weren't there beside me? <clears throat> Back then, you simply did not feel my presence, but I was right there with you. When you were in the ship, I brought you a little branch of the ringy cedar, which Mama had broken off before she died. I left it in your cabin when you invited me in. You were ill even then. I could feel it. Do you remember the branch? Yes, I replied. In fact, that branch hung on the wall of my cabin for some time. Many of my crew noticed it and brought it back to Novisburg, but I didn't pay any attention to it. You simply threw it out, but I had no idea. You had no idea. You threw it out, and Mama's branch did not succeed in overcoming your illness. Then you went into hospital. When you got when you get back, take a closer look at the history of your illness. If you check the chart, you will see that in spite of taking the be very best medicine available, there was no improvement. But then they gave you some cedar nut oil. Now, according to script, for, now according to strict prescription regulations, the doctor was not supposed to do that, but she did it. In spite of the fact that there was not a single mention of it in your medical prescription guide, and nothing of the sort had been done before. Do you remember? Yes. You were being treated by a woman who was a sector head of one of the best clinics in your city, but this sector had nothing to do with your particular illness. She left you there even though just one floor up there was another sector specifically corresponding to your illness, right? Yes. She would prick you with needles and turn on some music in the half-darkened room. Anastasia's account was in complete accord with what had actually happened to me. Do you remember this woman? Yes, she was in charge of the sector in the former district council hospital. And then all at once, Anastasia, her eyes fixed intently on me, spoke several disconnected phrases which immediately shocked me and caused a shiver up and down my spine. What kind of music do you like? Fine, like that. Not too loud. And she spoke these phrases in exactly the voice and with the intonation used by the sector's head who treated me. Anastasia, I explained. She didn't let me finish. Keep listening. Do not be shocked. For God's sake, do try. Try to make sense of everything I'm telling you. Get your mind forces working, at least a little. It's all very easy, you see, for man. 
and she went on. This woman doctor, she is very good. She is a real doctor. I got along with her very well. She is kind and forthright. It was I who did not want you to be transferred to the other sector. That sector would have corresponded to your particular illness, but hers did not. She requested her supervisor to leave you with her, assuring them that they would care for you. She felt up to she would care for you. She felt up to it. She knew your pains were simple, the result of something else, and she tried to counteract that something else. She is a doctor. And how did you behave? You kept on smoking and drinking to your heart's content, eating salty and spicy foods, and that in spite of your serious ulcer. You did not deny yourself anything in the way of pleasure. Somehow your subconscious got a message, even though you were not aware of it, that there was nothing terribly wrong with you, that nothing would happen to you. I did not accomplish anything good. Rather, the, it did not accomplish... Uh. I did not accomplish anything good, rather the opposite. The darkness in your consciousness did not lessen, nor did your will or sense of awareness prove improve. <laughs> when you regained your health, you sent one of your employees to thank the woman who saved your life. You yourself did not call her, not even once. She was waiting for you to call. She had a feeling of love for you. She? Or you, Anastasia? We, oui, if that is clear to you. I got up and for some reason I took a few steps away from Anastasia, who was sitting on a fallen tree. The mixed-up state of my feelings and thoughts caused even greater uncertainty as to how I should think about her. Now look once again, you are not understanding how I do things. You are becoming confused, but it is a simple thing to grasp. I do things with the help of my imagination and my ability to analyze possible situations. And now you have started thinking ill of me again. She fell silent, her head resting on her knees. And I stood there too, without saying a word, thinking. She keeps on talking and talking and saying all sorts of incredible things. It's clear she has no idea that any normal person who would not accept them, and she would not accept her as a normal person. And so would not accept her as a normal person. Still, I went over to Anastasia and brushed her cascading braids of hair from her face. Tears were rolling down her cheeks from her large bluish gray eyes she smiled and said something quite uncharacteristic she's just another one of those soppy females eh right now you are overwhelmed by the very fact of my existence and do not believe your eyes you do not fully believe and you cannot even make sense of my sitting here talking to you you find both my existence and my abilities amazing you have completely ceased accepting me as a normal human being as man but believe me, I am human being and not a witch. And you consider my way of life amazing, but why does not a certain something else seem just as amazing, even paradoxical to you? Why do people admit that the earth is a celestial body, the greatest creation of the supreme mind, with each system component as his greatest achievement, and then go tear the system apart and devote so much effort to its destruction? You see a manufactured spaceship or an airplane as something natural, in spite of the fact that all its components are made of broken or remetalled parts of the original supreme system. Imagine a being who breaks off a piece of an airplane in flight and uses it as, uses it as parts to make himself a hammer or a scraper and then praises himself for having succeeded in making a primitive tool. He does not understand that one cannot keep breaking pieces off and flying airplanes indefinitely. How can you not grasp that our Earth must not be tortured like that. The computer is considered to be an achievement of human mind, but few realize that the computer may simply be compared to a prosthesis of the brain. You can imagine that would that you can imagine what would happen to a person with a normal healthy legs if they walked on crutches all the time. Naturally their leg muscles would atrophy. No machines will ever be superior to the human brain, providing the brain is kept in constant training. Anastasia wiped away a tear rolling down her cheek and stubbornly persisted in elucidating the incredible revelation stemming from her extraordinary logic. At the time, I had no idea how everything she said would arouse millions of people, set the minds of scholar astir, and even as more as mere hypothesis proved to be... Sorry, let's try again. Um, 
At the time, I had no idea how everything she said would arouse millions of people, set the minds of scholars astir, and even as mere hypothesis proved to be without parallel anywhere in the world. According to Anastasia, the sun is something like a mirror. It reflects emanations from the earth which, it, which are invisible to the eye. These emanations come from people in a state of joy. Joy or something other radiant feelings. Reflecting off the sun, they return to earth in the form of sunlight and give life to everything on the planet. <clears throat> she brought up a whole array of supporting arguments which were not that simple to grasp. If the earth and other planets were simply consumers of the sun, grace of light, she said, it would be extinguished or burn unevenly, and its glow would be off kilter. In the universe, off kilter. <laughs> In the universe, there is and can be no lopsided process. Everything is interrelated. She cited too. The words of the Bible and the life was the light of man. Anastasia also stared. Anastasia also stated that one man's feelings can be transmitted to another by reflecting off the celestial bodies, and she demonstrated this by the following example. Nobody on earth can deny that you can feel when somebody loves you. This feeling is especially noticeable when you are with the person who loves you. You call it intuition. In fact, invisible light waves emanate from the one who loves. But the love can be felt, if it is strong enough, even when the individual is absent. By drawing upon this feeling and understanding its nature, one can do wonders. This is what the call, what you call miracles, mysticism, or incredible abilities. Tell me, Vladimir, do you not feel a bit better with me now? Somehow lighter, warmer, more fulfilled? <clears throat> yes, I replied. For some reason, I haven't started to feel... I have started to feel warmer. Now watch what happens when I concentrate on you even more strongly. Anastasia lowered her eyelids ever so lightly, slightly low, slowly stepped back a few paces and stopped. A pleasant feeling of warmth started running through my body. It gradually intensified, but didn't burst into flame, and didn't make me hot. Anastasia turned and began to slowly walk away, hiding behind the thick trunk of all the tree of a tall tree. The sensation of pleasant warmth did not lessen, and it too was added. Another, as though something were helping my heart bump, pump blood through my veins, and with every heartbeat came the impression that the blood streams were instantly reaching each, every little vein in my body. The sole of my feet broke out in a heavy sweat and became very moist. You see, now it's all clear to you, Anastasia said as she triumphantly reappeared from behind the tree, confident that she had proved something to me. You see, you felt all that when I went behind the tree trunk, and your sensation even increased when you could not see me. Tell me about them. <clears throat> I told her, and then asked her to, in turn, what does the tree trunk show? What do you think? The waves of information and light went directly from you, from me to you. When I hid myself, the tree trunk was supposed to significantly distort them, since it has its own information and its own glow. But this did not happen. The waves of the feeling began falling directly upon you, reflecting off the celestial bodies, and even intensified. Then I caused what you call a miracle. Your feet began to perspire. You failed to mention that fact. I didn't think it was important. How do your feet perspire, constituting a miracle? How do my feet perspire and constitute a miracle? I chased all sorts of diseases out of your body through your feet. You should feel a lot better now. It is even noticeable on the outside of your not slouching that you're not slouching so much. Indeed, I was feeling better physically. So when you concentrate like that, you dream up something and whenever you want comes to pass. That described it more or less. <clears throat> that describes it more or less. And does what you dream about always come to pass, even when you're asking for someone's body? Ugh. And does what you dream about always come to pass, even when you are asking for something besides bodily healing? Always, as long as it's not an abstract dream, as long as it's detailing down to the minutest aspect and does not contradict the laws of spiritual being. I do not always manage, however, to come up with a dream like that, though has to proceed extremely quickly and there must be a corresponding vibration of feeling and then it will definitely come true 
It is a very natural process. It happens in the lives of many people. Ask around among your acquaintances. Perhaps you will find something among them who have dreamt this way, and their dreams have come true either fully or partially. Detailed thinking proceeding extremely quickly. Tell me when you were dreaming about the poets and the artists and the book. Was that all in detail too? Did your thoughts proceed quickly then? Extraordinarily quickly, and everything was so specific down to the finest detail. So now you think it's going to come true. Yes, it will. There wasn't anything else you dream about in, at the time. You've told me everything about your dreams. Not everything. Then tell me everything. Do you, do you really want to hear it, Vladimir? Really? Yes. Anastasia's face brightened as though illuminated by a flash of light. It was with inspiration and excitement that she continued her incredible monologue. <clears throat> Chapter 27 Across the Dark Forces Window of Time During that night of my dreams, I thought of how to transport people across this window of time, of the dark forces. My plan and conscious awareness were precise and realistic, and they accepted them. In the book you are going to write, there will be un unabrusive, I can't read this, unabrusive combination formulations made up of letters, and they will arouse in the majority of people good and radiant feelings. These feelings are capable of overcoming ailments of body and soul, and will facilitate the birth of new awareness inherent in people of the future. Believe me, Vladimir, this is not myst mysticism. It is an accord of the laws of the universe. It is very simple. You will write this book, guided only by feelings and your heart, you will not be able to do otherwise since you have not mastered the technique of writing, but through your feelings you can do anything. These feelings are already within you, but mine and yours, they are not something you can comprehend just yet, but they will be understandable to many. When they are embodied in signs and patterns, they will be stronger than Zoister's fire. Do not hide anything that has happened to you, even your most intimate experiences. Free yourself from any sense of shame, and do not be afraid of appearing ridiculous. Humble your pride. I have opened my whole being to you, my body and my soul, though I want to open myself to everyone. Now I am permitted to do this. I know that what a terrible mass of dark forces will descend upon me. They will try to counteract my dream, but I am not afraid of them. I am stronger, and I will succeed in seeing my plan. And my plan will come true, and I will succeed in giving birth and raising my son, our son, Vladimir. My dream will break down many of the devices of the dark forces, and which, for a millennia, have been acting on people's destructive, acting on people destructively, and it will cause many to work for good. I know that you find yourself unable to believe me at the moment. You are prevented from doing this by the conventions and many dogmas planted in your brain by the circumstances of existence in the world in which you live. The possibility of transport of the transport through the time seems incredible to you, but your concepts of time and distance are all relative. These dimensions cannot be measured by meters or seconds, but by the degree of one's conscious awareness and will. The purity of the thoughts, feeling, and perceptions held by the majority is what determines the place of humanity in time and the universe. You believe in horoscopes. You believe in your complete dependence on the position of the planets. This belief has been attained through the aid of the devices of the dark forces. This belief is slowing down the movement of the channel of light, allowing its dark counterparts in it to advance and increase in size. This belief is leading you away from your conscious awareness of the truth the essence of your earthly being. Analyze this question very carefully. Think about how God created man in his image and likeness. Man has been granted great freedom, the freedom to choose between the darkness and the light. Man has been given a soul. The whole visible world is subject to man, and man is free even when it comes to his relationship to God, to love him or not to love him. Nobody and, with, and nothing can control man apart from his whole will. Apart from his own will, God wants man's love in return for his love, but God wants the love of a, 
of the tree of but God wants the love of a free man perfect in his likeness God has created everything we can see including the planets they serve to guarantee the order and harmony of all life not only plants and animals they also help human flesh but there is no way they have power over man's heart and mind it's not they who control man but man controls their movements through his sub through his subconscious If a single individual wanted a second sun to flare up in the sky, it would not appear. Things are arranged this way so that planetary catastrophes do not happen. But if everybody together wanted a second sun, it would appear. In making up a horoscope, it is necessary first of all to take into account the basic dimensions, the level of man's temporal awareness, his strength of will and his spirit, the aspirations of his soul and the degree in which it participates in the life of the, of the here and now. Favorable and unfavorable weather, magnetic storms, high and low pressure, these are all subject to will and conscious awareness. Have you never seen a happy and joyful person on a cloudy or stormy day? Or on the other hand, a sad and depressed person on a sunny day amidst the most favorable weather conditions? You think that I am simply indulging in a crazy person's fantasy when I say that the patterns and the formulations of letters I shall put in the book will heal people and illuminate their experience. You do not believe me because you do not understand, and yet, in fact, it is so simple. And that indeed happened, even with me, reading them again. Many lucid dreams already with her. You see, right now I'm talking to you in your language, using your speech idioms, and even try sometimes to speak with your voice inflections. It'll be easy for you to memorize what I say because this is your language, belonging exclusively to you. Although understandable to many people, it contains no incompre incomprehensible words or obscure idioms. It is simple and therefore understandable to the majority. But there are certain words or uh, word orders which I have changed just a little, but only a little. Right now you are in an exciting, in an excited state. And therefore, when you recall this state, you will recall everything I have told you, and you will write down what I have said. And that is how my combination of letters will fall into place in your book. These combinations are very important. They can do wonders just like a prayer. After all, many of you already know that prayers are specific combinations of specific patterns of letters. These combinations and patterns are strung together with God's help by people who have, been, who have had an illuminating experience. The dark forces have always tried to deprive man of the opportunity of drawing up the grace emanating from these combinations. To this end, they have been even changed the language, introduced new words and removed old ones, and distorted the meaning of words. At one time, for example, there were 47 letters in your language. Now there remain 33 alone. The forces of darkness have imparted other combinations and fashions of their own, stirring up base and dark elements attempting to lead man astray by fleshy lusts and passions. But I have restored the original combinations using only the letters and symbols in use today, and they will n now be effective. I tried so hard to find them, and I did. I have brought together all the best from different times. I collected a good many and have hidden them in the lines that you will write. As you can see, it is simply a matter of translating the combinations of signs from the depth of eternity and in infinity of the universe, exact in sense, meaning, and purpose. Write about everything you have seen. Hold back nothing, neither the bad nor the good, nor even the in intimate or absurd, and then they will be preserved. You yourself will be convinced of this. Please believe me, Vladimir, you will become convinced once it is written down. In many who read what has been written, feeling and emotions will be found which they are not able to fully understand or make sense of. They will confirm this for you. You will see and hear it confirmed and radiant feelings will appear in them and then many will themselves understand through the help of these feelings a great deal more than what is written by your hand. Try writing at least a little. When you are convinced that people feel these combinations, when a dozen or a hundred or a thousand people confirm it for you, you will then believe and write down everything only believe, believe in yourself, believe in me. Later I can tell you the things even more significant and people will understand and feel them too. I am talking 
about the raising of children. You are, you are interested to know about flying saucers and how they work, rockets and planets, but I so wanted to tell you more about the raising of children and I shall do so. I shall explain it when I instill in you the greater sense of conscious awareness. However, all this needs to be re read when there is no interference from sounds or manufactured artificial devices around. Such sounds are harmful and led man away from the truth. Let only the sounds of God created in nature were let only sounds of the God created natural world be heard. They carry within themselves a truthful information and grace and increase one's conscious awareness. Then the healing effect will be significantly more powerful. Once again, of course, you have your doubts when you think of me and do not believe in the healing power of words. But there is no mysticism here, no mere fantasy or contradiction in the laws of spiritual being. When these radiant feelings appear in man, they cannot help but exert a beneficial influence on literally every organ of his body. It is these radiant feelings that are the most powerful and effective remedy against any kind of bodily compliant. God has healed through the help of such feelings, as did the bi biblical prophets and saints. Read the Old Testament and see for yourself. Certain people in your world are healing through the help of these feelings. Many of your doctors know about this. Ask them if they do not believe me. After all, it is easier for you to believe them. The stronger and brighter the feeling, the greater effect it has on the person in need of healing. I have always been able to heal with my ray. Great-grandfather taught me and explained everything when I was still a child. I have done this many times with my dashniks. Now my ray is many times more great, powerful than grandfather and great-grandfather's. That is because they say there has arisen in me another feeling the one called love. This feeling is so great, so pleasant, and a little fiery too. I want to share it with everyone and with you. As for me, I want things to be good for everyone and everything, just as God wanted them to be. Anastasia spoke her monologue with extraordinary inspiration and confidence, as though aiming it across space and time, and then she fell silent. I looked at Anastasia, amazed at her uncharacteristic fever and confidence, and then asked, Anastasia, is that it? Are there no further nuances in your plans or dreams? The rest, Vladimir, is just a trifle, nothing of great significance. I merely included them, little things as simple as ABC. As I was formulating the plan, there was just one sticking point concerning you, but I managed to resolve it. Well, please go on into a bit more detail there, here. What kind of sticking point was it that concerns me? You see, I made you into the richest person on earth, and I also made you the most famous. This will happen in the near future, but when the details of my dream unfold, as yet it had not taken off, so to speak. It had not yet been taken up by the forces of light, the forces of darkness. They are always trying to inject their own harmful input, like all sorts of side effects exerting a destructive influence on the person at the center of the dream and on other people too. My thoughts were dashing along ever so quickly, but the forces of darkness were like were still pe keeping pace. They had left many of their other earthly affairs in their attempt to concentrate their devices on my dream. But then I came up with something. I outwitted them, and I caused all their devices to turn about and work for the good. The forces of darkness lost their bearing for less than a split second, but that was enough for my dream to be snatched up by the forces of light and transported into radiant infinity well beyond their sight and reach. And just what did you come up with, Anastasia? Unexpectedly for them, I extended just a little the dark force window. I extended just a little the dark force window of time. The time will need to meet the various challenges. In doing so, I deprived myself of the possibility of using my ray to help you. They were confounded, failing to see any logic on my part. And during this moment, I very quickly shone my light on the people who will be in touch with you in the future. And what does all this mean? People will help you. People will realize my dream. They will do this with little rays of their own, which will be almost unco uncontrollable. But there will be a lot of them, 
and together you will make the dream come true in physical reality. You will be ac carried across the dark forces window of time, and you will carry others with you, which is happening now. The fall of the cabal. And becoming rich and famous will not make you greedy or arrogant, because you will understand that money is not the point. It will never buy you the warmth of a genuine compassion of the human soul. You will understand this when you make your way across that window of time, when you see and get to know these people, and they too will understand. And for the deep knee bends, this kind of relationship with the banks is something I also thought of because you are together negligent in taking care of your body. At least you will be getting some exercise whenever you withdraw money from your account. Some of the bank officials will do it too, besides. And never mind if it looks a little funny, it means you will find yourself free from the sin of pride. So it has turned out that all these challenges and trials which the forces of darkness have concocted in their window of time will serve to strengthen and you and those around you. All this will increase your sense of conscious awareness and it will ultimately save you from the dark temptations they are so proud of. Their own actions will save you. This is why they lost their bearings for a split second. Now they will never be able to catch up to my dream. Anastasia, my dear precious dreamer, my fantasy maker. Oh, how good of you to say that. Thank you, thank you. It was so good of you to say, my dear. You are welcome, but you will see. I also called you a fantasy maker, a dreamer. You are not offended? Not at all. You do not know yet how accurately my dream always comes true. When they turn out so clearly and in such detail, this one will become true without fail. It is my favorite dream, the clearest of them all. And the book you write will come into being and people will start having extraordinary feelings and these feelings will call people to action. Wait, Anastasia, you're getting carried away again. Calm down. Only a short time had gone by before my interruption of Anastasia's fever and stream of speech, which seemed indeed but a fantasy. I couldn't quite grasp the significance behind the monologue of hers. Everything she said sounded too fantastic. Only a year later, editor of the magazines, Wonders of and Adventures, after reading my manuscript containing the monologue, excitingly handed me the latest issue of his magazine, the issue of May 1996. The contents of the magazine overwhelmed me with excitement. Two major scholars, both academians, um, talked in their articles about the existence of a supreme mind, the close relationship of man in the universe, as well as about certain rays, invisible to normal sight, emanating from man. Scientists have now been able to identify them with special equipment, and the magazine included two photographs of these rays emanating from people. But science has only began to talk about what Anastasia has not only known from childhood, but has been applying in her daily life in her endeavors to help others. How was I to know a year earlier that this girl standing before me in an old skirt, the only one she had possessed, and uncomfortably looking galoshes, Nervously picking at the bottom buttons on her cardigan, this girl named Anastasia actually possessed a vast store of knowledge as well as the ability to influence human destinies. Of that, the pulse beats of her soul are in fact capable of counteracting the dark forces and destructive threatening man that are, the dark and destructive forces threatening mankind, or that the well-known Russian healer would tell a gathering of his assistants that we are all ants compared to her, adding that the world has not yet known a power greater than hers, and regretting that even after spending such a long time with her, I still do not understand her. Many people were to feel energy of tremendous power emanating from the book. Following the first small-scale printing of this book, for which I have to give credit to Anastasia herself as one author, would come a sprinkling of verses in abundance, washing away dirt like a spring rain. Now, dear readers, this is the very book which you are holding in your hands and which you are reading at this moment. Whatever feelings it is arousing in your heart is for you alone to judge. What do you feel? What is it calling upon you to do? Staying there alone in her glade in the Tayega, Anastasia will use her ray of goodness to eliminate any barrier standing in the way of her dream and she will gather and inspire more and more newcomers to make her dream come true. And so, at my challenging moment, three Moscow students will come to my side and stand by me, 
They will not receive any significant compensation for their efforts and will even end up helping me financially. Earning their living whenever they can, they especially will spend nights keyboarding the Anastasia texts on their computers. They will not cease their keyboarding work even after their difficult examination sessions begin. And Moscow printed n print shop number 11 will put out 2,000 copy print run. They will do this on their own by passing a publishing house. But even before this, the journalist uh, of the agriculture paper, and there, there's, these are names, but I can't read them, will be the first to tell about Anastasia in the, pe in the press. Later, Katya from Moss, whatever, um, can't read that. The magazine, can't read that, Wonders and Adventures, which publishes articles by the brightest light of Russia academia, will throw tradition to the wind and devote serial, several issues to Anastasia, explaining, in their boldest dreams, our academic comes nowhere near the insides of Anastasia, the wise woman of the Siberian Taiga. Purity of thoughts makes man omnipotent and omniscient. <laughs> omniscient. Man is the apex of creation. Anastasia will be published only by the major press outlets in Moscow. Anastasia herself seems to have made that choice in preference to the tabloids in careful effort to preserve the purity of her dream. But all this did not come, become clear to me until a year after my visit with her, not understanding her at the time and not fully believing I had my own take on the experience. And I tried to shift the conversation to a topic I was familiar with, namely entrepreneurs. Sorry, just a sec, I'm just seeing how long the chapter is. I think I'll try it, it's a bit long, but I'll do it. Chapter 28, Strong People. The highest evaluation of your personality comes from those around you. Anastasia talked a lot about the people we call entrepreneurs, about their influence on public spirituality, and then took a twig and drew a circle on the ground. Inside it, she drew many little circles, and with a dot in the middle of each one, off to the side, there were, were more circles. It was like a map of the planets around the Earth, and she kept adding still many more little circles inside and said, The large circles is the Earth. The planet inhabited by people, the little circles are small groups of people linked together into collectives. The dots are the people in charge of the, these collectives. The way these heads relate to the public in their group, what they make them do, what kind of psychological climate they create through their influence will determine whether the people around them fare well or poorly. If the majority fare well, a bright ray emanates from each of them and from the group is a whole from the group as a whole if poorly then the ray is dark and anastasia shaded in some of the circles making them dark naturally their inner state is influenced by the many other factors as well but in the space of time during which they are in this group the principal thing is their relationship with the person in charge for the universe is very important that a bright radiance should emanate from the earth the radiance of the light of love and the good. This is mentioned in the Bible as well. God is love. I feel sorry, very sorry for the people you call entrepreneurs. They are the most miserable of all. I would so much like to help them, but it is difficult for me to do that all by myself. You're mistaken, Anastasia. The most miserable people on the most miserable people in our society are the pris pensioners, people who can't find work, can't afford a roof over their heads or even food or clothing. An entrepreneur is someone who has all these things in greater abundance than other people. He has access to pleasures which others can't even dream about. What specifically, for example? Well, even if you take the average entrepreneur, he will have a modern car and apartment. He will not have any problem with food and clothing. And what about joy? What does he find satisfaction in? Come and see for yourself. Once again, Anastasia led, to the led me to the grass, and like the first time when she showed me the women the woman Dashnik, she began to show me other scenes. You see, there he is sitting right now in a car. You would call pretty snazzy, you see. He's sitting alone in the back seat and the car is air conditioned. It, it, it has his own microclimate, so to speak. His chauffeur is driving in it very smoothly. 
your chauffeur <laughs> is driving it very smoothly, but look and see how worried and pensive the entrepreneur sitting in the back seat is. He is thinking, working out plans. He is afraid of something. See, he has picked up what you call a telephone. He is upset. Yes, he has just received some news. Now he must quickly evaluate the situation and make a decision. He is all tensed up, thinking now he ha is ready and the decision has been made. Now look, look, he appears to be sitting peacefully, but his face betrays doubt and concern, and there is no joy. That's work, Anastasia. That is the way life is, and there is no respite, respite in it from the moment he wakes in the morning until the moment he goes to bed at night, or even in his sleep. And he sees neither the leaves unfolding, or the trees, nor the stream of spring. All around him are per perennially envious onlookers, desiring to have what he has, his attempts to fence himself off from these by what you call bodyguards, a house, more of a citadel, actually, do not bring any complete sense of peace, since fear and worry have crept in and will never and will forever remain with him. This goes on until his dying days, and he, and just before the end of his life, he feels a sense of regret that he is obliged to leave it all behind. An entrepreneur has his joys, I observe. They come when he obtains a desired result or fulfills plans he's thought up. Not true, Vladimir. He never gets to enjoy his acquisitions since along comes another plan immediately to take its place, a more complicated plan, and the whole process begins again from scratch, only with greater challenges. This forest princess painted me a rather sad and gloomy picture of our outwardly well-off social class, and this was not a picture I felt like accepting. I attempted a counter-argument. You forget, Anastasia, their ability to reach a set goal and obtain the good things in life, excited glance, glances from women, respect by people around them, to which she replied, Sheer illusions. There is nothing of the, of the sort. Where have you ever seen a respectful or even excited glance directed at a passenger in a snazzy car at the owner of the fanciest house in town? Not a single person will confirm that they have just said, these are but glances of envy, indifference, and irritation, and every woman cannot love these people, and even women cannot love these people, because their feelings is mixed in with their desire to possess not only the man, but his property too. The men, in turn, cannot re really love a woman, for there is no way they can free up enough room for such an important feeling. It was useless to look for further arguments, since what she said could be confirmed or couldn't be confirmed or refuted. Only the people she was talking about, as an entrepreneur myself, I never really thought about um, that. Anastasia was describing, never analyzed how many minutes of joy I actually experienced, and most certainly could not do this for any one else. For some reason, it is simply not accepted in entrepreneur circles to whine or complain. Everyone tries to show himself as successful and, contend with, and content with life. This is no doubt why most people hold the stereotype images of entrepreneurs as someone who has received more than his share of good things in life. Anastasia was perceiving not the external expressed feelings, but those which are more delicate and hidden in the inner recesses of one's heart. She was measuring a person's state of well-being by the amount of light she could detect in them. As to the scene and situation she was able to see, I felt I was picturing them more from listening to her. I mentioned this to Anastasia, and she responded. I shall help you now. It is simple. Close your eyes, lie down on the grass, hands out on the side, and relax. Picture in your mind the whole earth trying to see its color in the pale bluish glow, em glow emanating from it. Then narrow the focus of your imagination. Then narrow the focus of your imagination's ray so that it does not take the whole earth. Rather, make it narrower and narrower until you see concrete details. Look for people where the bluish light is stronger than in other people. Keep on narrowing your ray, and you will eventually focus on one person or a small group. Now try again, with my help. She took me by the hand, ran her fingers across mine, rested her fingertips on my palm. The fingers of her other hand, which was laying on the grass, were pointed upward. I went through in my mind all the steps she outlined and began to get fuzzy images of three people sitting at a table engaged in a lively conversation. 
I couldn't understand what they were saying as I wasn't picking up any voices at all. No, said Anastasia, those are not entrepreneurs. Wait a minute. We shall find some. She searched with her ray, peering into offices both large and small, private clubs, party celebrations, and bordellos. The bluish glow was either very weak or not there at all. Look, it was a nighttime here already, and this entrepreneur is sitting alone in a smoky office. Something is not right, but look at this that one, how content he looks in the swimming pool, surrounded by pretty girls. He is tipsy, but there is no glow. He is simply trying to run away from something. His feelings of self-satisfaction is artificial. This one is at home. There is his wife, and his little one is asking him something. The telephone is ringing. You see there, he has become serious again and pushes his family to the background. All sorts of situations become illuminated, one after another, some of them outwardly good, and some not so good, until we happen upon the most frightening scene. All at once appeared a room, probably in some apartment, quite nice-looking, but... On a round table lay a naked man, his hands and feet tied to a table, his head hanging over his mouth, covered with brown sticky tape. At the table were sitting two burly-looking youths, one of them with a close-shaven head and other with smooth, slick hair. A little distance away, under the floor lamp, there was a young woman in an armchair. Her mouth was also taped over, and she was tied to the chair with her linen sash bound tight around her wrists. Both her legs were tied to the chair legs. She was wearing nothing but a torn undergarment. Next to her was sitting a thin, wiry man. He was taking a drink of something possibly cognac. On the small table in the front of him lay a chocolate bar. The youths sitting at the table around were drinking. Weren't drinking. I could see them pouring some kind of liquid over the chest of the man laying on the table, vodka or pure alcohol, and set it alight. I, a break-in, I summarized. Anastasia shifted her way away from the scene, but I cried out, Go back! Do something! She went back to the scene and re replied, I cannot... It has already happened. This cannot be stopped now. It should have been stopped earlier, but now it's too late. I watched Spellbound and suddenly got a clear image, a clear glimpse of the woman's eyes, filled with sheer horror and not even pleading for mercy. Do something, I cried at to Anastasia. If you have any heart at all, do at least something. It's not within my power. Everything has been, so to speak, programmed in advance, but not by me. I cannot interfere directly. They have the upper hand right now. But where is that goodness of yours, your powers? Anastasia didn't say a word. The horrifying scene began to blur a little. Then the older men, who had been drinking the cognac, suddenly disappeared. All at once I felt a weakness through my body. I could also feel the arm Anastasia was touching start to grow numb. I could hear her somewhat weakened voice say, with evident difficulty in getting out of getting out the words, Take your hand away, Vlad. She couldn't even finish saying my name. I stood up and drew my hand away. My arm just hung there as if it were paralyzed, as happens sometimes when you get tingling sensation in your arms or legs, and went completely white. Then I wiggled my fingers a little, and numbness began to go away. I looked at Anastasia in shock. Her eyes were closed. The blush had drained from her cheeks, and it seemed as though she was. there was not a drop of blood left under the skin of her hand and face. She did not even seem to be breathing as she lay there. The grass for about three meters all around her had also become white and bent over. I realized something terrible had happened and I cried out, Anastasia, what's happening to you, Anastasia? But there was not even the slightest response to my cry. Then I grabbed her by the shoulder and shook her body, which was no longer supple, but had somehow grown, gone limp. There was no response. Her complete white bloodless lips remained silent. Can you hear me, Anastasia? She opened her eyelids ever so slightly and looked at me through her diamond, through her dimmed eyes, which had lost all their characteristic expressions. I grabbed a flask of water, lifted up Anastasia's head, and tried to give her something to drink, but she was unable to swallow. I looked at her feverishly, wondering what to do. At long last, she managed to move her lips just a tiny bit and to whisper, Carry me over there, to the tree. I lifted her limp body and carried it out to the circle of whitened grass and laid it down by the nearest cedar tree. 
In a little while, she started to come around, and I asked, What happened to you, Anastasia? I tried to fulfill your request, she quietly said, and a moment later added, I think I succeeded. But you look so bad. You almost died. I violated the natural laws. I interfered in something I should not have. That required all my strength and energy. I am surprised that they held out at all. Why did you take such a risk if you knew it was dangerous? I had no choice. After all, you wanted me to do something. I was afraid that if I did not fulfill your request, you would lose all respect for me. You would think that all I could do is talk, that I am all words, and that I could not do anything in real life. Her eyes looked at me inquiringly and pleadingly. Her soft voice trembled a little as she spoke. But I cannot explain to you how to do it, how this natural system works. I feel it, but I cannot explain to you in a way you could understand, and your scholars probably will not be able to explain it either. She bowed her head, fell silent for a while, as though mustering her strength. Then she looked at me once more with pleading eyes and said, Now you are going to be even more persuaded that I am a normal or a witch. All at once I felt a tremendous urge to do something good for her. But what? I wanted to tell her that I did consider her a normal human being, a beautiful and intelligent woman. But in all honesty, I didn't feel about her the way I usually felt about women. And she, with an, that intuition of hers, would not believe me. And then I suddenly recalled her story about how she, how her great-grandfather customarily greeted her as a child, about how this old gray-haired fellow would stand on one knee before the little Anastasia and kiss her hand. I got down on one knee before Anastasia, grasped hold of her still pale and slightly cold hand, and kissed it and said, If you are indeed abnormal, then you are the best, the kindest and cleverest and most beautiful of all abnormal people ever. At long, t at long last, a smile once more aligned upon Anastasia's lips, and her eyes looked at me in gratitude. A rosy blush was coming back to her cheeks. Anastasia was quiet, quite... Anastasia, that was quite a depressing scene. Did you choose it deliberately? I was looking for something good, just as an example, but I could not find anything. They are all, they are all held in the grip of their worries and cares. They are constantly facing their problems all alone. They have practically no spiritual communication. So what can be done? What can you suggest apart from pitying them? And I should tell you, these are strong people, these entrepreneurs. Very strong, she agreed, and most interesting, it is as though they are living two lives in one. One life is known only to them and not even their family, while the other is an outward life, which people around them see. They can only be helped through increasing their sincere spiritual communication with each other. They need to strive with complete sincerity for purity of thought. Anastasia, in all probability, I, will, I shall try to do what you have asked, and I shall try to write a book and establish an organization of entrepreneurs with pure thoughts, but only in a way that I can understand. It'll be difficult for you. I shall not be able to offer you sufficient help. I have little strength left. It will take a long time for my strength to recover. For a time, I shall not be able to see at a distance with my ray. I am having difficulty seeing you right now with my ordinary eyesight. Don't tell me you're going blind, Anastasia. I think it will, it will get better, only it's a pity that for some time I shall not be able to help you. You don't need to help me, Anastasia. Just try to keep yourself, your son, and help other people. I need to leave to catch up on my ship. After waiting until she had started to regain her small, normal appearance, I got into the motorboat. Anastasia took hold of the bow of her with her hand and pushed the boat away with, from the shore. The boat was swept up and began floating downstream with the current. Anastasia stood in the water almost up to her knees. The hem of her long skirt got wet and flapped about in the waves. I got the starting cog... I got the starting cord... I gave the starting cord a tug. The motor roared into life, breaking the silence I had grown accustomed to over the past three days. The boat gave a jerk forward, picking up at more and more speed, and soon began to distance itself from the diminutive figure of the Tyaga, reckless, standing all alone in the shallow water near the river bank. All at once, Anastasia rushed out of the water and started running along the bank after the boat. 
her long hair trailing behind her from the headwind looked like a comet's tail. She tried to run very fast, probably using up all her remaining strength in an effort to do the impossible, catch up with a speeding motorboat, but even she wasn't up to that. The distance between us gradually increased. I started feeling sorry for her fruitless efforts. Wanting to shorten the difficult moments of parting, I pushed down on the gas lever with all my might. Then the thought flashed through my head that Anastasia might think that I have, I had taken fright once more and was running away. The motorboat, now roaring in bursts, lifted the boat's bow out of the water, making its speed forward faster and faster, increasing the distance between us even more. As for her, oh Lord, what was she doing? Anastasia ripped off the wet skirt that was slowing her down and cast aside her torn clothes. She increased her tempo, and the incredible happened. The distance between her and the boat gradually began to decrease. On the path ahead of her loomed a steep slope, leading to an almost vertical drop-off. Continuing to press the gas lever to the limit, I thought that the incline would stop her in her tracks and bring this difficult episode to a quick end. But Anastasia continued her headlong rush, occasionally stretching out her arms in front of her, as, long, as though using them to sense the space ahead. Could it be that her eyesight had become so poor that she couldn't see the slope? Without slowing down in the least, Anastasia ran straight up to the slope. Reaching the top, she fell on her knees, threw up her arms toward the sky, turned slightly in my direction, and began shouting something. I could hear her voice over the wild roar of the motor and the noise of the waves. I heard as though in a whisper, There are shallows ahead, shallows ahead, sunken logs. I quickly jerked my head forward, not, only, not fully able to grasp what was happening, and gave such a hard pull on the rudder that the lower side of the sharply tilted boat almost submerged to the point of taking on water. A huge sunken log one end grounded in a sandbar and the other barely visible on the surface, lightly scraped against the side of the speeding boat. If it had been a direct hit, it would easily have torn a gaping hole in the thin aluminum bottom. Once out in mid-channel, I turned to glance at the cliff and whispered in the direction of the lonely figure standing on her knees, which was slowly being transformed into a vanishing dot. Thank you, Anastasia. Chapter 29. Who are you, Anastasia? The ship was waiting for me at Sturgut. Sturgut. The captain and the crew were awaiting my instructions, but there was no way I could concentrate my efforts on working with the subsequent initiary and order the ship's crew to continue standing in port at Sugart, hold parties for the local population to come and have a good time, and keep up the promotion and sales exhibits. My thoughts were occupied with my experience with Anastasia. At a local shop, I purchased a great deal of popular science literature, books on extraordinary occurrences and people, unusual abilities, as well as the history of Siberia. I, I squirreled myself away in my cabin, trying to find in all these books some sort of plausible explanation. In addition, I wondered whether Anastasia's shouting of, I love you, Vladimir, in her attempt to help the village girl, could have really engendered in her a feeling of love for me. How is it that mere words which were often uttered without a, without putting a significant, oh gosh, a sufficient amount of suitable feeling into them, could have affected Anastasia in spite of the difference in her ages and views of life and lifestyle? The popular science literature gave me no clues. Then I picked up the Bible, and there it was, my answer at the very outset of the Gospel, according to John. I read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. For the umpteenth time, it, stuck in, it struck me how laconic and precise were the definitions of this amazing book. Immediately, a lot of things became clearly in my, clear in my mind. Anastasia, incapable as she was of trickery or deceit, could not just simply utter meaningless words. I remembered her saying, it seemed as though I had forgotten at that moment that it was not enough to just simply utter these words. There definitely had to be behind them feeling and awareness, trustworthiness, or natural information. Oh God, how disappointing her hopes had turned out. 
why had she addressed these words to me? Here I was, no longer in her, my prime, someone with a family, enslaved to a great many of these worldly temptations, dark and destructive, as she herself said. With her degree of inner pu purity, she deserves someone else entirely. But who could fall in love with her, given such an extraordinary lifestyle, mentality, and intellect? At first glance, she comes across as an ordinary girl, albeit extremely beautiful and attractive. But once you get to know her, it is as though she is transformed into some kind of creature living way beyond the bounds of the, of the rational. It may very well be that this impression of mine is due to my imperfect knowledge of things, my sufficient, insufficient understanding of what constitutes our being. Others might have an entirely different perspective on her. I recalled that even at our parting I did not feel any particular desire to kiss or embrace her. I don't know whether she would have wanted me or to or not. Anyway, what exactly did she want? I recalled her telling me of her dreams. What a strange philosophical bent her, her love had. Organize a fellowship of entrepreneurs to help them. Write a book, passing along her advice to people. Carry people across the dark forces window of time. And she believed it all. She is convinced that that's how it will all turn out. Oh, I was a good one. I promised I would try and organize a fellowship of entrepreneurs and write a book. Now she'll probably be having even more fantastic dreams about that. She might have thought of something simpler, more realistic. An inexplicable, an inexplicable sense of pity for Anastasia rose in my heart. I could imagine her sitting there in her forest, waiting and dreaming that everything would work out that way in, a, in broad daylight. Fine if she were simply content to wait and dream. But who knows, she may go beyond that and start taking steps on her own, focusing that ray of goodness of hers, expending the colossal energy of her heart, and believing in the impossible. And even though she showed me what she could do with her ray and attempt to explain to me how it works, somehow my consciousness still can't accept it as something real. Judge for yourself, dear readers. In her own words, she aims her ray at a person, illuminates this person, this man, with an invisible light and imparts on him her feelings and inspiration aspirations toward goodness and light no 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 not not just think that i am interfering with the person's mental makeup that i am violating his heart and mind i remember her telling me man is free people are free to accept or reject my advice only to the degree that they themselves find it to their liking something close to their heart they will be able to accept these feelings as their own. Then they will make become lighter and brighter in their appearance too, and your diseases will leave them either partially or completely. My grandfather and great-grandfather can do this, and I have always been able to. Great-grandfather taught me when he played with me in my childhood, but now his ray has become many times, but now my ray has become many times stronger than grandfather's and great-grandfather's because in me has been born that extraordinary feeling called love. It is so bright and clear and even a little fiery that there is such a lot of it and I want to share it. With whom, Anastasia, I had asked? With you, with others, with anyone who can accept it. I want everyone to experience good. When you begin to do that, what I have dreamt of, I shall bring many of these people to see you and together you Remember all this picturing pictured her no <sighs> remembering all this picturing her in my mind, I suddenly realized that I couldn't help but carry out at least try to carry out her wishes. If I didn't, I would be tormented with doubt for the rest of my life, along with the feeling that I had betrayed Anastasia and her dream. Perhaps her dream wasn't all that realistic, but it was something she passionately desired. I made my decision, and the ship headed full steam to Novisburg. The unloading and dis in disassembling of the exhibit equipment I left to my firm's executive director. After somehow managing to explain the situation to my wife, I set out to Moscow. I set out to Moscow to make, or at least try to make, Anastasia's dreams come true. To be continued. Very long, but I'm going to try again. Just a moment. 
Now my voice is totally going worse. Chapter 30. Author's Message to the Readers. Dear readers, thank you. Thank you all who have responded to Anastasia with kindness and understanding. Indeed, I could not imagine that she would actually be capable of arousing so many feelings and emotions. I would like to answer all your letters individually, but for the first time, being at least this is physically impossible, the last lines of this book were penned in the Caucasus, where I have joined local archaeologists and enthusiasts in investigating the dolmens Anastasia spoke about, and we found them, saw them with our own eyes, took pictures. These are ancient stone constructions 10,000 years old. They have functional significance even for people living today. They are located in the south in the mountain of Kakas, not far from the city of Novosburg. They are the precursors of the pyramids of Egypt, but the local residents didn't pay any attention to the dolmens, not appreciating their purpose. Even though the dolmens were classified as historic monuments, they were ransacked by the local population. Their huge stones were carted off and even used to build a church in the settlements of Bergovovo, whatever. Um, she didn't actually mention dolmens in this book. It's another book, which to me is nothing short of sheer blasphemy. Perhaps it was for this reason that 40 priests were cruelly tortured to death in the Cuban re religion during the revolutionary period of Russian history, where the priest for each dolmen stone, people carried these stones off, not fully appreciating their significance. Now that Anastasia has spoken about them, all this will change. It is amazing, but a fact. Much of what she has said has already confirmed, and even the fluctuations she talked about and the backward radi radiation of the earth fluctuating near the dolmens have been detected and reported on by local health officials. Out of all the things Anastasia told or showed to me, I have decided to publish only what has been directly or indirectly corroborated by scientific experiments, material objects, or historical facts, though I am starting to think that we'd better simply listen some more to, with our hearts. It would be quicker with that way. The other method of confirmation, taken up an awful lot of time, as with the dolmens, for example. It took me pretty much half a year to collect historical data and trek through the Caucasus Mountains to see the dolmens with my own eyes and take pictures of them. I was finally convinced, but at the end of the day, it turned out that I'd simply believed right off I could have used this half a year of greater advantage. It turns out that a great deal depends on one's ability to believe. I did get a chance to visit Anastasia a second time. I got a chance to see the son she bore and how she relates to him as most unusual relationships. A most unusual relationship. In addition, I had the opportunity of finding out from the people who ferried me to the spot of the river bank about the various attempts on part of both individuals and groups to penetrate Anastasia's domain and find her dwelling place for themselves. Many no doubt wished to see and talk with her out of well-meaning motives. But the people who ferried me also told me about a group of scoundrels who set up a camp in the river bank sent out helicopters to take pictures of the area, tried to capture her. She was obliged to emerge from the Tayega to talk with them, and then send them packing, despite their attempt to restrain her physically. I shall tell you all about that in the second book. I only ask people not to touch her, to leave her alone. Now, after the experience with these rout routers, local hunters have taken it upon themselves to shoot strangers on sight. That's bad, of course, but I say, let them shoot. It turns out the local hunters knew about her existence long before I came along, only they never told anyone, and they never encroached upon her territory themselves. The locals talked with her only when she came out to them. I started having pangs of conscience of for having told about her without hiding the location, especially in the first edition of the book, and for not changing the names of people I mentioned, or even the names of the ship. Anastasia calmed my fears a little when she said, Never mind, after all, I was the one who wanted to reveal myself to everybody, but I'm wiser now. I shouldn't have mentioned specific names, and in future I shall try to be more uh, circumspect. But I still want to emphasize, please don't disturb her. She herself will tell everybody she feels is necessary to reveal. We must not do to her what we have done already to one Siberian family, the Lykovs dead end of the Tayega. As far as I know, the only member of this family remaining in Agafia, 
who is dying of cancer, left helpless, taken out the Tyaga. A real tragedy how things have turned out. The Laika family lived in the Tyaga for many years, but died out after contact with our enlightened civilization. Which way of life, then, is the real dead end? I can understand why so many people want to contact Anastasia, but it is, it is impossible for her to meet and talk with everyone. And after all, Anastasia does have a young child. There is an Anastasia club or community organization operating in Gelsenhick, headed by Valentina, an ethro ethnographer of 30 years experience. She has organized a group of local ethnographers along with people from a variety of professions who are sensitive to the spiritual legacy of their journey and its ecological problems. This was not the one of the first clubs to be organized by the readers of the Anastasia book. The members of the Galznik Club have made what is, to my mind, a remarkable discovery on the basis of information provided by Anastasia. They have restored to Russia, and quite possibly to the world, the forgotten shrines of our ancestors and are now receiving people wishing to visit them and conducting tours to the places Anastasia mentioned. About Galznik, for example, Anastasia had said this, had this to say, this city could have been richer than Jerusalem or Rome, but because of its rulers' neglect of its primal origins, this city is dying. I believe this, and the other cities and sediments will be restored, not by the rulers of the world, but by the hearts of the ordinary people aroused by Anastasia. And there's more. Anastasia is now the subject of conversation among many healers, wizards, preachers. We are like ants compared to her, said the chairman of the Healer Foundation. I have seen video recordings of speeches given in front of a large audience by the leader of religious dominion, in which he referred to Anastasia as the ideal womanhood to which we should aspire. He added her ability to draw inter inf inferences and conclusions and level of intellect far surpassing that of our population today. This video is now being copied and distributed. Much of the same type of reactions is coming from people with extraordinary abilities living in India. Still another religious leader said that Anastasia is currently studying our life. She has not yet managed, unfortunately, to meet up with a real man. Later I was told that there is one chap very much like Anastasia living in Australia, and that the two should meet. I, of course, do not have any preten pretensions to being a real man, far from it, even in my thinking, but perhaps it is still premature to think in terms of arranged m a marriage and that isn't right to idolize her in such an extent. It is this idealism of Anastasia that has prevented a timely recognition of what she has done. Just think calmly and rationally about what has happened. A child had been born, and I have held him in my arms. I have heard his little heart beating. There is a child. He is growing up. But he has no official birth certificate. He will grow up and want to go somewhere. Maybe abroad, for instance. Maybe he'll want to see the world. Who will issue him a passport to travel abroad? What country is he a citizen of? What shall we tell him then? Oh well. You know, somehow we haven't thought about any documents for you. You just stay here in the Tayega. I checked with the legal firm and the question of the birth certificate. The lawyer said Anastasia would have had to give birth in a hospital. Even Then even if she didn't have a medical record, they could have at least issued her a memo regarding the birth, which she could have used to obtain a proper birth certificate. The other alternative, said the lawyer, would be for her to abandon her child to an orphanage. They would also issue him a document there. Orphanages can do that, and then have him adopted. But somehow this alternative was not at all appealing, and I doubt that Anastasia would ever agree. So what to do? When I talked with her about a birth certificate, she responded, of course it would be fine if one had if he had one just like everyone else i suppose i let this slip by without really thinking about it but do not be concerned everything will work out not note how she said i suppose i let that slip by without really thinking about it i wonder how many other things she let slip by things which could be taken care of at a future stage that means we can't really count on everything working out exactly the way she said I think we need to examine it all very carefully and at some point make adjustments to adapt it to our reality. On another point, I, heard, I hear her talk about what a poor entrepreneur I am. 
I'm not able to print enough copies to keep pace with the demand. I hear talk about it from others, not from her. Ideally, I can't really, I really can't at the moment. I have refused to sell exclusive rights to the book to, to any other publisher. I certainly don't want anyone to have exclusive control over the manuscript and put out whatever print runs they fancy, like the black books when watered down. He even, Vladimir even said that it was done without his permission. The publisher I talked with gave me this. The style needs to be edited and made more literary. It was in its present form. It is only Anastasia's explanation and monologues that make the book worth anything at all. My language is seen as stilted, and they suggested I think up a catchier title, something like Dead End in the Taiga, The Healer Girl, or even The Girl from Outer Space. But I did not consider Anastasia to be from outer space, nor did I consider her to be a dead end in the Taiga. She herself, after all, simply wants to be man, a normal human being. Of course I can always exercise my author's privilege in confrontation with publishing houses, but a lot of the time would be wasted on that. I have been using the proceeds of the initiate, initial print run to pay for a subsequent runs in the print shop. By passing the publishing houses altogether, so things will even out in the long run. If someone is interested in assisting along this line, to our mutual advantage, I'd be happy to listen, but without the condition of exclusive rights. I should also say a few words about a certain situation involving my relationship with my family. The Moscow group now looking after distribution of the book has received a number of letters and telephone calls about this. There have been complaints that calls the letter to my home address indicating in the book that not have been met with my intelligible response. I left Novisburg, as I mentioned, directly upon my return from the expedition. Subsequent events will be described in my next book. Now I have learned from my firm is falling apart and that there is not anybody there to reply to inquiries. I'll see to it and bring it back to life once I finish my writing. And as for my wife, I have only spoken to her on the telephone. It was a deeply personal conversation. However, I beg my correspondent's forgiveness for not responding right off and for my delay in sending out copies of the books. At present, my daughter Paulina is there. I have met with her. She will fix everything up and in the future there should be no repetition of the trouble repetition of the trouble i have had a long talks with my daughter and she understands everything a little later i plan to get a mobile telephone and then i shall be able to chat with her more personally i shall definitely respond to all the letters coming in and maybe even publish them for of some of them they are worth publishing there are letters about russia about love about bright aspirations they show the same energy Al elena talks about in her book living ethics Thank you for these letters, but one letter in particular, the letter from a 13-year-old girl from Kolomina named Nat Nastaya, deserves to be answered right here and now along with other girls who have written and will be writing. Here is her letter. Dear Vladimir, my name is Nastia from the city of Kolomina. I am 13 years old and I am in grade 7 at school. I read your books, The Ringing Cedar. Anastasia, I really, really liked it. Not just liked, that's not the best word here. It sounds too dry. After reading the book, I got a warm and happy feeling in my heart. They told me a lot about it in the hospital. I've got a really serious illness, and I have to go to the hospital every two months, and I really want to get well, and your book was like a ray of light amidst all these darkness and vulgarity. I really want to meet with you, especially with Anastasia. Could you help me? Right now, you're probably thinking how brash and impolite she is, but that's not true. You see, that's the way we all are. Until we see with our own eyes, we don't believe anyone. I don't even know whether to believe or not. Mama doesn't believe, and no one around here believes. It is so fantastic, and yet why not? To be honest, I believe I really did put, but all my friends kept saying, fairy tale, fairy tale. I'm confused. Please help me. I think, I think you are a very brave man. You have written the truth. Maybe you haven't yet told the whole story, but you've told the part of it. That's for certain. What happened between you and Anastasia, the way you offended her, and then it turned out she wasn't to blame. All sorts of things. Yet still, I think you shouldn't offend a person that way, even if, let's say, she's abnormal or fake. But that's strictly my personal opinion. You may not agree with it. Vladimir, sorry I don't know your patriarchy. Did Anastasia have a child or not? And if she did, is it a boy or a girl? And what did your wife think of that? 
And my last question, you wrote it that Anastasia's grandfather and great-grandfather rubbed the piece of cedar with their fingers, but you never said that Anastasia did this too. Did she really not do it, or did you just happen to leave it out? Please answer me. I know you get a whole bag full of letters, but please, just a few lines. Goodbye. Dear Nastia, you will most likely, you will most certainly be a healthy, spiritual, strong, and pretty girl. I shall ask Anastasia the next time I visit her to help you. Yes, Anastasia has a unique approach to healing. She looks upon illness as a conversation between God and man. An illness can be a warning or a deliverance from something even more terrible. And she showed me examples of this. I'll be telling about them later in a new book. I shall try and persuade her, though she's pretty stubborn about sticking to her views. She says it's only man himself. Oops, sorry, I got lost. She says it's only man himself, through his spirit and conscious awareness, who can care, cure anything without negative side effects, while outside interference is often harmful. Nastia, judging by your reaction to the book, you seem to be already healthy spiritually than a, a lot of people, and that's the main thing. I'm beginning to realize that that's really the case. As far as whether people around you believe or don't believe in Anastasia's existence, I'll answer you by quoting what some one said to, at one of my get-togethers with readers. When that question was put to me for the upteeth time, he got up and declared in a loud voice, Look, people, you're holding in your hands an, an impulse of inspiration, a thought bursting forth, a call to action, an idea. It's right there in your hands. What more do you want? A sample of her blood, urine, and feces for analysis? Is there no way you can do without that? After all, the greatest and most important proof is already sitting right there in your hands. You see, Nastia, I've come to the realization that Anastasia is an uncomfortable concept for many, and they'd rather she didn't exist at all. After all, she's breaking down the whole lot of technocratic theories, conven conventions, and priorities against the background of purity emanating from her. We suddenly start to become aware of our own filth, and that's not always what we want, especially when we think. We like to think of ourselves as good and smart and con conscious no matter what we do. Anastasia said I exist for those of whom I exist. I didn't think there was anything special hidden in this statement. Anyone who wants to believe can believe. If they don't want to believe, they don't have to. However, I was mistaken. Some people read and nothing happens with them. Others, they find a great feeling of love and kindness and inspiration welling up in their hearts. And like a shower of spring rain, the world feels this grand poetry of love, poetry of the heart, which is capable of perceiving the light, magnifying and sharing it with others. These are the people who feel her and know that she does exist. As for my wife, Nastia, she reacted the way most women probably would. We've only spoken on the telephone, but my daughter, Polina, is ready to help me. She understands everything and brings me letters. She was the one who brought me yours. You say it was wrong on my part to offend Anastasia that way. Of course it's wrong. I would never do anything like that again. The same people can be different at different times, you know. Our son was born. He's such a strong lad. Smiles all, this, all the time, and Anastasia is happy and enjoying her life. My best to you and to your mama. I wish you joy and happiness in your life. You deserve it. You are a strong girl, and you could make friends happier too more consciously aware of things. A word about religious believers. Their inquiries and questions, I have spoken about Anastasia with members of the clergy from our Russian Orthodox Church, as well as with representatives of various de denominations. Some of them are quite favorable. Some of them are quite favorably disposed to her. Others say, with some apprehension, that she's most likely a heathen. She could break down people's faith in religious doctrine, or resurrect ideo ideology, or something nobody knows, knows about yet. And it's wrong for her to not be baptized. Her attitude to religion will be discussed in greater detail in the second book, and it is really quite extraordinary. I'll just mention a few points here. You see, she told me it's a good thing that there are already talking about a soul, 
about the good and the light. Who is the most worthy? I am unable to say. But what about the sex, I countered? The sex that have been banned. Now everyone says they took the wrong path, their actions were wrong. Do you think so? Then think of this. A group of soldiers is out of patrol, is out on patrol. One of them in the lead has broken off or gone to one side and gets blown up by a mine. Yes, you can say he took the wrong path, his actions were wrong, but you can also say that these same actions saved other people's lives. In any case, Anastasia with religion, do you think it's closest to you, the one most comprehensible? Vladimir, let us say you had never seen my parents or talked with them. You would probably be happy to hear anyone talk about them, even if they each talked about them a little differently. Where were the truth? Ugh, where the truth lies? You can judge for yourself after reflecting on everything inside you. After all, you are their offspring. You are your parents, child. As for me, though I do not need any intermediaries. Well, okay, that's enough about doubts. There are some rather pleasant phenomena that Anastasia has somehow managed to bring about in our reality. I was especially skeptical that she would actually be able to infuse something in the text of the book. These are her own combinations and rhythms, as she has said, coming from the depth of eternity. But after the first edition came out, in a run for only 4,000 copies, something incredible happened. Many people were so moved and feel by feelings and emotions that poetic verses began flooding in all my, all by themselves. There are a whole lot of them now. These are just ordinary people, not professional poets, who have been writing. There are enough poems to date to put in out a whole separate volume of them. I even wrote a bunch of poems after first reading this book. In the Moscow groups devoted to studying Anastasia's phenomena, they say that nowhere in the world, in the past or present, has there been a person or figure capable of provoking such a huge poetic outpouring in so short a time. Another surprising thing is that while in the first book there is almost nothing said about faith or Russia, the majority of readers' poems speak directly about faith and Russia and bright aspirations. And it seems to me they do this most inspiringly. And yes, and this had a calming effect on my thoughts about Anastasia's influence. After all, the Bible tells us how to distinguish the bad from the good, the false prophet from the bearer of truth. It says, by their fruit ye shall know them. And if Anastasia's aspiration and her combinations bring forth such radiant poetic feelings, those are undoubtedly good fruits. And I even thought, if this goes on much longer, she's going to turn half the population of Russia into poets, enamored of their motherland, the earth, and all nature around them. I sorted the poems in several categories, anonymous poems, signed poems, poems by soldiers, poems by government officials, and do you know what this kind of sorting shows? It shows that there is absolutely no point in dividing society up the way we sometimes do and blaming our trouble on certain categories of people like entrepreneurs and military government of officials, their hearts all beat in exactly the same way. And across all these categories, there are people sincerely striving for the light, for the good. As for our troubles, there's something we probably all produce by ourselves. In this edition of the book, I have decided to publish one poem from each category. Anastasia's Ray. Into our busy, bustling life, of lonely souls in crowds immersed from the vast universe of space, a ray broke through the earth. It glistened brighter than the light of the sun or of gold of purest hue. My people, greetings, here I am as your brother speaking to you. I have been sent to you by love, sent to you by the ages call. Come to me and take of mine, I give myself to all. Wait. There, my friends, where are you going? Why is there sadness on your face? You've been forsaken. Yes, I know. I know all, t all time and space. Dear people, what are you thinking, people? The world is beautiful, no end. I can do everything, dear people, because I am your friend. But the crowd only surged against the ray, rushing along 
on their fashion shod sheet and kept on showing it away into a puddle in the street. The ray it dipped into the dirty slush. It felt no difference and shed no tear. But all at once the slush burst forth in a water spring crystal clear. And then little a little boy came running, and fearing no punishment therein, he leapt feet first into the puddle and drew on the ray's sweet balm. Hi, Mama. Whoop. His mama got angry with despair and widely waved her arms in dread. But Pushkin's statue on the square suddenly came to life and said, Now wait, you must not spank the boy. He did not act just out of fun. Pay heed to him. Your hearts will be illuminated by your son. Come here and feel his moistened hands. Come close and touch your blessed son. You will find there in his palms all that the poets have sung. All they've created through the ages, reflecting there within the heart. Mama Machka, my mama, the little boy hugging his mom. Mama, can you hear the singing, hear the song of happy birds? You know, dear mama, yes, you know it. I shall write you a verse. And now you will be happy, mama, for that is what I want for you. You see, I hear it, I hear it. Think I can do it too. Into your busy, bustling life of lonely souls in crowds, immer in crowds immersed, from the vast universe of space, a ray broke through to the earth. Author unknown. In Russia, Megre wrote this brand new idea. In book publications and newspaper lines, the ringing cedars of Anastasia, which drew attention to himself at the same time. It's not the first time that his name I've heard spoken, and yet it's still not that common a name. And Anastasia, yes, Anastasia, so music evoking. Ostasia or Stacy, they all mean the same. The Stacys I know live in cities of shadows, their character simple of good honest worth, but here in the Tayaga in a cedar ringing meadow, I glimpsed a fair goddess, the fairest on earth. Anas, a Siberian of nature creation, in harmony with her environment's lives. Her conscious awareness, her love inspiration to animals, plants, all around her she gives. Her feelings and thoughts are in tune with the living, the mind of the cosmos is simple and clear. In all of our world, in all of our wide world, believe me, there's nothing escaping her knowledge of stars or light years. Clairvoyant as Anas cures disease at all stages. The great ringing cedar enhances her reach. She draws upon cultures of all lands and ages for logic and meaning and richness of speech. And an analysis practicing nature's ecology, her meaning of life is in tune with the world, intuitive grasper of highest astrology. There's nothing impossible for this precious girl. Got to adjust, got a squeaky chair. <clears throat> The Kind Wizard Girl. Gazeldex, dolmens, fill years, wind back, time has opened a window, just a crack. From the stretches of infinity to be understood, evaluated, felt through and through, recognized as fact, stepping over my threshold limit. Through the light of the good in the blue expanses, way up high, I come to you, Anastasia, born again in the twinkling of an eye. You are a flower of consciousness and will. You might from cedar trees and forest leaves. You are might. And from such charming, mystical, magical thoughts that I'm ready to be one who simply believes. Every beast and insect, uh, every beast and insect, raven and jays, every serpent blade of grass and hay. You wizard girl, kind maven of the way, so many roused by what you have to say. Your thoughts, ideas, even stronger now today. Shed light on all the earth and with their bright ray. Poem number four, Anastasia's Love. To the woman of my beloved. I shall pray for you, for you are loved, the woman of my own beloved. As his heart's desire, you will be blessed. You will be blessed as I wish for you the best. Keep him safe when he is strong or weak or brave. 
Keep him safe when he may irrationally behave. Keep him, keep my beloved safe and sweet. My days, it seems, have flashed by in a beat. Their crazy dance has burnt me with its heat. My years have started passing all to fleet. My son has started walking on his feet. Your papa is the very best, my son the very best. It is I do not, it is I who do not manage to open up to him. In life, my son, that can happen on a whim. Another woman takes his fancy and steps in. You are both caressed by the gentle breeze of spring, which tells me in the whisper of the leaves how he feels the warmth, how he feels the joy. Both from your hands and from your lips, I shall not dare distract him from the warmth and tenderness of your eyes. But should not, but the, should that not be enough, I shall send you a ray of sunlight to relieve you of your grief. The years will fly past just like a stormy night, like will seem to you like an empty room. I, as a fading star falling on earth from above, shall Kate shall chase from your soul the nighttime gloom, and I shall be able to pray, please do believe, so that you, by the light ray loomed, need feel no withering love. I shall be able to pray for you for love. I shall be able to pray for you are loved, the woman of my own beloved. Poem five to Anastasia. To woman I dedicate this verse. I write as an Air Force flyer, a poet I could never be, but my heart flared true. My breast with fire did burst, Anastasia. Do not think me brash, I can't stop loving you. Your image, a touching pulse for good, pulsing louder than any engine ever could. My engine failed, visibly nil, an explosion in the twinkling of an eye. But then your ray of light, your image flashed and blessed. On fragile wings it kept me in flight. A single moment it took. Only one, I wished as I looked until my landing gear touched safely down. There I were, a blade of grass upon the ground, by your fingers tenderly caressed. <laughs> Poem number six. Cedar Forest, Rings and Chimes, by Vladimir Megri. Ah, the fragrance of Siberian cedars, the smell of resin very strong, the Taiga vast, almost half a globe sweeping, stretching to one grand endless song. The cedars keep peace, seem time of old, maintaining the energy of the earth to brighten the pulse beat of the soul. They ring for all mankind these words. Here dwells among us Anastasia, in spiritual purity's forest art. She watches over Mother Russia through people's holiness of heart. She sends out thoughts and calls to action to the highest leading to heavenly light. The essence of Vels, Krishna, Rama, Shiva, Buddha, Allah, Christ. These holy thoughts, the star bright logos, old Russian purity through theme, their theme, are flying like snowstorms calling the ages to penetrate on the heart of the dream. With me, our force of light, unchanging i exist for all who walk and plod i give to all a bright awakening whom do not turn their back on god bow before holy russia's leading bow to her gods our creators above in the never ceasing ring of the cedars which defy the light as love so russian churn and with your soul pay heed to all that heaven gives on the river of Lena, Yana and Ob, God's temple of all the Russian of all Russia lives. Step out on the upward road to the light, the cosmic self proclaiming path discern. Sorry, the cosmic self programming path discern. We look to our goals as the answer of all right. So Russia may to her gods return. Preserver of the cosmic energy of nature, the ringing cedars waits for the one who loves his Russia as God the Savior, whose hardest course for others has run. Then live in peace and love for nature. Brook no dishonesty, live ar aright. Draw wisdom's radiance from the people's favor and show to others the path to light. Such people are called by Anastasia to accept my energy's gentle load so that the bright forces attentive idea may help those climbing up the road. 
The cedars call everyone to hope for the prize, on the path to divinity of beauty's gleam. Awaken, my people, open your eyes, reach out to others, to the heart of the dream. The cosmic expanse open wide its door to awaken pilgrim on their climb. To those united on their upward course, the whole cedar forest rings and shines. Poem seven, the goddess, or sorry, two goddesses. Do not come here to see my shame or think with mute reproach to bless, nor hand nor secret stared can claim to lift the cross from my poor chest. No earthbound cry will scare away the soul of heavenly confusion. It will not light the holy ray of mind and feelings interfusion. The world is full of sun and storm, a finger snaps and love's fired too. Her ashes flame, blood, tears are born, where mind is false but feeling true. Wild honey becomes bitter, surely, no sweetness from the wormwood's bloom, pretending pretenders will not grasp the worldly, the afterlife the wise will doom. All stories, letters, poems, flowers will awaken the heavenly blue. I see two goddesses, two powers, these are my poetry and you. Verse should not be debased as phantom. It will not see a final breath. You are immortal, you are random, in poems just like birth and death. Chapter 31, author's message to entrepreneurs, which isn't really a chapter, but you know, I'm funny like that. <laughs> Especially misreading chapter titles. How many times? The author's attempt to organize a fellowship of Russian entrepreneurs in accord with the certain spiritual principles has revealed an evident desire for such a coming together on the part of many entrepreneurs. Notice were sent out all over Mos Moscow, a wider distribution throughout Russia would have entailed a substantial expenditure. The lack of funding and consequently the ultimate failure of the project led to nowhere. Anastasia's plan began to seem unreasonable. Un unrealizable. <sighs> During my second visit with her, however, she told me that there were no dead-end situations, only that I should not have altered the sequence she had prescribed. The book should have come first, which would have spread the right information and prevented the organization principles from being tied to monetary concern. The second visit also settled one other question. As the organizational task force had, set, had been set up in Moscow to spearhead the formation of the fellowship, but we could not come to a decision on either the selection criteria for new members or how the selection committees should be con constituted. Anastasia stated the following, One's heartfelt impulsion and one's aspiration to strive for such a fellowship are the principal criteria for eligibility. Nobody has the right to refuse access to anyone's manifesting such qualities. One must re record it's irrelevant for the one who must worthy yesterday may well turn out to be the least worthy today and vice versa. Subsequent can never read this word or pronounce it. Subsequently, when you get together to determine the eligibility criteria according to the impulse of your hearts, you will also be able to work out the specific term in which applications are accepted into the fellowship. The blame for altering the sequence prescribed by Anastasia's fails of course on me. To all those Moscow entrepreneurs who wanted to join the fellowship, I hereby offer my sincere apologies. First, for postponing the initial conference uh, to a later date, and secondly, for the consequent drain on your time and finances. The task force was indeed made up by dedicated entrepreneurs. Many of you had limited time to devote to the project, but you found the time to stole it from something else. You worked on drafting documents and principles for the future society. The secretarist, too, similarly made up. Moscovites was fueled by enthusiasm. In addition, Moscow students put together a magnificent computer version of the future society catalogs. It made it all the more painful for me to look back on once I realized my mistake and see the hopelessness of the situation. The only way out was to muster the strength needed to correct the mistakes and write the book. Without a word and explanation to anyone, explanation seemed impossible at that point. I went off by myself and began to write. 
it was it was only now that the book existed it was only now that the book exists and is spreading more and more right across Russia and starting to fulfill the function specified for it by Anastasia that I can talk about the future. I am more confident now about the possibility of seeing such a society actually come into being. The reaction of the book indicated that it will attract a significant number of entrepreneurs from the various regions of the country. A conference will take place. There will be a fellowship. In acting on my own, I may well have offended some of those who worked alongside me in Moscow. I should particularly like to uh, single out three Moscow students who gave their all to assisting and participating in the Secretariat of the Future Society. They were the ones who keyboard the text of the first book on their computer and kept on keyboarding even after their exam session started. I wasn't in position to compensate them for their work. They knew this, understood the situation, but still went on keyboarding. Others, too, would have probably reacted with understanding had they known the whole picture. If that applies to any of you, I apologize for my lack of trust in you and for temporary disappearance. Of course, there is a great deal more I need to learn and understand, including the degree in which Anastasia herself has been involved in all this. I'd like to know, I'd like to know just how this reclusive w young woman from the Siberian Taiga managed not only to draw up plans like these, but also to have them implemented in real life. It's not that she is predicting the future, she is literally creating the future. She struggles to bring it about and feels the struggles in her heart. In fact, it is something in the order of a master business plan, which she, was, which she has formulated in her head, keeping track of all its detail down to the nuance of psychology probabilities, of psychological probabilities. She is working her hardest to make it come about and calling on us by participa to participate in its realization. But we are not simply blind mice, but normal professionally experienced adults. And we must understand that a single individual, especially one still relatively new to entrepreneurial practice, cannot foresee everything ahead of time. Anastasia affirms. Just the organization alone, the spiritual, yes, spiritual con contact among such people as entrepreneurs is a salutary reaction to the cosmic proportions. Salutary to reaction to the cosmic proportions. There is no need to dedicate, ugh, there is no need to dictate what will happen next. What will happen next will point out its own path and set its priorities to the occurrence of daily life. What kind of reaction is this? What path is she alluding to? Even though her aspirations to the light can be felt intuitively, nevertheless, we must make sense of everything ourselves and work out the detail. I wish you all the happiness and success. Oh, my nose is running suddenly. Along with me constantly Getting words wrong, you're now going to get to listen to me sniffing. <laughs> Dreams coming true. Editors afterward. In the summer of 19 1996, I tried looking. Man, a tired-looking man was standing on the street corner in downtown Moscow with a half with a self-published 96-page volume in his hands, trying to sell it to passerby. The book's title was *The Ringing Cedar Anastasia* and the man called himself Vladimir Megri. A woman stopped by, looked at this inconspicuous cover, talked to the author, and bought a copy. Next day, she was back, smiling her eyes, shining, to pick up an entire pack to give to everybody she knew. As it was, the first print ran for... The first print run of 2,000 copies of Anastasia sold out in a matter of weeks. What happened next was a miraculous as the story Vladimir Megri had written down. New print runs first of 2,000, then of 10,000 sold out within weeks. Not long afterward, millions more were printed and sold. By 1999, Vladimir Megri was one of the Russia's most popular authors and the seven books published to date have sold over 10 million copies in our original Russia alone. Not counting their translated editions in more than a dozen languages, the books in the Ringing Cedar series started producing incredible changes in people's hearts and minds, the effects of which is now being felt throughout Russia and beyond. What happened here? How can it be that, with no advertisement other than word of mouth, this body of 
This, bo this book by an unknown author became a national, then an international bestseller, distributed internationally by readers alone before it was accepted by even a single bookstore. How can it be that one copy from this first 2000 copy print run actually found its way to the stacks of the U.S. Library of Congress? <laughs> there you go, there's a sniffing. <laughs> Why have people of all ages, from the school children to pensioners, and in all walks of life, from teachers to public of officials, and from scientists to clergymen, felt such inspiration from the book to the point of writing poetry and creating works of art? Why did a former member of the Russian parliament, an economist by the name of Dr. Vikor, write an entire book, Putin, Meager and Russia's future, starting that stating that the ringing cedars was becoming Russia's new national idea. Why did the supreme mufti, a Russia talgat, oh my gosh, I can't say that, publicly declared in the television interview, "I love these books. I read them and I get a, a I read them and get a lot out of them by for myself. Why have readers of other?" confessions of others confessions made equally laudatory remarks why did my mother who once bring home a copy of anastasia from her yoga class in the recommendation of her instructor and gingerly requested that i read it why then applying and to enter the doctoral program in forestry at six top rated american universities i submitted a research proposal based on the idea set forth by anastasia I was accepted by all of them. Four of the schools, in fact, offered me full financial support with a scholarship. And here I am now at the University of Missouri at Columbia, writing my PhD dissertation on the significance of ideas from the ringing cedars for the future of forestry and agriculture in Russia and the world as a whole. But here comes the most striking part. How can it all be that all these developments from the wild, popularity of the Ringing Cedar series to the outpouring of readers' poetry and art had been described in the very first book before coming to pass. As it is true to what Anastasia said in the first volume, millions of people have been moved by her words and many thousands have planted trees, written poetry and songs, or created works of art. Sorry, I'm suddenly crying. <laughs> All inspired by the book. Readers Club have profilera profilerated throughout Russia and abroad. Numerous readers conference throughout Russia and Europe have brought together thousands of people asking questions they have never even thought of before. In just the scant few years since the book initial publication, Russia was, has witnessed the birth of a powerful eco village movement, inspiring thousands of people to leave their jobs in large cities and, despite formidable obstacles, move to one of the many eco-settlements now sprouting all over the country. Russian immigrants to Germany, Americans and Canadians have been flocking back to their homeland to establish new self-sufficient homesteads on their ancestors' land. In the eco-village, large in, in the eco-village where lo my family now owns a plot of land, our neighbors include economists, singers, entrepreneurs, engineers, writers, mechanics, managers, and executive artists, peasants, young families, single mothers, pensioners, and even school children coming from all over Russia and other countries, once part of the Soviet Union from Moscow to Irkutsk and from Ivanovo to Kazakhstan, to Tajikistan, whence come all the inspiration? The answer is simple. Anastasia resonates so strongly in tune with people's hearts that one cannot fail to inwardly recognize the truth in, in emanating from it. How many times have I heard personal examples of this instant recognition? People have ha been searching for years or decades for meaningful answers to questions on the purpose of life, on man's place in nature, have finally found them in this book. Oh my gosh. Ah, oh, sorry. I need a moment. <sighs> I 
but should it be surprising that the image of a way of life founded on the idea of love, beauty, and nonviolence as presented by Anastasia would resonate so strongly with her inner self? After all, does not every one of us want to live in a free society of kind and happy people in a world without wars, crimes, or oppression? In a world where not a single tear need run down a child's cheek, and where families live in love and prosperity? Do we not want to live without monstrous industries? Do we not want to live without monstrous industries destroying and polluting both nature and man? Do we not want to enjoy creative labor for the benefit of both our families and our communities instead of suffering through boring jobs merely to enrich faceless corporations? Do we not want a society based on mutual help and cooperation rather than competition? But you may say this was just Anastasia's dream or just Vladimir Makri's dream, and a dream is simply a dream. But cannot each of us dream of a desirable future and then act to bring this future about? Is it not what John Lennon was singing about in his Imagine? You may say I am a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you will join us and the world will live as one. <laughs> it is not that one of the greatest economists of the 20th century, E.E.F. Schumer, was referring to in his seminal work, Small is Beautiful. Now it might be said that this is a romantic utopian vision, true enough. What we have today in modern industrial society is, is not romantic and certainly not utopian, as we have it right here, but it is in very deep trouble and holds no promise of survival. We jolly well have to have the courage to dream if we want to survive and give our children a chance of survival. The crisis of the industrial society will become worse and end in disaster until or unless we develop a new lifestyle which is compatible with the real needs of human nature, with the health of living nature around us, and with the sources endowed of the world. <sighs> Fortunately, the disaster may still be averted, as more and more people in Russia and throughout the world, drawing their inspiration from the ringing cedars, acquire the courage to dream and create an image of radiant reality for themselves and for their children, and to get down to work in this direction, the spiritual and practical revelations presented in this book are unparalleled in so many areas that their discussion could fill entire volumes. Let me but mention Anastasia's beloved Dashniks, a discovery of exceptional significance. As it happens, the most obvious and significant thing often go to the most easily unnoticed. This is particularly true about Russia's Dasha movement. Judge for yourself, Anastasia and Vladimir were the first to speak about the importance of Dashniks. Now it turns out that according to widely available official statistics published every year in Russia's primary statistical source, over 35 million families, and this amounts to 70% of the country's population, grow their own food on the plot and on their own plots and, and collectively provide far more vegetable fruit and even meat and milk than the whole country's commercial agriculture taken together. Why had nobody paid attention to these numbers earlier? Why didn't they ever resurface in the discussion of the present and future of Russia, and indeed the world's agriculture? Why did nobody take seriously President Boris Yeltsin's confession that he was spending his week and tending to vegetable gardens, growing potatoes and radishes? Should you choose to research for yourself the questions discussed by Anastasia, you will soon discover the truth of her assertions, that her knowledge is already shared, at least particularly by a number of people in our world, and that collectively they know particularly everything, only they do not fully understand how it works. Take communication with plants, for example. It sounds incredible at first, but it only requires a reader of reading of Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird's well-researched The Secret Life of Plants to gain an entirely new perspective and conclude, she must be right. But could it be possible that all diseases are curable through such interactions with plants as Anastasia argues? It would make a, com it would take, it would take a complex and lengthy scientific study to test these hypotheses. Fortunately, this is not necessary as in addition to a growing number of personal testimonials from thousands of people, 
there is fuck fuck you factual evidence oh my gosh factual evidence <laughs> at hand that can dispel any doubts over centuries and millennia the Hazan cut of people living in the valley in northern pakistan have been practicing an agriculture very similar to the one described by anastasia eating food exclusively from their family garden plots and thus establishing a closed loop of matter and information exchange between people and their plants they are recognized as the most healthy and love long living people on earth the hunkazat commonly live to more than a hundred years and men becoming fathers at age 90 is not a rarity can it be that this information exchange between an individual person and plant anastasia talks about is a missing link to understand human nutrition even in the absence of scientific study why not try it the science will catch up furthermore why should we be skeptical about anastasia's ability to live without concern for acquiring food or clothing effortlessly relying on nature for a complete life support system. Is it not the exact same ideal of life taught to humanity in the Bible? He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the cloud will not reap. Or take no thought for the, your life. What ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, also in your own not-so-distant past. Noble Laurette Albert testified on the basis of experiences in Africa in return for very little work nature supplies the natives with nearly everything that he requires for his support looking around should one doubt that truly happy children can only be raised in nature jean lidoff who spent two and a half years in society living in close relationship with nature and consequently knowing no such thing as crying children crime or depression speaks about this in her book the continuum concept with very much the same conclusion as Anastasia. <laughs> Again, this list could continue. In fact, researchers could and probably will write volumes of commentary on almost every statement contained in Anastasia. Yes, doubts naturally do creep in. It still sounds all too in improbable to our traditional way of thinking. And even if the heart feels a genuine light emanating from the book, the mind often refuses to accept it as real. This is an all-too-familiar dilemma fully experienced even by Vladimir Megri himself. However, as the series progresses and you come to embrace the ever more significant revelations set forth in the subsequent volumes and immerse yourself in their ever more poetic language, the idea that could all be simply thought of should gradually melt away. You hold in your hands a flower which will unfold its petals to reveal the most remarkable masterpiece unique in all of Russia's literature, and possibly the world as, all, as well. Indeed, its significance goes far beyond literature. This book possesses tremendous unprecedented potential to change life on our whole planet for the better. Do you know of any other book that in a matter of just a few years has succeeded in not only stirring the hearts and minds of millions of people, but also arousing the same people to extraordinary acts of creation in their everyday lives, developing new models of expression in all the arts, taking on embracing nonviolent initiatives to preserve the enha and enhance life on this planet as we know it? Every day, more and more people are joining in. Now that the Ringing Cedars is globally available in English, the realization of Anastasia's dream is certain to take on planetary proportions. I have no doubt about it. In the winter of 2003, at my office in downtown Moscow, just one block away from the street corner outside the Tangaskaya metro station where Vladimir Megri had been selling the first copies of his book only six years earlier, Igor Vladimirov, head of the Anastasia Ringing Cedars Club in St. Petersburg, mused one day, looking at the snowflakes dancing outside the window. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have Anastasia published in English? It would, I agreed. You are a professional project manager. You speak English fluently. Isn't that true? Yes, more or less. Then why are you sitting here? We laughed. A subsequent chain of circumstances and even and events led me to certain people, including Vladimir Megri himself, who became instrumental in carrying out the English translation project. The story of the unusual coincidence and struggle behind this edition could easily form the stuff of a suspense thriller, which I shall probably write one day. In the meantime, 
I take comfort in the fact that you are now holding a masterfully translated volume in your hands. This alone is a good indication that dreams really do come true. Leonard Sharskin, 2005, Columbia, Missouri. I met him in Australia, actually, where I met um, Carrie Cassidy. Okay, um, this is series at a glance. Um, this is a little bit about each of the books, and I will read that as well. So the one that we just read, Anastasia, the first book of the Ringing Cedar series, tells the story of an entrepreneur, Vladimir Megri, trade trip to the Siberian Taiga in 1995, where he witnessed an incredible spiritual phenomenon connected with sacred ringing cedar trees. He spent three days with a woman named Anastasia, who shared with him her unique outlook on subjects as diverse as gardening, child rearing, healing, nature's sexuality, religion, and more. The wilderness experience transformed Vladimir so deeply that he abandoned his commercial plans and penniless went to Moscow to fulfill Anastasia's request and write a book about the spiritual insights she so generously shared with him. True to her promise, this life-changing book, once written, has become an international bestseller and has touched hearts of millions of people worldwide. Book two, which I'm on the fence if I will read out loud as well. I don't know if you guys will want to hear my voice and me messing up all the time. Um, the second book of the series, in addition to avoiding fascinating behind-the-scenes look at the story of how Anastasia came to be published, offers a deeper exploration in the universal concept so dramatically revealed in book one. It takes readers on, on, a journey, on a journey through the vast expanse of space, time, and spirit from the paradise-like glade in the Siberian Taiga to the rough urban depths of Russia's capital city with the ancient mysteries of our forebears to a vision of humanity's radiant future. Book three, The Space of Love, one of my favorite ones. The third book of the series describes author's second visit to Anastasia, rich with new revelations on natural child rearing and alternative education on the spiritual significance of breastfeeding and the meaning of ancient megaliths. It shows how each person's thoughts can influence the destiny of the entire earth and describe practical ways of putting Anastasia's vision of happiness into practice. Migri shows, shares his own outlook and education on education and children, real creative potential after a visit to a school where pupils build their own campus and cover the 10-year-old Russia school program in just two years, complete with an account of an armed intrusion into Anastasia's habitat. The book highlights the limitless power of love and nonviolence. Uh, if you read these, you make sure you get the green ones. Don't get the black ones. Vladimir didn't uh, write those or produce those or sell those. Um, he shows the ones that he's done. They're always green covered. Those ones are watered down, the black ones. Stay away from them. Book four, Co-Creation, the fourth book and uh, uh, centerpiece of the series, paints a dramatic living image of the creation of the universe and humanity's place in this creation, making this primordial mystery relevant to our everyday living today. Deeply metaphysical, yet at the same time down-to-earth practical, this poetic heartfelt volume helps us uncover answers to the most significant questions about the essence and meaning of the universe and the nature and purpose of our existence. It also shows how and why the knowledge of these answers in innate in every human being has become obscured and forgotten, and points the way towards reclaiming this wisdom and in partnership with nature, manifesting the energy of love through our lives. Book 5, Who We Are, it describes the author's search for real-life proofs of Anastasia's vision presented in the previous volumes. Finding these proofs and taking stock on ongoing global environmental destruction, Vladimir Megri describes the further practical steps to, for putting Anastasia's vision into practice. Full of beautiful realistic images of a new way of living in co-cooperation with the earth and each other, this book also highlights the role of children in making us aware of the precociousness of the present situation and in leading the global transition toward a happy, violence-free society. The Book of Kin is the sixth book in the series, describes another visit by the author to Anastasia's Glade in the Siberian Taiga and his conversations with his growing son, which causes him to take on a new look at education, science, history, family, and nature. 
But through parables and revelatory dialogues and stories, Anastasia then leads Vladimir Megri and the reader on a shocking rediscovery of the pages of humanity's real history that has been distorted or kept secret for thousands of years. The knowledge shed lights on the causes of war, oppression, and violence in the modern world and guides us in preserving the wisdom of our ancestors and passing it over to future generations. The Energy of Life, Book 7 in the series, reasserts the power of human thought and the influence in our thinking and in our lives and the destiny of the entire planet and the universe. It also brings forth a practical understanding of ways you so consciously controlled and build up the power of our creative thought. The book sheds still further light on the forgotten pages of humanity's history on religion, on the roots of interracial and interreligious conflict, on ideal nutrition and shows how a new way of thinking and lifestyle in true harmony with nature can lead to happiness and solve the personal and societal problems of crime, corruption, misery, conflict, war, and violence. I didn't breathe there. I took a, <laughs> I did it all in one breath. Um, the New Civilization is the eighth book in the series. It's not yet complete. The first part of the book already published as a separate volume described yet another visit by Vladimir Megri to Anastasia and their son and offers new insights into the practical cooperation with nature, showing in ever greater detail how Anastasia's lifestyle applies to our lives, describing how the visions presented in previous volumes have already taken beautiful form in real life and produced massive changes in Russia and beyond. The author discerns the birth of a new civilization. The book also paints a vivid image of America's radiant future in which the conflict between the powerful and the helpless the rich and the poor, the city and the country can be transcended and thereby led to transformation in both the individual and society. Rights of, Li Ooh, Rights of Love, Book 8, published as a separate volume, con contrasts today's mainstream attitudes to sex, family, childbirth, and education with our forebears, lifestyles which reflected their deep spiritual understanding of the significance of conception, pregnancy, home birth, and upcoming upbringing of the young in an, an atmosphere of love. In powerful poetic prose, Megri describes their ancient way of life grounded in love and nonviolence and shows the participality of this same approach today. Through, life, through the life story of one family, he portrays the radiant world of the ancient Russian Vedic civilization and drama of its destruction and its rebirth millennial later in our present time. There's also a book 9 and 10 since then. Reader's Review. Yes, at last, truth that has not been distorted by dogma or someone's ego. I might explode from emotion if I read any more. I had a hard time getting myself to just stand still. I was jumping all over my garden saying hello to all my trees. I've always talked to my trees, but I didn't know they were listening. I then ran off and bought loads of seeds and spent days putting whole packets of them in my mouth, only to get very sick indeed, for little did I know that seeds brought in a spot in a supermarket are covered in rat poison. Have we gone mad? I've got the strange reputation of a person who lives in a pink world, a dreamer, believing in an unrealistic utopia of happiness. A witch, a mad woman? Well, thank you, Anastasia. Finally, I can take my place as just a normal man, a woman. I am so excited, fancy me, not to, not knowing that there was a whole bunch of pink worlders just around the corner. Vladimir is a true hero. He went all the way to the bottom of despair, and he used his suffering to change. Merit and achievement, success and glory, belong to those who have managed to change the most of their lives. Anna from Portugal. In 1996, I... 1996, I spent a day in Australian bush with an Aboriginal woman. This was my first encounter of what I called a natural human. Her connectedness with nature blew me away, and I wanted that for myself and all mankind. Likewise, Anastasia is in total harmony with nature and gives practical steps to rekindle in us that which is our true essence. I cannot even begin to describe the depth of the effect Anastasia has had on me, and I have only read book one. For the first time in my life, I feel affirmed on a very deep level and feel free to be me. I'm so excited to have discovered these books and am fully committed to doing what I can to help spread their message. Mary from New Zealand. 
I truly found lots of inspiration in the book. I have slowly a lovely garden plot which I have worked on for over 40 years in the suburban Denver area. And while I have tried to work with nature consciously for probably 20 years, I feel I fall quite short of anything that resembles the connection that Anastasia has. I am determined this next spring to do an exactly as she recommended. To do exactly as she recommends, because I do feel that humanity's healing will only come about with a reconnection to nature. I am hopeful to many peop of many people also wanting to read the message of hope and rediscover the potential that awaits man as he claims his divine inheritance through right action and right use of will attuned to spirit. Narilla. Colorado, USA. Anastasia and subsequent volumes tell the story of a return of mankind to a state of grace through love, actualized real love, to everything around us and keeping our thoughts, hearts, and minds in the place of love, touching with love and earth, the celebration, the God's creation through loving it and caring for it. I think the most important lesson for us is to move back to the work of the creator and away from ways which destroy it. That is what I take from the series and find myself inspired to work harder in being joyful, thankful, and loving. In my own life, my family works towards goals that aren't measured in dollars, which is much richer life than working for material wealth. We have a certified organic wild crop farm, so I am very receptive to the medicine of the earth and see the importance of principles interacting in a healing way with God's creation. The Earth in a very humble way, our work with native plants on our farm could be seen as a demonstration of a way people can take some of the ringing cedars in ideas and put them to work. I think if people find a larger purpose for their lives and collecting material goods, everyone will be happier rediscovering the scope of humanity's tools from the creator. Anastasia helps with explaining ways to have a richer life, raise healthy children, filling one's heart rather than one's pocket. I do not agree with everything written, and many people will find ideas threatening. Yet, if we don't discover new ways of being, human beings, and put them to work, if we don't have a spirit rich enough to live with love and respect for God's creation, we have no future. Penny from Missouri. There has been a very significant change taking place within me since reading the series. It has been a casting off of the selfish elements within me and walking into a vast chasm of blessings. What is possible, I do not yet know. Only that an awareness and consciousness is possible in this life. My life is hopeful now. Allen, Wisconsin. At work, I walked by a book lying face down in a messy table and it called me. I picked up the book, flipped it over and covered, clicked, and, and the cover clicked. I sat down and started reading. That night I took the book home and over the next few days, I found a piece of life of spiritual cosmos, which I knew had been missing. In my disgust and shame at Vladimir Megri's reaction to Anastasia, I saw reflections of my own attitude towards concepts of I was uncomfortable with. Although Anastasia herself was a little odd, I had no difficulty believing in her presence or existence after reading the book. I slept under the stars near some current bushes, but some opossums woke me in the middle of the night. I then did some Reiki and sent the energy to Anastasia and felt myself floating in cedar branches, softly brushing me with bright yet soft balls of radiant light shining up back upon me. In a tarot read, I asked about Anastasia and drew the guardian card. Three years ago, my family moved to the country, uh, to the country, our own Dasha. I now look forward to our, to the next spring and coating the seeds and creating a space of love for both my garden and my family, Dietrich. Missouri. Anastasia's message throughout the Ringing Cedar series have further illuminated the divine work of birthing, caring for, and parenting children. I am a doula, a home birthing mama, a dancer singer who has been inspired by Anastasia's reminder that we are all born to know and share our light. I feel like the book's message have found a natural home in my being. Anastasia is a being who I no lives and she desperately wants us to feel how alive we are and how alive the earth is. We belong to the earth and we must find our happiness so that the earth will feel our, her happiness as well. Elise, Missouri. My acquaintance who paid a visit to the Altia several years ago received a few tiny scraps of cedar wood from a local woman. She told me to wear it on his body. She told me to wear it on his body. 
He would need it. It would protect him. This summer, he did some major house cleaning, sorting things he didn't want any around anymore. He stumbled on a matchbox with those with these silvers of cedarwood and thought, ah, is this true or mere suspicion? Shall I finally do away with them? The next day, by coincidence, his friend offered him the Anastasia book as a present. He read, gasp he read, gasped, and made a pendant out of the pieces. A few weeks later, he showed me the pendant, and it was breathtaking. I really gasped for breath, even though at that point he hadn't yet told me his story. My guess would be that he received some shivers of a ringing cedar. It was so moving to many more stirrings over here. Really trust that this will be worldwide. Dickey, Netherlands. As a 75-year-old American who finished the third Anastasia book by Vladimir Megri, The Space of Love, I'm in the process of digesting its substance. The American must pick up and go to a place that Vladimir Megri shows him. Megri shows him wonders, but those expecting wonders to be valid only in, if found uh, on American soil will be taken back, uh, back to learn they are in a land that rarely seeks, rarely, rarely thinks of the new world. Anastasia Siberian Taiga is a land that measures history in millennia instead of decades. There, Vladimir meets those who have a myster, mystical affection for their country and culture. He finds values resting in rock-solid Christian principles, not bearing Christian labels. They are values descending from ancient insights approved by generations faithful to the soil forebears. Their love for Mother Russia is a love that not understood even by the most patriotic American. Christians will recognize much from the Old Testament as well as from the New, especially Isaiah chapter 11. This is not to say that Anastasia's series promotes or detect, detracts from their, that teaching. Instead, it parallels and edifies the Christian emer emerges with his faith firmer and a respect for Megri. Anastasia, after three books, I am digesting, and there are moments when my credi credulity vanishes. Then lines appear that can have been written only to me then by unbeliefs then my unbeliefs are is overturned it is like the story of lazarus i believe but help me help my unbelief coincidences are endless gallagher oklahoma about the ringing cedar series mm. i think we know already that's like what's on the back of the book about the author. We already have that information as well. And that's it, we're done. Wow, well, thank you so much if you made it to the very end with me. I hope my voice didn't annoy you. And again, all the mistakes I made, I apologize. I'm very dyslexic and sometimes I just see things and read things totally different. And I'm reading on a very small screen from my phone. So yeah. Thank you and enjoy this gift until our next adventure. Warm embrace, laced in grace. Thank you for you being you.